debate or motions pending. Okay, just flagging that in eScribe, for me anyway, on uh, September 14th active meeting search results, under 4, there's a 4.1 uh, unfunded park status and 4.2, um, which is uh, change orders of the day um, calendar adjustment that appear in our agenda, but okay. they don't appear here. So I'm just trying to determine should we should we add those to be dealt with or is no? That an we error? won't add those to be dealt with. But I will flag for you that we would ask for a suspension of the rules upon adoption of the agenda to account for quorum being here and still allowing our virtual participants to be counted. Okay, well, uh, Thank you. I've got a note on that, which will, do you want that as part of the agenda or immediately subsequent to its approval? Whichever you prefer. Okay, then um, perhaps uh, as a friendly amendment to the adoption of the agenda um, itself, and um, I'll just read this in and double check with Councillor Essinger that it's satisfactory. The suspension of the rules would be that the operating, or pardon me, the operation of the following sections of council procedures bylaw 18155 be suspended until further notice. 14. Three, councillors participating in a standing committee meeting using communication facilities will only be counted towards quorum if another councillor is present at the meeting location to act as an alternate if the communication facility fails. And Schedule A, Section 2, a councillor may only participate in a council standing committee or council committee meeting using a communication facility if A, the councillor is in a location outside of Edmonton for any reason, or B, the councillor is located in Edmonton but is unable to attend a meeting for medical reasons, or the councillor or their immediate family. Uh, of the councillor or their immediate family, pardon me, and the city manager is present at the location specified in the meeting notice to ensure that councillors participating by communication facility can be heard by all those present at the meeting. Uh, so are we just suspending it for this meeting or are we sus suspending it henceforth while we're in this mixed configuration? We're suspending it for the t future foreseeable until we are back in person. Okay, I'm gonna suggest that, that we pass that as a resolution on its own rather than as the adoption of the agenda because it, it it introduces for me confusion about whether it's limited to this meeting or, or foregoing. So I'm gonna suggest that we um, actually add to the agenda a, um, a 3.2 which is the suspension of rules um, motion and we'll deal with that first and that will be just a resolution that, that uh, can be separately um, documented. So, uh, so the, I'm going to add this to our agenda to be dealt with discreetly. Uh, would be my suggestion, unless anyone else has any other suggestions or concerns with that approach. Councillor Essinger, are you okay with there being a 3.2 on suspension of the rules, and it will just Absolutely. allow us to pass this re this resolution? Okay, uh, and that that be first item of business. Yes. Okay, and seconder for that. Second. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Any discussion on the agenda? Not seeing any, then uh, please vote. Got to be in your e scribe. The update still pending on it's e still pending. Okay. And that's all. Thank you. We have Dis the votes. Display the vote. Are we still missing one or we have all the votes. That was just a glitch with the system. No worries. Display the vote, please. And the agenda with uh, the addition of 3.2 times specific first has been passed unanimously. Um, I don't think there are any protocol items today that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, I, I will say we will properly address and honor um, former Councillor Anderson uh, with, a, with a full protocol item um, in, uh, in a short time, uh, but putting that together and making sure that uh, the Anderson family is is able to be part of it is part of why we're not doing today, but just to note the, the very sad uh, loss of our former colleague and friend. So we'll have more to say about that at another meeting. Um, explanation of public hearing process. Here it is. 
The clerk will call out the one and only bylaw to be dealt with, big number 20,000. Uh, and I will call out the names of the people registered to speak to the bylaw. Administration will pers first provide an overview of the bylaw, and then members of the public will be invited to speak either in person or virtually using Google Meet. Those in favor will speak first, followed by those opposed. Each will have five minutes to make comments. The clerk will run the official timer. However, those attendees participating virtually may wish to use a timer at home. Uh, two, when the speaker is finished, please stay at the microphone or on the line as council may wish to ask you questions. We may need to take a recess between time blocks of speakers in the event that we finish one early. However, also to accommodate the need to hear from those in favor, followed by those in opposition, we may need to also take a recess between the two groups as we can't start um, earlier than the time provided to speakers. So after comments from the public, council of course may ask questions of city staff. And after all of the speakers have concluded, the uh, chair, which is me, unless I have to step out, um, may ask each speaker if they wish to speak to new information which arose during the public hearing. This process requires some patience from everyone, um, including the chair, to ensure that anyone who does wish to address council has an appropriate opportunity. Thereafter, council may close the public hearing and begin to debate the bylaw. For those participating virtually, please refrain from using the chat function in Google Meet during the meeting, as it can create issues of decorum, uh, provide unfair advantage, and can even technically interfere with the live stream. So additionally, remember to mute your microphone when you are not presenting or answering questions. If you are experiencing any difficulties whatsoever, the Office of City Clerk has additional resources available to help facilitate communication and participation in the statutory public hearing process. Please reach out using the contact information provided in your registration or at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. The speakers list for each time block will be provided on edmonton.ca slash meetings for your reference. And finally, for those here in person, please remember that the temporary mandatory face covering bylaw 19408 remains in effect. We ask that you keep your mask on at all times, including while making your remarks to City Council. You will notice that members of City Council administration may take off their masks while they are behind um, plexiglass barriers, but we will also put them back on when moving about the room or talking with each other during the meeting. And we appreciate everyone's understanding and participation in keeping everyone safe through the continuing pandemic condition. So those are the procedures. Are there any questions? Not seeing any, then uh, we will now call out the folks registered to speak in the first panel. Is there any, is there anyone to speak to item 3.1 Charter Bylaw 20000 to adopt the City Plan Edmonton's Municipal Development Plan? Yes, I have Mick Graham from IDEA by remote. Are you there, Mick? I see you. Yes, I am. Welcome, and we can hear you, which is great. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have Mike Cole from UDI Edmonton Region. Here, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Then we have Chris Nicholas from MLC Land, who is here in person. Welcome, Chris. Um, next, we have Michaela Davis from UDI Edmonton Region, who is coming to us from remote. I'm here, thank you. Welcome. We have Melanie Hoffman, who is coming to us from remote. Yes, I'm here. Welcome. Uh, Joe Yurkovich from the Edmonton Mountain Bike Alliance, coming to us from remote. I'm here. Thank you, Mayor Harvish. Good morning, Joe. Welcome. Uh, next up will be Paul Lanny from the Canadian Home Builders Association. Good morning. Good morning, Paul. Welcome. Uh, next, we have Mariah Samji from Infill Edmonton. I'm here. Welcome. You're a little quiet. Can you get a little closer to your mic? How's this? Better. We may need to. Uh, we may need to boost you a little bit when we get to you, though. But uh, we can hear you and welcome. Uh, next, we have Stephen Rates. Yes, I'm present. Welcome. Uh, remote as well. Next is Dr. Karen Lee uh, from Housing for Health. Yes, I'm here. Sorry about that microphone. 
No, that's okay. Your uh, connection's a little garbled there, so if anyone else is using Netflix right now, get them to stop when it's your turn. <laughs> uh, we've got some echo as well, so we may need to work with you. But but we uh, we have you registered as as present and can see you and sort of hear you. So we'll we'll get uh, see if we can chase down the echo there. But welcome, it's great to have you here, Dr. Lee. Next is Jeff Bizanz from the Edmonton Council for Early Learning and Care. Got to unmute Jeff, if you don't mind, just so we can hear you. Microphone check, one, two, one, two. Paging Dr. Oh, Bazan. I'll try again. Yes, there I'm we go. Here. Perfect. Thanks, Jeff. Good to see you. Uh, next is Heather Raymond, from the also from the Edmonton Council for Early Learning and Care. Heather, are you there? Bye, yes, I am, Donald. Thanks for the invite. Welcome. Uh, next is Mike Melross from the Climate Innovation Fund, Alberta Ecotrust. Uh, thank you, President uh, Mayor Iveson. Welcome back, Mike. Thank you. Mike used to work for us, so big loss but uh, uh, for the city, but it's great to have him continue to be involved. So welcome back, Mike. Um, next is Brian Torrance from the Edmonton Sport Council. Good morning, Mayor. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, next is Sherry Shorten from the Alberta Association of Architects Core Stakeholder Team, also coming to us by remote. Good morning. Welcome, Sherry. Uh, and then next is Stephanie Clancy from the Alberta Association of Architects Core Stakeholder Team. Yes, good morning. Welcome. And then we have uh, Dave Buchanan from Paths for People coming to us by remote. Here, good morning. Welcome. Um, And just to double check, even though it's organized into a panel in statutory public hearing terms, it's one at a time? That's correct. We just have the panels for the purpose of time blocking, so we don't have okay. too many people remote. And there is just an 18th speaker if you turn your page over, please. Oh, okay. Uh, but just, just to double check, the we'll hear from the speaker, then ask questions of the speaker, not what we do for non-statutory hearings, just to make sure we're all crystal clear, we won't hear from all 18 speakers and then ask one round of questions of them. We'll be in a position to ask questions of each speaker and are statutorily required to do so. That's correct. Yeah, and it's a big deal, so I think that makes sense, but just to, just to be clear on the process, we'll go one at a time, including Q&A. So uh, last but not least on panel one is Ashley Salvador from Yeg Garden Suites, who's joining us from her. Yes, home. good morning. Good morning, Ashley, and welcome. Okay, so Thank that's you. panel one, and um, we will then start. Oh, uh, is there a presentation first? I imagine there's a presentation. Yes, there is, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so the first panel's ready to go once the presentation is concluded, um, but uh, uh, please proceed and feel very welcome to tell us about all of the work that you've done to get to this point. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, it is a great morning and we're very pleased to present uh, Charter Bylaw 20,000 Edmonton City Plan for consideration this morning at the public hearing. We all know that the pandemic has had significant impact on Edmonton, not only the whole of Edmonton, but the city of Edmonton as a corporation. But our sights are still set on the goals of Connect Edmonton and the opportunity presented by the city plan to help meet those goals. It would be tempting to take a back to basics approach to meeting the needs of Edmontonians. And in fact, many cities are thinking this way, but in Edmonton, we are committed to forward with focus solutions that allow the city to work within its available resources and continue to advance our strategic plan. The city plan is about putting people first. It's the blueprint for our corporation. It describes our long-term vision and outlines how we will steward change with our partners and stakeholders as we leverage the strengths of our current community, respond to the current realities, and build an attractive city where the existing and new residents will feel welcome and at home. The city plan is an outcomes-based and dynamic document that was built with resilience to disruption in mind. As such, it provides critical focus as Edmonton recovers and reimagines its future in a changing landscape. With that, I'll pass things over to the city plan team, my co-executive sponsor, Stephanie McCabe, for additional welcoming remarks. 
Thank you, Adam. We are pleased to be here today with the city plan. Work has been underway with our community for over two years to build this plan, and it'll guide administration's efforts for the years and decades to come. It is important to note that this body of work is a change management initiative in itself and will require thoughtful transformation efforts within the city to identify priorities that have the most impact. This work matters, and with clear focus in times of uncertainty, has never been more essential. Edmonton is and needs to continue to be part of the urban fabric of our nation and province while staying relevant in the global context. It needs to continue to respond to the social, environmental, and economic challenges of the future and reimagine new responses. Forty years ago, our city was half its current size and home to approximately 500,000 people. As has happened in the past, growth will continue, sometimes more rapidly and other times more tempered. But today we are one million people strong and looking to double again to two million and add 520,000 more jobs over the decades to come. Change will happen, some that we can predict and some that we cannot. And there's no better example of the need to be agile, responsive, and imaginative in the face of disruption than what we're going through right now. To move forward with focus, we need to be bold, agile, smart, and brave. I'm joined today by members of the project team, Kaylin Anderson, Charity Dyke, and Hoeda Hassan, who will make a presentation on Bylaw 20,000. We're also joined by members of the executive leadership team and our consulting partners who will be able to answer any strategic and or technical questions that council may have. Thank you, Stephanie. Just to, sorry, I just got a note from Councillor Knack who rightly observed that I had said 3.2 would be time specific and we do need to suspend the rules to carry on. So just pause for a moment while we get the, uh, uh, the motion under 3.2, uh, which, which precedes this, because I did ask for it to be time specific. So apologies. Um, so we'll just pause right now. Would someone move the suspension of the rules motion that was previously read in? So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Banga, seconded by uh, Councillor Hamilton. Appreciate that. Please vote. Sorry. You guys were on a roll, I know, but it's a valid point of order. Councillor Knack, thank you. We could take it with unanimous consent, I think. Is there any objection to the suspension of the rules? Motion under 3.2. Not hearing any objection, then by unanimous consent, We'll, we'll uh, deem the vote carried, or now now that you've triggered it, is it better if we fi finish the vote, or what's helpful to you guys? Unanimous consent is fine. Great, Thank okay, you. so by unanimous consent, the rules have been suspended. I just wanted that separated in the minutes. That can now be done. Thank you for that. Apologies, Kaylin. Uh, you have important things to tell us. Please, you have our undivided attention now. Thank you, Your Worship. In addition to our growing city requiring new choices, we're also compelled to prepare a new city plan in response to Edmonton's legislative obligations under the Municipal Government Act, the City Transportation Act, the Highways Development and Protection Act, and the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Plan. Further, the city's existing MDP and Ways documents are over 10 years old and a lot has changed since 2010. The city plan offers our community the opportunity to comprehensively update the ways into one modernized and integrated public policy document. The city plan is part of a larger strategic system where each stage of the vision process supports and builds upon one another to advance policy right down to implementation and funding. In April 2019, City Council adopted a new strategic plan, Connect Edmonton, which sets the course for Edmonton's future. The four strategic goals of Connect Edmonton indicate where we will make transformational change to achieve our vision. The goals will be achieved through the city plan using a combination of strategic actions, partnership and collaboration. As we come through the COVID-19 pandemic as a community, our new reality requires a new orientation to our work. We need to make intelligent but sometimes difficult choices to respond to the challenge. 
This means keeping our focus on the long-term outcomes of Connect Edmonton and the City Plan while meeting the needs of today. Our strategic plans will ground us in these uncertain times, allowing us to move forward with focus so that Edmonton can emerge a strong and vibrant city. In this vein, it will be important to note that the City Plan does not stand alone, nor will it act alone. It is part of a larger family of documents and processes that, taken together, represent Edmonton's strategic planning framework. Taking direction from Connect Edmonton, the City Plan will be implemented through the corporate business planning process, capital and operating budgets, ongoing performance measurement, and it will be supported by strategic initiatives, including the zoning bylaw renewal and other projects within the city. This means that the plan will impact existing and future planning work across the corporation. As a result, implementation of the city plan will become the ongoing work of administration and will unfold as we move into the future. In addition to reflecting Council's vision, the city plan was informed by a dynamic and flexible public engagement program. The city plan is also a, spa a spatial plan, which outlines physically how the city will support new growth opportunities at different scales and in different locations. The city plan was built on a solid methodology and metrics that can be measured over time to track progress, including defined priorities and our big city moves that will represent significant changes in shaping our future city. It was also important as we prepared the plan that it was clear, simple, and easy to read, whether through print or electronic media. And finally, the plan itself is intended to be evergreen, which means that instead of, instead of retiring it or replacing it in 10 years, it can be continuously renewed and kept up to date and relevant while being implemented in, in line with Council's budget cycles. The collective and collaborative work to prepare the city plan represents the voices of Edmontonians. Through ongoing conversations, administration engaged with over 10,000 Edmontonians. We heard what was important, how we should transform as a community, what choices need to be made, and how we will respond to this change over time together. Concerted efforts were made to provide the broadest diversity of opportunity for participation, and a GBA plus lens was applied. We connected with children, seniors, gender minorities, religious groups, newcomers, indigenous peoples, business owners, advocacy groups, and more. From coffee chats to workshops, meetings with community groups, industry, and stakeholders, surveys and drop-in sessions, the city plan was fueled by Edmontonians. People shared their voices to shape the city. An example of one of the many voices we heard from was a group of young men at the Abbots Field Recreation Center basketball night called Nightball. This engagement session was designed to meet the participants where they were. We used their Nightball game intermission as an opportunity to hear from Edmontonians that we might not normally hear from. These young men talked to us about everything from technology disrup disruption to job security to the need for more frequent and connected transit as well as improved recreational opportunities. We heard that what makes Edmonton great for them is community connection, festivals, access to employment and affordable housing, as well as diversity and acceptance. In short, they felt that in Edmonton they belonged and they wanted the same opportunities for their kids in the future. Intimate community conversations like this one are examples of GBA plus analysis in action because they consider diverse perspectives and explicitly seek to include a broader array, array of voices that might otherwise go unheard. In addition to integrating the voice of Edmontonians, the city plan is supported by evidence-based research and a suite of technical studies. These studies provided the foundational information to the direction outlined in the city plan, delving deep into complex issues of importance, such as mass transit, relative costing, climate vulnerability, market conditions, and greenhouse gas emissions. Together, the findings from these studies were instrumental in understanding both the current conditions and the future state that may emerge as we grow to a city of two million. Over the course of this process, we undertook three learning scenarios to test out findings. None of these scenarios were options or potential concepts in and of themselves. The purpose was to empirically evaluate potential impacts on a lot of different dimensions in order to inform recommendations. 
Based on these learnings, technical studies, public engagement, and stakeholder consultation, we developed a preferred scenario with supporting draft policy and brought that to Urban Planning Committee in September 2019. As administration comes to plan and invest in a more intentional and integrated way, Edmontonians can expect certain results that align with what they shared during engagement and what we learned through study. At a population of 2 million, which is the proposed horizon for the city plan, here are a few of the expected results that Edmonton can achieve by growing differently. By virtue of more compact development and an increasing emphasis on infill combined with growth management, Edmonton will avoid the need to expand by an additional 5,000 hectares of land outside of our current boundaries to accommodate 2 million people. More than 50% of future housing starts will be accommodated by a redevelopment. Greenhouse gas emissions will be reduced from an, by an estimated 6% based on a more efficient transportation system and urban form. The number of cycling, walking and transit trips will increase by 50% over our current state. The fiscal performance of the city will be improved over, over a business as usual base case to the tune of about 8%. And finally, Edmonton will be able to successfully attract and retain an additional 1 million residents and accommodate 520,000 more jobs. To bring this to life on the ground, the city plan concept weaves together the essential physical systems and networks that Edmonton will need in order to sustain and attract 1 million more people living within our current boundary. A large part of the city plan is about how we intentionally choose to steward the things that are essential to our city or are part of who we are. Recognizing what is important and choosing to gift those things to another generation is part of the responsibility that we all have. Equally important is recognizing what needs to change. What do we as a community need to respond to in order to leave Edmonton in an even better place? The city plan's five big city moves are the bold transformational priorities our city needs to both sustain and transform Edmonton over time. They are an invitation to work together as a whole community and build a future city that is more inclusive and compassionate, rebuildable and green, and where change can catalyze and converge within a community of communities. The five city moves challenge all Edmontonians to make intentional choices in support of a future city, both for ourselves and for future generations. Each of the five big city moves is supported by stretch targets that are ambitious, yet also achievable over the life of the plan. The first of the big city moves is greener as we grow, which articulates our aspirations of becoming a more sustainable community. Stretch targets in this area include planting 2 million new urban trees, achieving a local carbon budget of 135 megatons, and having zero net GHG emissions per person. Through the pandemic, we observed the important connections that Edmontonians have to their parks and open spaces as well as the impact that reduced transportation had on GHG emissions around the world. A rebuildable city is about continuously reinvesting in and redeveloping our city to support more people in more places. The stretch targets include welcoming 600,000 new residents into the redeveloping area of the city and having 50% of net new dwelling units added through infill within the city boundary. A rebuildable city is also about agility and continuous adaption. One recent example was our ability over the last few months to rapidly and temporarily repurpose road right-of-ways for patios and shared use paths to support physical distancing through COVID. A community of communities is about creating a city in which we all have what we need within reach of where we live and where we work. It's about equity and it's about accessibility. This means that we can more easily make more trips by non-auto modes like transit and active transportation, and with ongoing commitment, we could achieve a mode share of 50%. This also means that we can create 15-minute districts where people are able to easily complete their daily needs by walking, rolling, or cycling. For many people, living more locally has become part of the new normal through the pandemic, and the value of having services and amenities close to home has never been more pressing. Being an inclusive and compassionate city is about ensuring safety for all, eliminating racism, addressing truth and reconciliation, and tackling poverty and social isolation. Stretch targets in this area include 
ensuring that no one is in core housing need. It's about eliminating chronic and episodic homelessness. And finally, ensuring that there is affordability in how people choose to live and move by keeping those expenses to 35% of total household expenditures. Part of Edmonton's pandemic response included temporary day shelters for people experiencing homelessness and an increased emphasis on affordability and social equity. As recovery advances, continued efforts in these areas will be critical. Finally, the Catalyze and Converge Big City Move is about attracting talent and investment while supporting the arts and our institutions through partnership. Edmonton needs to be an attractive place to an increasing diversity of people, jobs, and talent. Stretch targets include retaining the 70% share of employment that we currently have in the region in Edmonton. It's about creating an innovation corridor which connects our academ academic and medical institutions with our city centre and attracts an additional 50,000 jobs. And finally, that the network of nodes and corridors identified by the draft city plan tracks and supports 50% of all employment in Edmonton. This big city move is about helping businesses thrive and survive. Over the past few months, efforts to support small businesses from microgrants to red tape reduction have been part of an important part of our community's response. To bring these big city moves to life, the heart of the city plan is about planning for people, the people of Edmonton. Each chapter represents the aspirations of Edmontonians and articulates what policy intentions and directions, when used in an integrated and intentional way, will help achieve a healthier, more urban, climate resilient, city supportive of a prosperous region. The policy chapters are as follows. I want to belong and contribute. I want to live in a place that feels like home. I want opportunities to thrive. I want access within my city. I want to preserve what matters most. And I want opportunities to create and innovate. To bring the plan's policies and land use concept to life on the ground, the city plan brings together three systems, planning and design, mobility, and managing growth. These reflect the complexity of our city and how city building works best when intentional networks are co-considered and also integrated. The planning and design system combines the districts, nodes and corridors, green and blue, and non-residential opportunities networks. Together, these support distinctive, memorable, and functional places for Edmontonians to live, leisure, work, and invest. The city plans nodes and corridors, concentrates density to enable development and redevelopment opportunities and create attractive, vibrant and urban places. Nodes and corridors create logical areas of concentration within districts and support housing and employment growth that is well served by transit. They are places to be and to gather. They are animated with people and activity with an emphasis on design and beauty that creates a sense of place. The city plan is comprised of 15 districts citywide each served by at least one node or corridor and include both residential and non-residential lands. Districts are diverse, accessible collections of neighborhoods that contain most of the services and amenities Edmontonians need to meet their daily needs. They are unique based on where they are and what they contain. Through a systems approach to planning and design, the district network serves to connect Edmontonians to a broad range of opportunities that enhance their ability to live locally because places and spaces are close at hand and easy to get to. A green and blue network sustains the community and provides places to recreate, celebrate, and recharge. It is inter integrated with our built environment through parks, waterways, and water bodies, greenways, and urban trees. It traverses both urban and natural areas and provides habitat that connects well beyond its boundaries. Through the green, green and blue network, biodiversity is sustained and provides physical and mental benefits we appreciate and enjoy. The City Plan Non-Residential Opportunities Network seeks to expand and enhance areas for non-residential development and help ensure a diverse and thriving economy in Edmonton. The network supports areas of business growth which creates product productive and desirable places that attract talent, create employment opportunities and encourage ongoing investment. Non-residential areas will have robust and varied mobility access and will be well connected to the mobility system within Edmonton and throughout the region. The mobility system combines the active transportation, mass transit and roadway and goods movement networks. 
Combined, these networks provide Edmontonians with an equitable, accessible, efficient, and resilient transportation system. The Active Transportation Network creates critical connections using walking, rolling, or biking, allowing people to access amenities, daily needs, and recreational opportunities. It also contributes to mode shift away from single occupancy vehicles. The transit network provides citywide, district, and regional connectivity, connectivity using mass transit and local transit services, prioritizing accessible, reliable, and safe services. This is essential for the success of our nodes and corridors and our city as a whole. The mass transit network does not prescribe the type of transit technology or precise alignment, allowing for larger bodies of work, planning and engineering, and public consultation to take place in the future. Our roadway and goods movement network will facilitate ongoing economic activity and development while providing access to business and employment. This network is critical to supporting regional connection and prosperity. Lastly, a system of managing growth combines a new growth management framework with development pattern areas and phasing and activation to enable successful urban development and manage community change over time. All of these systems have been co-considered and integrated in their development and policy alignment so that the vision, principle, and goals of Edmonton's strategic plan may be realized. Development pattern areas are one of the key city plan mechanisms for managing growth. It's expected that through develop, redevelopment and neighborhood evolution, we will be able to accommodate 600,000 more people inside the Anthony Henday Drive boundary. It means that significant growth will occur in the developing area as it builds out to exceed or meet minimum greenfield density requirements. And it also means that our future growth area will be thoughtfully and strategically opened for development as the city grows. Taken together, this type of growth supported by strategic investment in our systems and networks will result in a significant increase in the number of high density housing types over the long term. In order to plan for a population of 2 million, growth will be phased in increments of 250,000 new residents. The city plan identifies those areas of anticipated growth and intensity as shown in this map. Both the public and private sector have a role in advancing growth. The city will initiate three types of activation at the nodes and corridors to support intentional growth in all areas of the city, allowing us to prioritize the allocation of city resources through strategize, invest, and nurture actions. In particular, it, this will align with the investments required in our city systems and networks so that we achieve the city that Edmontonians want. To keep ourselves accountable and to ensure the plan achieves success, progress on our transformative big city moves and associated strategic measures will be tracked with interim targets set and monitored over time. This exercise will be done in a way that ensures our work is intentionally adapted and prioritized with reimagined priorities in mind. Council will be able to weigh in on this work through future conversations. Activating the city plan is the job of the entire city, not just administration, council, or developers. We all must work together to create a city that is attractive to one million more residents and that serves current residents as we grow. This is an exciting time for Edmonton as we focus on planning for the future of our city, aligning our priorities, and work and to align well. with a future city that is greener, easier to get around in, and continues to welcome new businesses and residents. While the exact details of how our city will grow will only be known over time, it is a daily responsibility to provide the services and supports needed to build towards the future together. And we are committed and dedicated to this future. To support any technical questions that members of council may have today, the project team and members of the executive leadership team are joined by members of the consulting firms who have supported the background work to date, including Craig Binning from Hempson to speak to the relative fiscal impact assessment, Yule Herbert from SSG to speak to the greenhouse gas and energy modeling, Blair Smith from IBI to speak to the mass transit study, Beth Saunders from Populous to speak to the citywide and Indigenous engagement, and Stephen Prenderville from EY to speak to agility and disruption in the times of change. In closing, the city plan is as much a plan for 1 million people as it is a plan for 2 million and 520,000 jobs. It considers our past, present, and future. It is people-focused, evidence-based, integrated, measurable, 
and unified. To realize it will take courage, ingenuity, and commitment. It is the action taken today, tomorrow, and decades from now that will shape our shared places and spaces, our city. The city plan is about moving forward with focus. This concludes administration's presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. McCabe, and uh, to you and through you, uh, to your team and, uh, and the consulting resources who, who assisted and, and, the, and the members of the public who provided input, thank you all for your efforts to get us to today. Uh, but we're not done with public engagement. Um, uh, we never are, really, in a city like this uh, and in a democracy. So, um, but this is one of the most important opportunities to get um, uh, key feedback at this critical decision phase when first and second reading are, are before us and the regional evaluation framework uh, reference uh, case to, to the regional board is pending. So. Um, this is the last chance for folks to weigh in unless council decides to extend the public hearing and, and do other work. But um, So this is a really important occasion. And so I welcome all the speakers who we recognized earlier and um, we will hear from them in uh, sequence starting with Mick Graham from IDEA. So Mick, uh, as with everyone else, and you've been here before many times, you have five minutes and then stand by for questions. Go ahead, Mick. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Uh, uh, <laughs> not sure what to make of the fact that I'm going first, but I guess it has to be somebody. Um, <clears throat> I had the privilege of attending um, the creation of the city plan process as a stakeholder, and I, I, I think they are to be congratulated in, in how beautifully they captured the goals and aspirations of, of everyone, all the stakeholders uh, involved. Uh, as I'm sure will be pointed out by several speakers today, the devil is, is in both the details and in Council's commitment to empowering administration to execute the plan. A key detail that needs to be attended to is the state of the infrastructure in mature neighbourhoods. It's one thing to set a goal that 50% of building permits will be for infill projects. But if there's a huge infrastructure cost for the developer, this goal will never be met, particularly in the context of smaller projects. Council is aware of the challenges associated with the inadequate hydrant infrastructure. This is an ongoing problem which is still in dire need of a funding plan. Are we going to run into similar problems with the electrical grid, especially as microgeneration becomes more prevalent? The execution of the city plan is going to hinge on infrastructure. Please make it a priority. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Graham, uh, for going first uh, and for your perseverance on those important topics. Questions for Mr. Graham? What's the, since we're starting now, what's best for clerks? Should we try to use the speaker function or try to use the, the, the chat? If you can use the speaker function, that's preferable. Okay. But if you, if this chat's easier, we can accommodate that. Okay, let's, so you've got it open now if people did have questions. Okay, let's just uh, take a beat there and see if there are any requests. Ah, Councillor McKean, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Graham. Uh, thanks for your brief presentation and it's uh, obviously a real high priority for you. And I don't know if we completely understand the implications of um, our hidden infrastructure deficit. So what would you, what is your answer to this? Do we, when we need uh, hydrants and pipes and electrical upgrades because, you know, a missing middle project is going ahead, uh, does that, is it your view that the costs of that should be spread across the rate base or the tax base? Yeah, yes, it is, sir. I, <clears throat> now that we have a plan for how we want to grow our city, I'm thinking of nodes and corridors in particular, um, we know what the population goal we're trying to achieve in those nodes and corridors is. So, you know, if we're adding 20% more people to those areas, 
how does that impact the demands on existing infrastructure? So now we've got we've got a target. It's not just a vague, you know, one project at a time effort. Um, if, let's take Bonnie Dune as an example. If we're going to find a way to move 50,000 people to Bonnie Dune, um, we have to take a hard look at what kind of infrastructure we've got there and make a plan to pay for those upgrades. Uh, this city plan, you know, it, it provides us, I think for the first time, um, um, a set of clearer um, targets. Yeah, I, I I struggle with what is fair. So in a greenfield context, um, uh, essentially, I think, uh, though people will argue this, it's a bit of a losing proposition for the city overall, that the costs, operating costs for the new subdivision is carried by the balance of the city. But that would be the same argument here, that it might be a losing proposition for everybody if we have to put huge dollars into new infrastructure, which is why I ask you the best way we would deal with this. And fairness to me would suggest that the new home buyer, whether it's in a greenfield or infill context, has to carry some of the load for the infrastructure upgrades. Your your thoughts on that, please, Mick. I think, I mean, in, in, a, in the context of, of a greenfield development, you know, there's still a tension there. You know, are, does the developer have to pay for infrastructure that's going to support um, increased population 75 years from now? You know, if... If the developer is asked to do that, he's inevitably going to fight back and say, well, no, here's the plan that you've approved. We're going to provide infrastructure for that plan. But cities evolve over a long, long time. Uh, if we look at European cities, it's pretty common to, uh, to encounter a street that's been dug up and, and you know, pipes are getting replaced or, or added. Yeah, you know, and, I, and I don't... I'm pretty confident in saying that's not because that's not all being borne by the developer. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we, cities, maybe, it just seems to me that the maybe even understated a bit goal of the city plan has to be uh, to make Edmonton fiscally um, efficient. And that's where we would see infill as being um a major way to get there but yeah so but but your point is i think that we have to look at ways to finance the infrastructure required for infill and not put it all on for example one project which we've seen happen yes uh, and you know i think that worked for many many years but uh as infill becomes a larger priority i don't think it works very well at all um, you know, the, I think the sanitary sewer trunk charge is, is possibly a way to, to get this done. Um, <clears throat> you know, it gives developers a, a level of certainty and it provides, uh, you know, some income to the city for the, for infrastructure. All right. Uh, I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Mick. Thank you, Thanks. Councillor McKean. Councillor Henderson is next. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Graham, I I'm interested in your th your thinking if because there's there's one thing that says so we we scatter ground across the city and try to, to deal with stuff where opportunities come up, but the plan actually does call for investment um, in specific areas over time. Understanding we can't do it all at once, and there are you know there's there's maps in here that begin to suggest where investment should go in the first phase, second phase, third phase, and fourth phase. Um, which I think is, I'm guessing, I can confirm this, is designed to answer the question that you're raising, but recognizes that we can't do it everywhere. So any thinking of that, you know, what's being proposed here in terms of, you know, it's, it's, it's split into strategizing it, and then, then investing, and then nurturing. Um, and it, you know, some of the areas you talk about are actually here in the first, in the first phase. So any thoughts about that as a strategy? Yes, sir. I think it's a tremendous strategy. I, I don't think for a second that our city or our province has the resources to do a wholesale 
renovation of our infrastructure. But if we can take a ch bite off a chunk at a time, yeah. you know, we, we've we've got a sensible, you know, budget conscious way of proceeding. What I find a little bit upsetting is, you know, we were planning on a, a west extension of the LRT and the roads dug up to move the infrastructure that needs to move. Um, what I find bothersome is there doesn't seem to be a view to upgrading that infrastructure while we've got it dug up um, to uh, support the development that we're planning to have along that particular right. transportation corridor and, and uh, uh, development node. Yeah, and well, that's interesting because I presume that the premise of what's presented here is that, is that uh, and you know that that gets us around that gets us to the question of whether or not you're opportunistic or whether or not you focus where you see the opportunities for for redevelopment happening soonest or where you want to encourage it to happen soonest, and those are kind of trade-off questions. Um, but I guess the advantage of having a long-term plan is you can begin to understand where you may be going in 20 years rather than in 10. Um, and take be, take advantage of those opportunis opportunistic oppor uh, those opportunities um, in response to a twenty or thirty year plan rather than a ten year plan. Um, that's part of what you're suggesting here. It is yes. I, I like that the city plan provides us an opportunity to focus on 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 certain smaller areas. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bangan. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Graham, a couple of questions. Is yes. it coming through? Um, yeah, Mike, I won't ask any infrastructure questions. That they've been asked already. And in some of the cities, uh, uh, when infill is... Uh, is stressed more, uh, and the prices go high. And then eventually the properties uh, become unaffordable, especially housing. In your mind, what do you think will happen when we try to uh, uh, accommodate 600,000 people within the within the Anthony Handy circle? I think <clears throat> I, I agree with you, sir, that, uh, you know, if we look at big cities around the world, the closer um, you move to the center, the more expensive property gets. Now, there are, there are other factors which drive that. Uh, I think San Francisco uh, is an interesting example. They've had a a tech boom where lots of people have been paid lots of money and, and that has changed the way the market operates. So I think it's very tough for a city and certainly you folks as, as councillors to try and predict what the impacts are going to be. But what I can say is that it's really the price of land that is causing the increase in price, increase in price of, of housing. So if we, through our, our city plan and our bylaws, can facilitate more density, uh, we get more people on that expensive piece of land. So, you know, that's one mechanism that will help to reduce the cost of housing in Edmonton. Okay, so um, it's a chicken and uh, egg situation. Uh, if you... Uh bring more people, the prices go high. But if uh, there is an uh, option for people to basically um, build anywhere in the city, the prices, do uh, you think they, there is a propensity for those prices to kind of balance them out? I think so. I, I, you know, we're a city of a million people now heading for two million. So we, we've and we don't, I don't think, have uh, <clears throat> built forms. We don't have a big enough variety of built forms in our city to reflect the variety of, of um, nationalities and interests and, and 
Um, the cross-section of people that we have in our city doesn't match the cross-section of build form we have, particularly in our, in our mature parts of the city. Um, I think if we can facilitate more density, the way we'd see in, you know, a bigger city like even tr like Toronto, um, Vancouver, you know, where there's a lot more density closer to the center, um, I think that would help to mitigate the high cost of housing. Okay, and my last question is if uh, and the prices go up as they pre they're presumed, why would people who cannot afford in Edmonton, they would stay in Edmonton than, than go in the surrounding communities? Well, <clears throat> people are going to choose what they choose, but I think if we look at what's going on in Edmonton today, uh, people are buying skinny houses. Right now, these are houses that are going to cost between six hundred and eight hundred thousand dollars. If you think about what that kind of money will buy you in a mature neighbor, sorry, in a in a greenfield neighborhood, a brand new neighborhood, you get a heck of a lot more house and and land. So clearly, people have decided that it's worth a lot of money to them to be closer to downtown, to be closer to the River Valley, to be closer to perhaps its schools. There are a whole bunch of different motivations, but you know the market has indicated that um, being closer to the center is valuable to a significant number of people. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Councillor Katarina. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Graham. Good morning. Uh, you'd uh, just uh, let me uh, ask first if I uh, heard you correctly that uh, info targets are going to be difficult to uh, uh, to reach if uh, infrastructure isn't uh, improved. And obviously, uh, infill requires uh, additional infrastructure. Is that what I heard you say? That's exactly right. The infrastructure we've got is. Uh, I think was designed with a much lower residential density in mind. So now we're increasing density. We've got to increase the, the size of the pipes, for example. Yeah. yeah and that's, uh, that's uh, agreed uh, with that. Uh, about a decade ago, uh, uh, before the neighborhood renewal program was initiated and uh, uh, paid for by a dedicated tax, uh, uh, an inventory was done of our infrastructure uh, of that day, uh, 2010, roughly around that time. And there was a $30 billion, $30 billion deficit even at that time to bring our existing neighborhoods, 301, uh, up to today's standards. So $30 billion plus this plan to double the city uh, and uh, focusing on 50% on infill uh, to me seems insurmountable that under any circumstances uh, we will never accomplish uh, the infill at 50 percent with that type of uh, infrastructure that's needed sir, and sir, uh, question who, who is going to pay for it that that is the question mr mayor uh, uh to mr graham on on how he sees that uh, even a possibility difficult to do uh, but add the thirty billion deficit that we are already facing. It's a very difficult question. Um, I think there the the money is going to have to come from a bunch of different directions. Um, but if we can create a city where we've got you know five hundred and twenty thousand more jobs, that's a that's a whole bunch more tax revenue. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I've, I'm, I'm not a finance guy, but I do know that there are big cities around the world who started with a heck of a lot less infrastructure than we've got, um, who are somehow muddling through it and and, uh, and getting it done. Um, it uh, It's a huge number. Uh, what I find a little bit reassuring about this pe peculiar time we're living in um, is that, you know, Governments seem to be able to find money. 20% of the 
the dollars and yen and euros in circulation today have been created in the last six months. And as far as I know, we haven't seen a huge spike in inflation. So um, they, when it needs to happen, it gets done. Okay. Um, I think uh, the monies that they're finding, uh, it's all on a uh, deficit that will have to be paid and nobody knows how we're going to actually pay for, uh, uh, for that. Uh, so uh, the other question I have for you just in, um, in general is, uh, does this plan look like we want to uh, drive uh, choice up or do we want to drive choice down? Uh, depending on uh, the policies we put in place uh, to allow people to have that choice of where they would like to uh, uh, to live. Uh, not everybody uh, likes to live in the center of the city. Not everybody likes to live in the suburbs. So it's all subjective depending on your lifestyle, family size and makeup, all those sorts of things go into it. Uh, so does this strike a balance to you uh, that people still have a choice uh, of what they would prefer? It does, but it also acknowledges that, you know, business as usual isn't sustainable from an environmental or financial standpoint. Um, we're, I think it strikes a great balance in trying to provide more options for people and also providing a responsible route forward uh, that we're going to be able to pay for and sustain, you know, generations ahead. Terrific. Thank you, Mr. Graham, for your perspective. Uh, Thanks. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Any further questions for Mr. Graham? Well, thank you very much, sir. Next will be Mike Cole from UDI Edmonton Region. Great, thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here today. I'm Mike Cole speaking on behalf of the Urban Development Institute, Edmonton Region, a not-for-profit association representing the development industry in the Edmonton Region. I'd like to start by noting that staff have done a tremendous job engaging with industry in what's been an open, honest, and constructive conversation about how the city plan will be interpreted and implemented. The vision laid out in the city plan is exciting and ambitious. As city builders, we are excited to be part of that aspirational vision. We support the high-level vision of the plan, but the specifics of how to get there merit careful consideration and discussion as we move from aspiration to action. In the years ahead, there are areas we hope to further define and monitor in partnership with the city to facilitate prudent, responsible growth that fits consumer demands. And it's in that context that we'll offer the following thoughts as we strive together to achieve the growth contemplated in the plan. Firstly, this is a high level plan that presents a bold vision and does not provide the prescriptive rules to achieve that vision. It's important that the plan is flexible to ensure success and that we not lose sight of the market conditions, consumer demand and infrastructure investments that both have been made and that will be required. Different areas will develop at different times depending on the economics, employment, and values of the customer of the day. And the city plan should not prohibit people's choice in how and where they live. Second, one of Edmonton's key competitive advantages to attract and retain people and investment is affordability and housing choice. If this is eroded, the city will lose a key competitive advantage. We'll need to be aware of and should avoid policies as we move forward that put those at risk. Further, we should look to how to leverage those strengths as a city. Third, the growth of redeveloping areas at the density intensification contemplated in the plan has a number of key risks that will make it difficult to achieve. The plan assumes significant growth being directed towards high density build forms in redeveloping areas beyond what the market study supports. This goal will be inherently difficult to achieve without unintended consequences. Further intensification to that degree in existing communities will require significant community consultation. And with that, risk of opposition. Infrastructure improvements required could be significant. This cost is currently under review through an infrastructure capacity study and will help better inform the achievement of that goal, but at this time, it's not fully understood. Fourth, the plan outlines growth in three general areas, the redeveloping area, the developing area, 
and future growth areas. Substantial completion of the developing areas is a requirement prior to any planning for contiguous future growth areas. We believe substantial completion needs to be more clearly defined and ensure that we maintain the balance of customer choice and market demand with plan development. There are some maps included in, within the plan that label these lands as no growth areas, which is inconsistent with other areas within the plan, labeling it as future growth areas. We believe that the wording no growth is negative and constraining language that does not provide flexibility to potential future market opportunities and existing city infrastructure, core principles of smart growth. We would respectfully request for that specific wording change from no growth to future growth. Lastly, as we move forward putting the city plan into action, we need to look at the city plan in terms of goals and not rules. As 2020 has demonstrated, there will be many things that we cannot reasonably predict. And so again, flexibility and adaptability are critical. We need to protect our competitive advantage as a city and ensure that we are a place that can attract the next billion people and the jobs and the growth that includes and not just assume it. EDI would like to thank the city for engaging with this. As, a, as city builders, we deeply appreciate the opportunity to work and grow the city together. Thank you. Well, thanks, Mike. I know you guys have been embedded throughout these important conversations. So thank you for continuing that engagement here today. Um, first up uh, is uh, Councillor Walters. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mike, or Mr. Cole, for uh, your submission and your organization's work on this. So a few questions. When I read the letter that uh, you submitted uh, on behalf of UDI, uh, there was a lot in there, and I appreciate the, the openness to uh, sort of endorsing the plan at a high level. But when I read between the lines a little bit, uh, there's a couple things that were highlighted that I wanted to uh, 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 ask you about. And so it kind of strikes me that there's a, there's a view that we have to be really careful, not romanticize infill too much, uh, and let's get on with... Uh, planning the annexation area. Uh, so I wanted you to c comment on, on whether you think that's a fair perspective on my part when I read that, that letter that you submitted. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think we will always advocate for choice in, in housing um, and, and build form. Uh, we represent and advocate for both greenfield and um, infill development, and there's an important part of, uh, of all build forms and that choice uh, throughout the city. So, you know, the city plan is, is highly visionary and, and the, the key part is as we move forward um, and, spe and, and specifically look at the tactics to implement those goals. Um, you know, so to the extent that we, uh, there might not be full market acceptance that would achieve the infill goal, that, that will be a challenge. Uh, and to the extent that there's opportunities within the, within the annexed uh, lands that we're not taking advantage of uh, could be a challenge as well. Okay, so if when it comes to choice, you know, it seems like, you know, a goal of 50-50 seems fair in terms of providing people with both of those choices. Uh, one of the advantages today of the suburban context, because there's way more supply in a way that you've achieved this affordability, which rightly is part of our competitive advantage, I agree with that. Is it not arguable that you know, providing more supply in an infill context, similar to how an increased supply in the suburban context creates affordability, will do the same thing? So you're actually truly providing people choice when you're increasing the amount of supply in the redevelopment areas uh, over what we have today. Is that not a fair way to look at it? <clears throat> Yeah, I would I would agree that as you know, um, as supply increases, whether it's in the greenfield context or an infill context, that um, supply demand economics should should dictate that uh, that pricing comes down. Um, so I, I do think as there's further and there will be further development within the core, uh, we should see um, pricing come down. Um, however, we we do have to watch um, consumers, as as pointed out in the market study. Uh, continue to prefer ground-oriented single-family development. So um, that that could be a challenge to the higher density build form contemplated in the infill context. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, infill will, will continue to be a challenge at the lower end of the affordability spectrum. So when I think about millennials, uh, just last question before I run out of time, 
you know, not a, they're not a monolithic consumer that's all rushing to live in the core. Uh, there's certainly demand uh, to live in the suburbs in that group as well. But what's the difference between their interests and say the, you know, the current you know, Gen, or Gen Xers as an example that, that fill up the suburbs uh, lar largely today? So, you know, is that, what's your market an analysis there that's gonna tell you how to develop those neighborhoods differently? Well, speaking myself as a as a Gen Xer, I could I could say that uh, much like millennials, I wanted to live in the core, um, and then uh, you know, as as I got older and had a had a family, uh, those preferences change, and and generally that's what we find in our current market studies now, and I think supported by the market study within the city plan, uh, that even uh, even with millennials, um, you know, there there is a general. Uh, desire to move towards ground ori ground oriented uh, single family housing units uh, n certainly not in its entirety but uh, as a generalization so um, I think that will always be a strong demand I think in the design of new communities in in whether it's in the core or in the greenfield context building good strong complete communities with great amenities will always be uh, critical no matter which generation thank you thank you um Lost the speakers list there. Next up, Councillor Nickel. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Cole, I'll ask you point blank. Do you think this 2 million uh, number for population is a realistic number over the time frame, given the present market conditions and the context of where we are in the region? I think uh, in, in the range of forecasts, I think in current economic uh, Current economic conditions—it's—it's it's definitely a challenge. Um, I, you know, I think uh, um, achieving two million people and supporting a prosperous uh, region I th is one of the stated goals of the plan. Uh, given the current economic situation of both, you know, the nation, the province, and, and the region, it, it will be a challenge. So, I always look at plans in terms of context and where it is in its place and time, particularly over time. You speak of market demand and affordability. What, what is the risk for uh, the city of Edmonton in the long run with against our regional neighbors in terms of uh, marketplace and our market share? Yeah, I'll, I'll probably answer that uh, in two different ways. Uh, the first is what happens if we aren't able to achieve growth and, uh, and be a prosperous region? Um, and what is the impact of that from a, from a, uh, what is the fiscal impact of that? I think we have to uh, always prepare for that question and understanding as well. Um, but then secondly, you know, to the extent that we are uncompetitive at a regional level, um, we could lose uh, investment um, uh, and capital and talent uh, people um, within the city to the region as well. Isn't there, hasn't UDI raised the issue because we always talk about density versus sprawl. Is there not a risk out there that if the city of Edmonton uh, isn't on some sort of par with its regional neighbors, that our regional neighbors are just going to increase the sprawl of the situation as we go forward? Yeah, there's certainly a risk in two parts on that. One is if we limit housing choice, um, and that housing choice isn't limited in the region, um, that could certainly result in a loss. Um, the other one is affordability, of course. So if costs are higher, whether that's by way of land or policy, um, then that could obviously drive out uh, uh, people and investment into the region as well. In terms of next steps for UDI, um, you're, you've made the comment here in your letter, moving from aspiration to action. So in terms of the specifics, what you want to see next in terms of the tangibility of this plan, do you have a kind of, um, I've, I have your letter in front of me here. Uh, what, what do you want to see as an organization? I think what we have seen, not just through the engagement on the city plan, but in, in general with the city is we've always had a good relationship and, and strong engagement with the city and that's what we would continue to ask for. Uh, as we move through all of the specific policies contemplated within the city plan, whether it's the zoning bylaw renewal or or any other policy, we, we want to have a seat on the table and make sure that we're discussing all the important information to get 
contemplated. Because uh, often on these, it's it's a question of trade-offs, whether it's financial or affordability, um, uh, with the with the stated policy objectives. So uh, that's what we would look to uh, be a key part of as we move forward. I guess with my last question, Mr. Cole, your top three specifically in the next 12 months, what would you like to see move forward in terms of issues to be dealt with? Um, well, I, th I think in terms of the immediacy, it would be the, the, the two most uh, timely ones right now are the zoning bylaw uh, renewal um, and the energy transition uh, file are the two key ones um, that come to mind just by virtue of them being uh, part of the engagement process right now. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, any other questions for Mr. Cole? Uh, I've, I've, uh, uh, Councillor Bang, if you could take the chair. I'll the chair. Really appreciate your, uh, your submission. I guess um, you might have a better sense of the market realities in the neighborhood around us. Um, sorry, I didn't click on uh, into, if you can start my time me and start my time. Um, some of the market realities uh, around us in the neighborhood, no doubt there's a, a, a question of competitiveness uh, in the region, but the regional growth plan does provide uh, at least a floor under density expectations, not just for Edmonton, but for the region, correct? That's your understanding? That's correct. And, and are you seeing, I mean, I, I think there was some uh, pushback against that um, and there may still be some pushback in certain communities, but my sense is that um, uh, most of the municipalities are rewriting and redrafting their municipal development plans to be at least compliant with the, uh, with the regional growth plan. Is that your sense or is there still some pushback in a sense that perhaps that statutorily well, actually, regulatorily um, embedded um, growth plan, you know, might be up for debate, or or is that sort of a reference point for what growth will look like? You know, absorption may it may be uh, slowed down by this economic situation for sure, but but that still the the base case involves adherence to the regional growth plan. Or are you hearing any different in the in the marketplace and in the sort of competitive landscape of other municipalities? I'm, I'm not hearing anything different uh, within the marketplace, and um, I've, I've not heard anything uh, personally within, within a regional uh, context either. Okay, that's, that's reassuring. I, I haven't either. Generally, what I've seen is municipalities like us starting to talk about not just bare minimum matching, but for all of the same reasons of infrastructure efficiency uh, and fiscal prudence, moving in a similar direction of trying to tighten up their, their footprint and just reduce the, the linear foot uh, or meter, I suppose, of infrastructure per, per dwelling and per business uh, where possible. That that seems to be a logic that the region is bought into as a whole, which wasn't always the case. I mean, there was certainly the argument that the region would sprawl if, if we didn't, so we should too. Uh, I think there's a bit of, and I'm not saying that's your argument, that's a, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but, but I think you're identifying a, a risk of, of still some leakage, because they are held to a lower standard uh, in terms of their densities, but um, so your concern is that they will take a disproportionate share of the, uh, the low density product um, uh, at a more competitive price point if we're not offering enough in a competitive space. And is, does that relate to the question of substantial completion and being able to keep active fronts open, keep, keep competition alive and keep the market functioning well in terms of our ability to, to, to see uh, housing come onto the market at a price point that's competitive to the neighbors through the working yeah, of the market. That, that's exactly it. Um, you know, for for example, within the market, uh, the the market uh, technical study, um, I believe there is two two hundred thousand of the million people, or or twenty twenty percent of the growth, um, uh, was at risk of being absorbed outside of the city. Uh, due to uh, consumer preferred housing type. Um, so, you know, cer certainly, you know, the city plan assumes that 
beyond the current and projected consumer trends towards uh, that infill potential, um, that that growth can still be absorbed. And what we're, what we're saying is we need to be cognizant of that as we move forward. If there is uh, that risk of, of, of market uh, being lost for the city, uh, that's where we need to, you know, not restrict uh, land development and, and policy and, and drive that growth potential outside of the city, but look to capture it within the city. Uh, yeah, and I th that's the that's the dynamic tension of this is how do you not overcorrect to a non-competitive position, but how do you bring along in a regional market reality all of the all of the neighbors and the marketplace to the most compact and infrastructure efficient growth. Um, uh, possible while respecting that the consumer actually drives the demand too. So, um, over, you know, through through your associations and and um, and I, there's a whole conversation about what pandemic will mean for homebuyer expectations and the desire for a bit of space from each other uh, in terms of consumer preference, offset by the fact that incomes are imploding and the economic situation and buying power will potentially allow a lot fewer people, sadly, to aspire to uh, detached home living. So is there any, it's probably too early to say at this point in the crisis, uh, but is there sort of uh, any sort of consensus emerging on that, um, uh, what, the, what the impact of the pandemic will, will have on consumer preference? Because preference is one thing, buying power to meet that. I mean, I'd like a mansion in Bel Air too like the Fresh Prince, but that doesn't mean I can afford it. So so it's constrained by market reality. Uh, and is there any sense from UDI and, and your networks of what that what that's going to look like short to medium term, recognizing this is still a long-term plan? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say there's no consensus other than, uh, you know, speculation across industry. And that's not just within this region, but certainly right across North America and, and, and I guess globally as well. So there, there is a lot of risk and uncertainty with respect to that and how, um, how consumers will uh, adapt uh, over the long run. Uh, but you're, you're right, uh, at this point, it's still very early on to be able to uh, see any meaningful trend. And that'll be an ongoing conversation. But I'm out of time. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll take the chair back and, and, and correct. I don't actually want to live in a mansion in Bel Air, just to be clear, like living where I live here in Edmonton. Um, so uh, Councillor Carmel is next. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Cole, for being here today. Um, this is a weird echo you get in this little phone booth thing that, hey, yeah. Sorry, it's my first time here in a while. Uh, Mr. Cole, uh, there's been a lot of conversation uh, with your presentation and your submission around residential development. Do you have any thoughts on uh, non-residential development and specifically in the, in the uh, annex lands and, and how this uh, designation of uh, no growth uh, affects uh, non-residential development in those areas? Yes, yeah, speaking uh, generally, I, um, as I mentioned, um, you know, on, on the map, on certain maps, there's the no growth distinction on the maps. And, and you know, in a, in a document of this size, uh, you know, a number of people will tend to gravitate towards some key summaries um, from the document, one of which is the maps. And, and that type of language sends a, a fairly strong uh, signal to the, to the investment community at large. Um, so that, that's why, why we were advocating for a change in uh, no growth to, to future growth, which is similar in language to um, used throughout the rest of the document. But, you know, in general, uh, you know, five years ago, I think industry at large w uh, would look to now and be surprised with just how much warehousing and distribution has increased uh, as, a, as an overall market opportunity. Um, so I, th I think, you know, the overall city plan needs to be set up so that it is uh, flexible to be able to capture those opportunities that we might see now, but we don't see now and, and might be there in five years time. And that could be the industrial commercial tax base um, uh, beyond the residential tax base. Is it fair to say that um, in those areas south of the city that there's the potential for a, you know, somewhat of an employment corridor to develop along Highway 2? and that uh, we might see more 
of that non-residential non development develop along that corridor and provide additional employment opportunity that frankly doesn't exist at least in southwest Edmonton? Yes, I, I think there is absolutely an opportunity for that. Obviously, it will be market uh, dependent, but uh, that that is a key corridor for that type of activity. And so the city plan speaks to things like, uh, you know, a 15-minute city, uh, uh, a nodes and corridors aspect, uh, you know, a bit more of a uh, work, live, and play in one part of the city. And and it's my uh, understanding that the, the transportation studies tend to uh, emphasize a somewhat of a edge to the core migration pattern. But if we saw some employment uh, development happen in the south part of the city, and particularly along that corridor, would it not make sense then to synchronize some of the residential development with that potential employment development? So in other words, that we, we might call it future growth, but both could happen at once and potentially relieve some of the pressure we currently see on our transportation system. I absolutely agree, and I think it would go towards achieving a number of the goals stated within the city plan itself. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cole. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Cole? Going once, going twice, not seeing any. Then live, for the first time in a long time, at the microphone, at the podium in City Hall, the novelty is blowing me away. Uh, Chris Nicholas from MLC Land to address uh, a council. Oh, not at the podium. A, a more distant podium. <laughs> We've closed the normal podium, but have established a, a, a safe space. I again applaud uh, city clerks and the city hall staff for finding a way to do this safely as we start to reopen city hall. So um, gingerly and with uh, public hygiene in mind. So, Mr. Nicholas, welcome. I think we'll make sure just that you're now streaming. There you are. Okay. You know the drill. Five minutes. Floor is yours. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, um, so very great to see all of you in person. This is, uh, it almost feels normal. Despite wearing a mask, I'll have to enunciate. I'll do my best. Um, Thank you very much. I'm here on behalf of UDI and uh, MLC, and thanks for the opportunity uh, for some comments on the, the city plan. Um, although well known by uh, mayor and council, I think it's really important to reiterate that only the businesses that UDI, NAOP, CHBA, and IDEA represent are going to implement this plan. We're the city builders. We're the ones that are taking the risk, and we're going to be the ones that are building everything. I would like to thank Kaylin Anderson and her team for the recognition of this fact. She's worked very, very closely over the last two years with her industry. Engagement has been excellent and time well spent. Thank you very much, Kaylin. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for your ongoing professionalism, expertise, and guidance throughout this monumental task. In the next 10 years and beyond, the way we grow our city must reflect the diverse ways Edmonton, Edmontonians want to live, work, and play. And this will call for a wide range of housing and commercial development across diverse areas of the city, making smart use of existing infrastructure and ensuring that development is financially, socially, and environmentally responsible as possible. It is essential to note that Edmonton is decentralized, as just previously mentioned, with only 15% of our population working downtown. To serve people's interests, the city needs to be flexible in executing this plan so that it doesn't inadvertently create barriers that undermine the plan's ultimate vision. For example, and as Mike just mentioned, no growth areas as currently represented on maps on, re on the annexation lands. This designation needs to be changed, as just discussed. Our formal request in this regard is various maps appended in the plan, delete the word no growth and replace with future growth areas. And as UDI Edmonton Region Board Mike said just seconds ago, the city's plan is both exciting and inspirational. But at the same time, as we grow to 2 million people, let's be careful we don't overcommit to building things that people just don't wish to pay for. The city plan must act as an enabler for investment and development and not the contrary. 
these words are critical as we find ways and means to build the city together. I am excited by this plan and with the exception of the single ask and as previously mentioned by Mike, some very good attention on, on the ongoing or upcoming cost of infrastructure. I think this is a great plan and a great guiding document moving forward. Thank you. Thanks for that, Chris. Questions for Mr. Nicholas? I was on. I clicked on. It's council, uh, what's the queue look we like? We do have a, it's Councillor okay. um, Walters Councilor followed Walters. by Cartmel. Councillor Walters, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Nicholas. Thanks for being here in person. Uh, so when we talk about barriers, you, you, you noted not wanting uh, us to create uh, more barriers, uh, just to paraphrase a little bit with this plan. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, two kinds of barriers? One, uh, what are the barriers to suburban development in Edmonton today uh, that you experience? And then maybe com comment on some of the barriers that you see from an infill perspective that need to be addressed today. Uh, I, I think the large one for both of them is, um, you know, just uh, the approval process. Right? It takes time, everything takes time. I think uh, administration's done an excellent job over the last little while uh, on both cases, um, getting better and more efficient. Um, and uh, then subdivision, uh, suburban growth, um, it's, it's, uh, it's the market that is the b barrier that faces all of us. So the approval process, that's, those are two different worlds. And maybe you can correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. The suburban context, the approval process, I think has become more sophisticated. Uh, there's more kind of leadership from industry in terms of uh, certification of, of, of developers and builders and, and more expedi you know, expedited approvals. We haven't quite got there in the infill process. So do you think that's something that needs, in order to satisfy both markets, something we need to continue to work at. Absolutely, and, and uh, you know, not, not lost on any of us. It, it is more complicated. Mm -hmm. Like, we, you get, when you get to start with generally a blank slate and we have a statutory process that's dictated by an MGA, uh, it's a heck of a lot more difficult when you're dealing with people that own 40 feet of land than 160 acres, right? Mm -hmm. So I think um, it's something that we need to get sophisticated about. And if you want to attract the, um, we've talked about it often, if you want to attract the investment, um, not necessarily faster, but it needs to be very predictable, the process. So there's a long way to go for sure um, to get that predictability in, in the statutory process. Right. Yeah. And so this will be the basis for a lot of my questions of administration later about, you know, where we are in terms of that. Uh, in the, in the, Mike mentioned it, or Mr. Cole mentioned the word competitive advantage as it relates to our affordability, which I 100% agree with. I think that's one of the reasons we can attract lots of talented young people is your affordability, which is driven today largely by our suburban uh, neighborhoods. Uh, one of the other competitive advantages that other cities have over us is their core is far more developed, far more vibrant, far more alive 24-7. So would yourself and UDI generally agree that if we had uh, uh, far more people living, far more businesses operating in our core, in our downtown, that that would too be a significant competitive advantage for our city? Yeah, and absolutely. And just a point of clarification, right? We, uh, UDI often gets painted with the Greenfield brush, mm -hmm. but our membership encompasses the largest downtown core builders. So yes, we're in this together. And yeah, we're, we are, it's imperative that we grow their business as well. But again, the supporting document, and yes, I, I would love more restaurants. I'd like, I work down here, we love coming down here, but uh, in 75 years, and the study that is with the, this uh, plan, 15% people work downtown right now, 75 years, it predicts 14%. So it's not, much as yes, we want to be able to provide the housing choices, and I think there's a lot more of our membership we have to support opportunities. It doesn't seem, even by this plan, that that's where the growth is going to be. So, do you think we should settle there and limit ourselves to 14 percent 
I, you know, I, I know that I have questions about that number because I've read other places, you know, that we're still, if we think about, you know, the core, including the university, we're at 25%. And I, when I think about the core, I think about that whole area. But, um, you know, we don't need to settle on that. Like, if our, it depends on what happens to the economy, right? If, if we oh, become more of a tech-based economy in the future in Alberta, who's to say that our downtown's not going to be at a much higher level? I couldn't agree with you more, but again, what we're discussing is a very, very aspirational mm -hmm. plan, and we've already got into the weeds of this or that. We're, we're talking 75 years ago, right? If we went back to 1950 and started talking about what, what Edmonton would be right now, I don't think any of us would have a clear idea. So you have to, you know, if we accept this as an aspirational plan, I don't think anybody's saying yeah, it can only be 14%, let's settle. It's more, let's create the choice, let's, and my, as Mr. Cole was talking about. Let's let this be not, not prohibitive, but in inciting investments and allow for the growth where it needs to be. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Nichol. Okay. Uh, so, Mr. Nicholas, let's talk about the, the consequence of choice and a lack of choice. Often I hear that we are comparing ourselves to jurisdictions that often have what I would call geographic boundaries to choice, be it mountains, rivers, oceans, and so on. But that's not the case here in the city of Edmonton, is it? We have a regional competitive network going around us that has offered different kinds of choices. And so if we're talking about densification versus sprawl, can you identify for me, again, I, I go back what I said to uh, Mr. Cole, the top three mm -hmm. issues around choice and providing that choice within the city of Edmonton so we can be competitive to our regional neighbours. Um, yeah, and it's a great question and a, and a great conversation. Um, again, the market's going to dictate... Um, where we go, and the point was made, uh, if there's more choices in infill, are we not doing that? And absolutely, we, we're pro-development pro in every area. Now, I, I think it, we get, when we call, I don't like the word sprawl, because I think it's only uh, the Edmonton suburban developers that have reached the 50 units per hectare, plus, 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 where we're getting and, and doing a good job of that development. It is intensification. It is densification, right? And um, the most important thing is to be integral to this plan while we are, are mindful of choice of the environmental, social, and economic consequences of growth to make it smart every single time we're doing it. So it's not a, so it can be in perpetuity. So I see you're arguing for discipline and rigor. That is certainly what, what I, am I interpret, interpreting that correctly, that over the long term, kind of guaranteeing or looking at stability with that discipline and rigor is the best thing we could probably do uh, with regards to ensuring we have adequate choice in the marketplace? Uh, well, yes, yes, sir. I, it has to be iterative as we go. We're certainly smarter a week from now and than currently with the, you know, so we have to be always looking at this and it has to be iterative as we go. Should I, is, is NAP going to be coming forward or can I ask you about commercial and industrial development? I'll fake it a bit, but yes, I, I'm not sure if NAP is uh, <laughs> registered. It's certainly not my forte, as you know. Well, okay, I'll ask you, Mr. Nicholas, even though you're a residential, uh, primarily residential developer, um, our industrial commercial tax base has obviously had some blows taken to it over the past decade if not decade and a half. Um, what uh, I can just see in the county of Leduc and Sherwood Park and uh, off we go. Uh, is that not on a, they've opted for a cheaper lower cost choice. So I guess from that perspective, how do we get the gravity back for our industrial commercial tax base? Um, and again, it starts with providing the opportunities, right? Uh, a, a no growth node as, as uh, Mr. Cole is just, no one's going to invest in a no growth area. So um, again, I think it's going to be on a case by case basis. We're going to have to be a little more creative, but it starts with at least allowing the opportunity for investment. And currently this plan does not. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, next is Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nichols, um, when you're going through uh, this uh, city plan, does it give you a feeling that it's more, I guess, heavy towards uh, residential than industrial? Um, no, I I, uh, I think it, it it's a it's a balanced approach on 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 how the city is going to grow over the next seventy five years. Okay, and then uh, when Edmonton uh, uh, annexed a whole bunch of areas, and uh, then we uh, ended up, uh, uh, I guess, convinced in the province that. We had a, we had need for it, but by designating no growth area, are we recanting on this commitment? Um, and just my opinion alone, Councillor Banga, it does seem a little counterintuitive to me. Yes, sir. Okay, and uh, again, what happens to the consumer? or, uh, or uh, investor confidence in those areas. I mean, no growth means nothing is going to happen there, right? Uh, yeah, I think the, the plan dictates that at, at a certain time, you know, growth will happen there, but it's 30 plus years. So I can tell you, even though it's only shown in a draft right now, it's completely deteriorated. And there's a lot of people that are residences in that annex area that are very disappointed by the same sentiments that you're bringing forward right now. Okay. So whether it's industrial or it's residential, people want to live where they want to live. People want to work where they want to live. And usually people want to live close to where they work. And do uh, you think by designating those no-growth areas, are we crippling the whole area in there yes you are you, you it's um as you pointed out it's uh you you cannot attract investment um as a no growth area but not only in no growth i'm talking about also where there going to be future growth are we are we dictating that too well i think so because you know you look at uh, just when you know the conversation that was before again getting a little in the weeds but there's infrastructure immediately there. There's 41st Avenue, there's overpasses, there's things that could be utilized for that growth to occur in a very economic fashion. Okay, and in your mind, what happens to, uh, uh, I guess, the non-residential growth around, uh, around uh, International Airport? Does it restrict that area? Um, not if they're in Leduc, sir, but yes, besides it prohibits it, not even restricts it. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Katarina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and, uh, uh, Mr. Nicholas. Um, uh, so this city plan, I mean, it's, it's long-term, uh, and, uh, my understanding is that the opinion is that it's inspirational in uh, inspirational and a lot of assumptions are being made over the next uh, half a century and uh, a, du a doubling of, uh, of population. Would, would that uh, be your thought? Yeah, yeah, agreed. Who's who's to know, but I think it's, uh, it's a great place to start. We've got to start somewhere. Okay, so in in uh, uh, noting that uh, that it is long term, and certainly uh, the devil is going to be in the details uh, year after year after year, and being able to adjust accordingly uh, uh, with the market uh, as we proceed on. But given this context of uh, COVID that we're in now, uh, what are the learnings uh, that you found uh, for the industry and many others uh, that what we considered uh, absolutely necessary prior to COVID that we needed to uh, drive to a location to actually work uh, is not necessarily the case anymore. 
uh, have we learned that we can actually uh, uh, do work outside of employment nodes? Um, yeah, in, in early days for sure, but I think, uh, you know, BOMA and, and uh, would be uh, much better to answer this, but I think we've all seen in our organizations or those that we work with that, you know, we can work from home. Um, we can host uh, meetings without everybody here with some efficiency. Um, I think it will have some long lasting effects um, on how office space is used and how people work in the future for sure. You know, with uh, that in mind, uh, I think that there's probably a lot of thinking going on right now from many uh, employers or, or uh, uh, from the economy that uh, they could actually do uh, the same work or, or uh, uh, much differently than having to spend uh, the capital cost of uh, actual physical space uh, to accommodate uh, all employees. And uh, the Stantec uh, Stan Tower is one good example now where the 30 floors are uh, virtually empty. Yeah, agreed. And even, um, you know, just to speak to something I know, uh, we're not a large organization, but uh, we have, you know, uh, several people that prefer to work from home and we're allowing that flexibility. Um, when we resign our lease, your case in point, it, we're, we're only going to take half to three quarters of the space because we're very conscious of overhead and trying to be dynamic going forward. So, you know, with that, uh, you know, and I, you know, look forward a year, look forward five years or 10 years. Uh, that uh, uh, trying to attract businesses downtown, for example, where the workforce is being accommodated outside of downtown, uh, that's counterintuitive as well, too. So there are uh, a lot of things in this plan uh, that don't seem to uh, dovetail together. Uh, ideally, I mean, if this is inspirational, we would like certain things to happen. Uh, at some point, but that doesn't look like uh, what is going to be reality in the in the short term, anyway. I agree with that, but um, like we all know, and I think it was a mandate. Um, Did we lose your microphone, Mr. Sorry. Nicholas? I agree with you, uh, and, but I, I think um, you know all, everybody wants and, and like to live in Edmonton we want to empower our downtown we want as many opportunities as possible so yes it's going to be dynamic and I think it's early days to uh, for, for sure for sure me drawing conclusions on long-lasting effects of COVID. Yeah sometimes I you know the the saying of uh, what's old is new and uh, this reminds me of uh, 30 40 years ago where uh, downtown as vibrant as it was come 4.30 when everybody went home, uh, really it was uh, not so vibrant. Uh, all business was done during the day and uh, that created a lot of issues for uh, uh, what we thought would be the employment node, the downtown core, the vibrancy, and it's been mentioned 24 hours a day. Uh, that to me seems a little bit unrealistic at this point in time uh, uh, that we would uh, uh, have that type of, uh, of thinking, uh, um, given, given the context that we're in with, uh, with COVID. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. And just one, uh, other, uh, question. If you, if you've seen, uh, real, real uh, quick counselor, you're, uh, you're at the time. Yeah. In your, in your industry, uh, uh, with, uh, again, COVID, uh, the context of this uh, density uh, seems to be uh, uh, one of our enemies right about now. Uh, yeah, again, early days, um, uh, certainly um, single family houses and uh, or single door entry or like uh, the townhouses have certainly been a benefactor of um, in over the last four or five months, you've seen real estate everywhere um, uh, have a, had a surge. I don't think it's a long term, but that that represents does represent a flight from multi-family, probably rental units into single doors. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Nicholas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Councillor Bang is on the list next, but I think he's already gone on this round. So next would be Councillor Henderson. 
Um, yeah, Mr. Nicholas, I'm, I'm interested because it seems to me understanding that the kind of nomenclature, the way we, what we're calling things here is, is one of the issues, but I'm curious to get your thinking, remembering where we were 10 years ago, the last time we did this, that at that point there were a lot of people that I think were frustrated because they had made investment, perhaps prematurely, that then pushed very hard for us to be able to create opportunity because that investment, so it seems to me there is some real advantage um, so that people don't make investment prematurely, which I think is an equal danger, um, to give some kind of signal of, of the sequencing of this, when we think it's going to happen, understanding this is all adjustable if, if demand and markets change. But it, I'm, I'm guessing that is about two things. One is um, when we think it may happen, or when we would predict it may happen in the sequence, and when you start thinking about it and strategizing, and when you start giving the signals that people should start investing. And, and that somehow or other, you know, and in some ways the, the language in this document and the activation maps anticipate that, although they don't specifically talk about um, investment in some of these areas that do slowly come on over time. So just, I, I wouldn't mind your thinking about that because I, I, I think, you know, there's a danger, there's a danger in giving the signals that, that, there is, that, that it isn't going to be sequential, that that's not fair to people either. And, and, um, and how we deal with that question in terms of when you, at what point you begin to start doing the investment in area, which would, be, which would be then followed by at what point you actually start allowing development to happen in an area, and how, how, we, how we talk about that in this document. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. I think that goes to the very heart of what we're saying. Um, it's, development's gonna be iterative. The statutory process is iterative. When uh, future consideration or investment is going to happen, I don't know. But an aspirational do document that goes out 75 years should not be the thing that prohibits it. It should allow. Uh, and, 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 this, and yeah. you know, should it account for some predictability? Perhaps. But again, it's not a document that's going to dictate how things grow. It's going to be the market. So it needs to allow for it and let, let the smart growth occur. But is there not some advantage in giving signals out to the market so that everybody knows what the expectations are about what, what piece comes on next? Um, and understanding can be adjusted. Understanding if you see real pressures in an area that go way beyond what's anticipated, you can shift and change it. But I'm, I'm just nervous about, about not putting, not, that it, it feels to me unfair to the market to say to it, we don't know, invest wherever you want. Um, when there's a possibility right now to say this is where we think this is the thing that makes sense to go to next and that 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 does the, that helps people understand So they don't get an awful lot of money and in investment tied up in an area that may not happen for for 20 years um, I, I can't speak for on behalf of the whole private industry, but um, No, I don't think we ever look to government to influence where we are going to make our investments. And the city has never grown like that. We ask for the city to be flexible and, account and, and accommodating if we are adhering to what the rules are. The private sector will always be the growth and the investment, if it's wide open, will occur. And then we, when, then we decide on the smart building process, programs together and when it occurs. But the risk is inherent and is always there. Oh, I understood. I, I just, I, it just, it strikes me that this way of doing things lessens the risk in some ways, which is, which makes it easier and more effective for people to, to invest and not end up hung out to dry. Well, um, especially, sorry to interrupt, it, but it, especially in the infill situation, right? As, as previously talked with Mr. Graham, um, you can't go and replace 30 billion or whatever, uh, Councillor, was. Um, was talking about. Um, so there, 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 there's a lot more precedent when there's going to be that, uh, some direction that's going forward there, for sure. No, absolutely, yeah, yeah. No, and infill I understand, and I think, you know, that's why I asked that question. It's more, it's more that, it's more, and I understand how we talk about it is important. Um, I'm just, I want to just make sure that it's not the intent to say any of this can develop whenever, because I'm not sure that serves anybody either. 
Oh, agreed. It's yeah. got to be smart. But if we're using, if we're utilizing infrastructure that's in the ground, and it's economically, socially, and environmentally responsible, which are the keystones of this plan, then it should occur. Okay. Great. Thanks. I just thought I wanted to explore that a bit. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Councillor McKean. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Nicholas, uh, if you went back about 10, 11, 12 years, there was a group that met 100 leaders in Edmonton under uh, EEDC arranged this. And the number one recommendation that came out of that for improving Edmonton's economy was to revitalize the downtown. And I hear questions and comments being made today that would seem to suggest that uh, downtown won't be as important in the future as we grow. Is that UDI's position? Uh, not at all. It's the antithesis of our position. Yeah, because um, there's now what was the, what came out of that was the downtown vibrancy task force, and there's been a now we have the downtown revitalization task force that's been created with some pretty heavy hitters on that. And with the growth we've seen, with the applications we've seen in towers over the past four or five years, I don't know how many have come before council and been approved. Do you, do you think that trend will continue? Well, again, uh, Council McKean, those applicants or 90% of those applicants are members of UDI. So right. we sure as heck hope so. Yes. Yeah. And that would create a very residential downtown that would be a 24 seven downtown. And of course, you know, with the amount of money we're putting into LRT and other things that link right into the downtown, I just, I just wanted to be clear on your position about um, downtown and where it fit in your in the UDI's thinking of the coming decades. You still see it having a critical role in attracting talent, attracting investment, yada, yada, yada. 100% and perhaps the most important factor going forward for all of us, yes. Thank you. Um, Councillor Banga, could you take the chair? Got the chair. Uh, so just on the question of aspiration and stretch, and you can stretch too far for sure, um, but it's hard to know what's going to be a stretch and what's not, especially over this kind of time frame. Uh, so your point about rigor and flexibility and measurement, uh, all, all, that's, all that and the UDI submission on all that's very well taken. Um, but uh, what I wanted to pick your brain on was going back 10 years to the conversation about um, what the goal should be for infill and uh, at the time even 25 was seen as an impossible stretch but through a variety of, of factors and means we got pretty close to that over 10 years when people were saying even as a 20 or 30 year goal it was a stretch so so that to me illustrates the value of, of the stretch because it gets you thinking more creatively about your regulatory barriers, the fiscal issues, and so on and so forth. So, so I, um, I guess reflecting on on the journey from ten years ago to now, and extrapolating from that, um, what are your thoughts about the value of a stretch uh, to really get that thinking going from a regulatory point of view for us, but also uh, on the supply side? Uh, responding to demand such as it is but but what is the role of industry in helping to redefine what is possible going forward as we've shown we can do over the last 10 years I, I um, and again that's you know we could debate the two million number uh, all day long but I, I think it's a great it's it's preparing ourselves right for preparing ourselves for, for success rather than and I mean so more the share of I, growth I so over two million time is fine. And we don't have a problem with the 50% of infill. You know, how we get there, I don't think, again, I guess it goes back to Councillor Henderson's last question. Uh, I'm not sure, right? But we have to have goals. We have to have a stretch. We have no problem with that. But to get there, we don't, don't prohibit something in order to, because that's, that's where we'll lose. Well, and that's, that's 
really helpful because uh, if you don't, that's the, I mean, in our business, as we've seen with our really ambitious goals, if you don't get there, it doesn't matter that you got three quarters of the way there and achieved transformational change. People are still saying, it's like my dad saying, you know, where's the other 5% on the test, right? And, and uh, because the public expects great things from us. But I guess that's to the other question of what is the role uh, for industry in helping to communicate the vision of the city for the region, for the benefit of the economy, and particularly the, the, the I mean, there's a lot of lofty aspirations and outcomes we're looking for in this plan, but the most important one I think that's tangible to taxpayers, especially right now with the pressure we're all, we're all under, is that building this city is, according to the estimates, and they're just estimates in a model, but 8% more fiscally efficient than business as usual. Surely that leaves extra money in people's pockets for buying power in the marketplace for whatever it is the consumer prefers. And this is a good thing. I, I, would, I would hope so. Um, I, and I don't think now's the, the time to uh, debate um, development cost because... Um, I meant, I meant cost to the taxpayer, I fiscal efficiency of, of it. Yeah. And it, uh, it always goes, but uh, I think growth still pays for itself, and I, and I think we could easily prove that. But no, 50%, uh, and I think it goes to the role of industry, I think it goes to Councillor uh, Walter's question, that the role of industry to help to us get there for the region and all is to help the statutory process be simpler, to, to attract the investment, to get where we need to be. So the, uh, on, the, on the question of, of growth, and I won't take you down that path because we've been having that conversation, and I've learned a lot from it, and I think we all have over the years, but, but flipping it to infill, um, there's a tension because if you infill, you've got to upgrade infrastructure. But if it's aging infrastructure anyway and you are going to have to replace it anyway, um, I guess broad strokes, your view, does infill pay for itself? Is it net positive for the fiscal situation of the city or, or not? I, again, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot more complicated and probably case-by-case -case basis, you know. Um, uh, you go to redevelop Park Island and triple the capacity in there, and then you have to build um, a 17-kilometer sanitary line to Gold Bar, that's going to be a very, very different conversation than, to, you know, what are the capacities and, and then working within them. And, you know, we look forward to working with the administration because the costs, as outlined right now, they're not, they're not well known and it's not well done. I know that study's coming. We, and we, we got to figure that one out, but yeah. uh, I'll let my parents know to apply for upzoning because they still live in Park Allen. So I didn't mean to pick <laughs> that's on that. your example. So <laughs> I don't think it's going to get that dense. But anyway, I really have always appreciated your perspective, Mr. Nicholas. Thank you for joining us here today. I'll take the chair Thank back you. and check to see uh, before we let you go if there are any other questions. Not seeing any, then uh, with gratitude, you may step back and we'll now go back to hearing uh, in a remote format from Michaela Davis from UDI Edmonton Region. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, Mayor Iveson and Edmonton City Councillors. My name is Michaela Davis and I'm here today on behalf of UDI as the chair of the UDI Planning Committee. I also work at Melcourt Developments here in Edmonton. Thank you for the opportunity to share our industry views on this draft city plan. Again, to my colleague Chris, I would like to acknowledge the tremendous job done by Kaylin Anderson. Uh, without her leadership, her expertise, and passion, the plan before us today would not have been possible. I've had the opportunity to work with the city plan team over the last few years and have provided feedback throughout this engagement process. A big thank you goes out to Kaylin, Charity, Haweda, Michael, and their team for their incredible effort on the city plan. So now on to the city plan itself. Uh, this is a high level plan that presents a bold vision for Edmonton. It is ambitious and aspirational. It describes a vibrant city where people will want to live. It is exciting to think and to plan for Edmonton at 2 million people. But we have identified a couple of areas that we can together improve. Uh, firstly, adding density with the existing, within the existing city boundaries, 50% of which will be in the form of infill may sound efficient, but the costs associated with these types of developments must be considered. Um, as my colleagues have, have alluded to, existing in underground infrastructure will need to be replaced at great, at great cost. This will include storm mitigation, sewers, 
water lines, power upgrades, and roads. The intensification, as proposed by the city plan, will not be achieved without funding for these future projects. As already, the current upgrading costs are a barrier to many infill projects being contemplated in today's market. Additionally, nodes will need to be anchored by public transit, meaning significant investment in transit will also be necessary, and parks and schools and other core incentives will need to be provided. The full cost of these infrastructure upgrades will be significant and has yet to be determined. The estimated costs that we have reviewed, outlined by the city consultants, really do not reflect the true cost of these required upgrades. We need to understand the impact of these infrastructure upgrades on both residential and non-residential property taxes, as well as to the affordability of these housing types in the Edmonton market. So secondly, um, as builders and developers of the city, we fully support the plan's goal of promoting density in the identified redeveloping area. However, we do not understand why the plan does not allow development in identified future growth areas or greenfield in some cases for more than 30 years. Growth in the redeveloping area and the future growth area are not mutually exclusive. The city plan and its supporting growth studies identify that growth and housing types within the future growth area is highly desired in the market. Where development of future growth areas could be most socially, financially and environmentally responsible, why tie our collective hands and rule out possible ways of bringing this vision to life by arbitrarily identifying these areas as no growth and restricting their development based on timing of population build out. Uh, so further to what Chris mentioned earlier, we respectfully request that the identification of these no growth areas be removed from the city plans mapping and be replaced with future growth areas. In closing, uh, we are really encouraged and excited to take this plan one step further. We hope that our expertise has contributed to this plan and that it is flexible, adaptable, and resilient to different market, societal, and financial conditions for many years to come. So let's build a city together where people want to live, work, and play. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you very much, Ms. Davis. Questions for Ms. Davis? Not seeing any, going once, going twice. Thank you very much for your presentation. You. Next is Melanie Hoffman. Hello. Getting my stopwatch ready here. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Mayor, Council, and City of Edmonton for enabling folks that are in isolation to be seen and heard today. Over a year ago, our City Council declared a climate emergency. For decades now, climate action at all levels has been sidelined by other more present emergencies, such as COVID-19, which is so challenging, and such an opportunity to recognize what we need for longer-term resilience, what to restore, what to relinquish, what and who to reconcile with. It is integral to our future that everyone in Edmonton is focused on reducing sources of greenhouse gas emissions, on increasing sinks for greenhouse gas emissions and improving our society. I'm currently in the process of founding Drawdown Alberta as a result of my climate education work and look forward to continuing collaboration with council, city administration and the communities of this beautiful city that is my family's home. COVID has enabled and forced my life to become hyper-localized, and I'm excited to work with my neighborhood on how that life can look over the next decades. I lay awake again last night, trying to sit with and hold with kindness the anxiety and running lists of actions to take that naturally grip me at times due to the work that I do, while my toddler rests easily. Please let her grow up in a community that is mentally and physically supported to address what our future holds. The city plan, as far as I have been able to scroll through it in this overwhelmingly busy time, looks exciting. I ask you, how can I help bring it to life? What is our 2040? The film 2040 is central on my mind as I consider the city plan. We need to do everything in our power to get our carbon budget below our allotment of 135 megatons through 2050. Acknowledging that the global budget 
was spent by the late 1980s, and we are currently living on overdraft, trying to avoid bankruptcy of life on Earth as we know it. There is no play again button here. Prioritize preserving and recreating natural ecosystems. Support distributed energy generation on existing rooftops rather than planting more monocultures in existing ecosystems, which is how I think of solar farms. Encourage neighborhood urban farmers, a network of edible streets across the city, lowering the pressures on the key ecosystems surrounding our city, both from agriculture and from urban sprawl, and increasing our resilience. Converting my front yard to a permaculture garden has been a powerful community connector this summer. Support educational initiatives and make it financially and regulatorily feasible for interested folks to become their neighborhood's farmer in the city. Bring back goats through targeted neighborhood development that has the potential to replace the little plastic signs littered across the lawns, especially in our more affluent neighborhoods. Consult with neighborhoods about what kinds of edible trees they would take care of and plant those in our two million new trees. Oh, and make those bike lanes usable for families. 106th Street, for example, is a nightmare with a child in a chariot. The city's design of parking around bike lanes is pushing families who choose active transportation back onto the street into traffic. They're the root of the problem with those impacted co-leading. Welcome learning opportunities and meet all Edmontonians with kindness and care while refraining from the urge to treat symptoms. Lead on a green and just recovery, build back better, and let's move toward a 2040 vision for Edmonton that unites, empowers, and transforms. Thank you very much for all of your work. I'm excited to support it. Thank you very much. Questions? For Ms. Hoffman? Not seeing any, going once, going twice. Thank you so much for your presentation. Next is Joe Yurkovich from Edmonton Mountain Bike Alliance. He's on the phone, you might need to star six to unmute yourself. I'm sorry, uh, I thought I'd done that. Anyway, uh, good morning again, Mayor Addison and counselors, ladies and gentlemen. Um, unfortunately, my uh, audio, or sorry, video feed is uh, not seeming to stay on. So uh, if we could go straight to my PowerPoint, that would be great. Uh, and you can move promptly to slide two. <clears throat> um, today I'm here to talk to you as the president of the Edmonton Mountain Bike Alliance about mountain biking in our river valley and ravine system <clears throat> and the positive contribution that this network of narrow, uh, natural surface or single track trails makes to our quality of life. Uh, I realize this is a fairly niche issue, uh, impacting only a few segments of the city plan, so I'll try not to take up too much of your time today. Slide two illustrates just two examples of how mountain biking has been used and has Edmonton's profile. There are many other examples from national and international media of praise for the fantastic opportunity for hiking, trail running, and mountain biking in our river valley. If we could go to the next slide, slide three is a screenshot from TrailForks, which is a crowdsourced international database of trails that's used by a variety of outdoor enthusiasts. If you look closely, you'll see that there are 925 distinct trails identified in the Edmonton City region covering 532 kilometers by activity, and you look at, uh, if you look at the bottom of the slide, Edmonton ranks fifth globally for the number of urban trails for mountain bike riding and third for trail running. Next slide, please. Slide four shows check-ins per month by people who actually take the time to activate the Trail Forks app and take it along with them on their phones when they ride. 23% of these check-ins were by visitors. The last two charts, the pie graph for trail by type and the table distance by difficulty show over 310 kilometers of single track trails comprising 55.9% of the list of trails. So how does this relate to the city plan? Currently, none of these single track trail, single track natural trails are officially recognized by the city and included in your inventory of assets, even though this system of natural trails is by far more extensive than the city's official inventory of paved and granular multi-use pathways. Uh, when the plan talks about the preserve value in section 5.1 and on map 3, it defines the river valley and ravine system as, quote, 
the environmental protection area interspersed with wellness and celebra- celebration-oriented parks that encompass the North Saskatchewan River and its tributaries. So there's no reference to the natural surface trail system running throughout the river valley and ravines. Similarly, under the access value, section 4.2.3 addresses cycling, but only on the paved and multi-purpose granular pathway system, as is made evident by map 6 at page 120. Section on the green and blue network at pages 106 to 1010 says the network is used for cycling, walking, running, and rolling. That's great to read. But at page 108, there is again only reference to the coordinated network of pathways and no mention of the extensive system of natural trails. In our view, as your key strategic planning document, the city plan needs to clearly identify these natural trails as a city asset and make it a clear objective to bring them into the city's inventory as such with proper signage and equipment to play a greater role in the maintenance of this valuable asset, which today is left solely to our EMBA volunteers who have devoted thousands of hours to this task under our formal agreement with the city over the past 10 years. Now to slide five. Finally, a word on the ecological impact of mountain biking. The city plan emphasizes the need to preserve and protect the river, valley, and ravine system. I'll be back to speak to this point in greater detail if given the opportunity when you consider aspects of the ribbon and green plan, but this slide details the fact that all of the studies have shown that mountain biking has no greater impact on the environment than hiking and a lesser impact than equestrian and motorized activities. Next slide, please. Therefore, once you've given direction for the city plan to clearly identify and make accommodation for the extensive network of single track natural trails, that contributes so much to our quality of life here when it comes time to consider the uses for which the trail system will be available in the future. I hope to be guided by the science and not political consideration. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for your volunteer leadership here on, uh, of the group and your um, comments here today, Mr. Yurkovich. Questions for Joe? Councillor Henderson? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I understanding this has been a long-standing um, question um, that there is a tension here uh, between um, uh, the the desire to keep our natural areas as pristine as possible um, and the informal trails, some of which have turned into something fairly permanent um, that uh, that that are not you know, and th- and that's I think why they're not part of the city inventory. So. I mean, I, I, com- I completely understand what you're, what you're asking for here, and I think, um, you know, maybe there's a middle ground on this, but I know there have been huge frustrations in the past um, with trails that spring up all over the place that have, that have you know, because they disturb uh, the natural areas, um, have impact, um, and our ability to, to deal with what I think is, you know, a well-used facility within the city. So I'm just curious to know how you would suggest we address that, um, because I think that's where the conflict will come from in this document between uh, trails that are not planned or just created um, informally um, and, and the desire to preserve areas as natural areas. Yeah, and this is something that we meet with our, our city reps um, on basically a monthly basis, and it's something that we talk about a lot. And and um, uh, I guess that there's two things. Number one, uh, to the extent that we can make it easier for these trail builders to to participate through the city process that by reducing you know wait times and bureaucracy related to this, uh, the more we'll be able to convince them that that they should invest that time to to do things properly. Um, and secondly, I think that, that if we can uh, formalize the trail system and have that signage, uh, it, you know, it, it might help to reduce the, uh, the, the, the instances of this, of this informal trail building. Because we understand that that is, uh, you know, one of the key tensions, and, and it's obviously something that EMBA does not promote. Right. So, because I mean, I, you know, and I'm not sure where we currently stand in terms of what we're doing. You know, I'm, you know, there's some that have been there for a long time and there are others that continually to pop up in areas that are, that are being put aside uh, for protection. And I, I, how we grapple with that, I think, and I don't know at, at that level of granularity whether or not we could put something in the plan, but that I'm guessing is part of, of the conflict here. 
Yeah, it, it definitely is. It, uh, you know, and and the uh, the ribbon of green plan definitely does talk about ecological areas, and and uh, you know, I, I think uh, we have a number of those in the city now. Uh, White Mud Creek has, has a number of preservation areas in it. Uh, that's something that that our group supports. Um, and obviously, you know, as I say, I think if we can get a an established um, trail system that the city takes some some uh, uh, interest in in uh, maintaining and and monitoring, um, then maybe we can we can start to reduce, uh, you know, the impact of of these road trails. So then, really, what you're asking for is us to formalize a third a third type of trail within the system and to recognize it, which currently we don't do. Correct. That's right. It's, it's, it's outside the city's, uh, inventory of assets. And, you know, part of that is, is, uh, for risk management, right? But, uh, you know, when I talk about signage and, and signage, uh, the province has a document that talks about, um, you know, risk mitigation for, for landowners and, and signage is a key part of that. Uh, it's interesting that you raise that because that does, it, it it does a, a part of this may be that the moment the city takes responsibility for these, it's one thing. I mean, it's like Toboggan Hills. As soon as we declare something in Toboggan Hill and do anything on it, um, you know, it and the result is we end up having to close Toboggan Hills. Um, so sometimes it's better for us to leave well enough alone. And that's there. I mean, I, I guess you're thinking on there may be unintended consequences to us taking declaring these and giving them some official status because you may you may you may find that there's a level of restriction that comes with that any thoughts well that that's the case and and that is kind of the case at present um you know the the, the city um when they become aware of it will take down structures that people will put up in in uh, the river valley from time to time and We've participated in that. When people have been injured by uh, by an unsafe structure, we've brought that to the city's attention. So, so I understand that that when you formalize the system, um, you know there may be greater restrictions. Um, on, on the other hand, one of the issues and, and the reason I first became involved with this organization uh, has been that for a long time, um, where there was a natural trail. When the city wanted to develop a granular or multi-purpose trail, they thought that the best place to put it was over top of that natural trail because they didn't see the value of that as a as a distinct resource for a different user group. So I think that's starting to change. That that started to change uh, in Torger Park uh, to the connection to the Hende. But um, by formalizing this trail system as as a city asset, I think we can ensure that that, that won't happen again. So that's one of the reasons that, that we think it's perhaps important to bring this in. And again, you know, to have the city participate in maintenance is, is, another, uh, is another aspect of that. Great. Thanks. I'm out of time. Thank you. Uh, so we are right at noon. I'll just double check. We've got Councillor McKean next with questions. Uh, is there anybody else with questions of Mr. Yurkovich? Because if there's just one, I'm wondering if we could take five minutes. Mayor, Councillor McKean? Uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, ben basically covered my questions, so I'm good. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Then uh, that's easy. Thank you so much, uh, Joe. Uh, it's nice to hear from you. Uh, and uh, we will recess now until um, one thirty. And, oh, I should say, Thanks for those much. of you who are following along, that uh, we are... Despite our best efforts, we misjudged the timing for the panels a bit. We're communicating with those registered for panel two to advise them that their start time will now be 3.45 rather than 1.30. We've still got lots of folks to hear from on the first panel. 
Uh, so the clerks have notified me that we are running behind and uh, uh, folks have been contacted. For those in the first time block, please rejoin this Google Meet at 1.30 p.m. to continue. For anyone online registered to speak in the second panel, please note that the second time block, again, will start at 3.45 instead of 1.30. Office of City Clerk will continue to provide updates as needed. Please, again, contact city.clerk at edmonton.ca with any questions you may have. So thank you all, and we'll see you at 1.30.
Okay, uh, we'll roll call in just a moment here. So bring yourselves back online. Um, Okay, let's do a roll call in, how about reverse order this time, just to mix it up. Councillor Walters? I'm, uh, I've returned, <laughs> gleefully. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Paquette? Present. Thank you. Councillor Nichol? Present. Welcome back. Councillor McKean? I am here. Hello. Councillor Knack? Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you as well. Councillor Henderson? I am here. Wonderful. Councillor Hamilton. Present. Thank you. Councillor Essinger. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Zadek. I am here. Welcome. Councillor Katerina. Yes. Welcome. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. And Councillor Banga. Happy to be here. Super duper. Moi aussi. Okay. So we'll continue with uh, the uh, speakers. Uh, in favor, next up is number seven, Paul Lanny from the CHBA. Paul, are you there? I am. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Trying to figure out if it's better to be the first guy after the break or the last guy before, but uh, in any event. Um, good afternoon, Mayor and members of Council. My name is Paul Lanny, and I'm here today on behalf of the Canadian Home Builders Association Edmonton Region. We are a not-for-profit organization representing more than 430 member companies in the region. And for over 65 years, CHBA ER has taken a principled long-term approach to building sustainable and healthy places to call home. I'm the treasurer of the association. I'm also president of uh, Aberton Group of Companies. So through CHBA, I've had the opportunity to work with Kaylin Anderson and the city plan team to provide feedback to ensure that the residential construction industry's voice was heard throughout this process. Uh, and we've appreciated that. It is no question that the city plan is a massive undertaking and the city has shown a willingness to work alongside us and numerous other stakeholders. We have embraced this and continue to be available to help the city in all areas where our expertise can make a difference. The city plan outlines growth to 2 million people within the existing boundaries with 50% of new units added through infill. The association supports these growth priorities and wishes to assist the city in achieving them. With that being said, these goals must be met with the intention, or sorry, with intention from city council. The city plan highlights increased residential intensification, especially around modes and transportation corridors. Projects that satisfy the planned growth priorities must be met with support at every level. We have, been seen, we have seen many potential developments in the core and mature areas denied at public hearing, despite them meeting all of the city's densification goals and other goals. Businesses operate based on certainty, and there has to be a level of certainty for industry to continue investing in these areas. In order to achieve 50% intensification targets, city councillors must each recognize the city plan as the guiding force in their decision making above individual preferences in favor of direction and support for the bold changes that are required to make these shifts. There must also be serious consideration for the in inadequate level of existing water and power infrastructure in core and mature areas, many of which fall within the planned growth nodes. The intensification goals within the city plan will be impossible to achieve without planned infrastructure funding going forward. Current costs of upgrading water and infrastructure for large scale infill projects are simply too high and are one of the many barriers to, barriers to building affordable infill projects in Edmonton. This disconnect cannot be understated. As a result of these realities, many projects that might satisfy the city's missing middle needs are simply not viable. A more holistic approach to neighborhood revitalization is needed in order to align with the strategic growth priorities in the city plan. Clear timelines for infrastructure funding must be established and must align with the nodes and corridors that have been identified for intensification and growth. Our members built more than 75% of new units across the city, including 35% of new units in mature and established neighborhoods in 2019. If we wish to reach the 50% intensification target, we must see regulatory changes that lead to greater investment by more of our members in core areas of the city. 
Without greater certainty in the planning and regulatory framework, development of the mature and established neighborhoods will continue to be fraught with risk and uncertainty. The city has taken some great strides in this area through the missing middle zoning amendments, the zoning bylaw renewal, open option parking, to name a few. We look forward to seeing how the city plan will further impact the zoning bylaw renewal and what implementation will look like. CHBAER supports the bold and innovative thinking by the city plan team and is excited to help the city achieve the strategic goals outlined in this plan, including climate resilience. While CHBAER supports reductions in GHG emissions in order to help reduce climate change, it is imperative that climate resiliency targets set by the city plan can be realistically achieved and do not generate inadvertent impacts to housing affordability and choice. Setting prescriptive targets at the level of the MDP will ultimately create unrealistic goals for subsequent plans and policies in the planning hierarchy to achieve, including Edmonton's energy transition strategy and the new zoning bylaw. We are eager to continue to work with, in partnership with the City of Edmonton and the development of an, attaining, of an attainable emissions neutral strategy with a view towards maintaining Edmonton's competitive advantage within the region. The City Plan presents a great opportunity for the City and industry to come together to achieve common goals and build a city that is livable and affordable for all Edmontonians. Our members have the ability and expertise to do so and look forward to continuing to work with the city to create positive. Uh, we are excited for what the future holds. Let's build a great city together. In closing, we'd like to take the time to thank Kaylin and the team for their effort to keep CHBR meaningfully involved throughout this project. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, questions for Mr. Lanny? Going once, going twice. I don't see any questions for you, Mr. Lanny. Thanks so much. Um, Thank you. Next then will be uh, Mariah Samji from Infill Edmonton. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Today is a milestone in the pathway Edmonton has been working on for years to build a more compact options with, option, with, with options for everyone. I have had the pleasure of telling the IDEA community for the past two years about the focus in this plan from integrating transportation, supporting businesses, being financially conscious and creating housing options within Edmonton's current boundaries. IDEA has been a key stakeholder throughout the process and we would like to thank the city plan team for their work. IDEA strongly supports the city plan's vision to accommodate 2 million people within our current boundaries. This is an ambitious goal and we believe it is achievable with focus, consistent data management and dedicated resources. I would like to go through the following steps that we believe are key to implementing this plan. First, we need an infrastructure funding plan. The city plan calls for continued infill growth and intensification along roads and corridors. These goals will not be achieved without resources dedicating to improving the infrastructure in these critical areas. Infrastructure deficiency is currently the top barrier for facing for medium scale residential and commercial infill. And until these issues are holistically addressed, we will continue to hamper the growth in these key areas and city plan will simply remain words on paper. We request immediate action addressing the infill infrastructure deficiency by one, reviewing and updating volume four of Edmonton's engineering and design construction standards, and two, creating a predictable fee structure for contributing to a system of upgrades as a whole, rather than piecemealing and one-off fees where info residents and small businesses are wholly responsible for upgrading deficient infrastructure within existing neighborhoods. The second, we need to retire contradictory plans and policies. Many of our planning policies are outdated and contradict our current city goals and objectives for infill. These policies have helped us achieve 25% infill. However, the contradictions will only become more extreme under the new city plan unless action is taken. We will need to have new plans and policies that align with the city plan and have measurable targets that we can work towards on an annual basis. This is something historically that hasn't been consistently a part of our practices, and we see the need for this change. Third, we need a financial impact study. The city plan's growth scenario 
relative financial assessment shows that the city plan land use concept is anticipated to result in growth related city services with a capital cost savings of about 10% or $30 billion as compared to business as usual. These cost savings are only relative to such items as roads, transit, park, police, and waste management, and do not include cost savings on linear infrastructure, such as utilities, pipes, and hydrants. However, without a financial impact assessment that includes critical information, council cannot truly make informed decisions about maintenance and operating costs that they will inherit. We request that future studies include all information and relevant to financial equation in order to confidently create growth plans and direct infrastructure investments to priority areas. Lastly, we need clear intentions. The city plan is clear about its intention to grow to 2 million people within our current boundaries. We have the space, underutilized lots, surface parking to accomplish this. However, with setting the target at 50%, it sends a message that we have the will, resources, and ability to continue to grow outward in a manner as business as usual, while at the same time successfully growing inward. This is not true. Now more than ever, due to COVID-19 and oil prices, we need to focus our resources and priorities and make decisions accordingly. We request that the target to reinvest in our city be set at 55% infill. As we know, infill is difficult to do, but with clear direction and resources, we can achieve this. Reaching our infill targets will provide more diverse housing options, reduce capital costs, protect the environment, and create a more efficient transit system. IDEA was a key stakeholder throughout the planning process, and we are excited to see the city grow into the outline plan. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. MG. Uh, questions from, first from Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Ms. Samji. Sorry, I'm just flipping through my pages here while I'm doing that. Um, the main question I want to ask you, during the morning session, we heard a lot of ch uh, discussion around housing choices and making sure we have options available. And I, and I wouldn't mind hearing your perspective because uh, as somebody that's had the chance to represent a, a ward that has both new developing communities and mature communities, I often hear feedback from folks saying that there really hasn't been a lot of choice, that, that primarily our choices have existed outside the Hende and we haven't really done a lot to provide choices inside. So I wouldn't mind your perspective on that um, conversation around choice, particularly with regards to IDEA's perspective on it. Of course, well, your constituents are completely uh, correct. We don't have enough housing options and choices within our mature and core areas. Uh, that are up to the standards of today's market needs. And to be able to achieve that, we need to start looking at how do we plan for our infrastructure costs. We think that we need to share them as a city um, in a more, in a way that we can actually plan and be consistent so that the industry can go out and find the funding for it. Thank you. So I know this has been an ongoing conversation. There has been the uh, sort of pilot that's been happening that I think got uh, used up quite quickly and that's I believe ideas requested more. Uh, I want to just get a, a sense of what what your conversations have been like over the last couple of months. I mean part of I think where, where we're going to be leading up to is the next capital budget cycle. So the 2023 to 2026 is where we'll be able to make the, the largest change particularly now because we're in a constrained environment. But do you have any updates on what you've been hearing, uh, any progress that's been made on, on how that might look in the coming years? Yeah, well, it's been really exciting for the cost share program. I know about two and a half years ago when we started the conversation at committee, uh, we didn't have the data around how many projects didn't get funded or what the capacity would need to be and what kind of things were coming to market. Um, and you'll hear in December uh, that about 10 projects got funded through the cost share program. So 10 projects in two years got to move forward. But that was under half of what actually wanted to move forward with, the, with their projects. And not only that, it didn't include any commercial projects. It was only limited to residential and mixed use projects. And so there is a demand on all three sides. And we need to be able to move that conversation forward in a predictable way where the, the industry is sharing the costs uh, and we want to bear the costs of making sure that 
that our residents that we're bringing in are paying their way, but we also know that a lot of the neighborhoods within Edmonton are currently deficient. So we see the uh, that pathway to move forward. Thank you. So uh, just the last question, and, and because you raised it and, and you sent it in the letter saying, you know, let's set the goal at 55% instead of 50. And, and I guess just the question, that, and I can see your point, but I maybe want to explore a bit further because the, the, uh, the counter to that is going to be, well, what what difference does it really make? We're talking about 5%. This, this is already a pretty substantial change from the old municipal development plan, which was to encourage 25% infill, and I purposely use air quotes when I have that because encourage doesn't m mean a ton uh, if you're not backing it up with action. But I wouldn't mind just you to elaborate a little further as to how you feel that that makes a substantial change in intention in terms of in the direction that we would be heading. Yeah, um, for us, throughout the city plan process. Uh, when we first saw it be set at 50%, we were really excited, but more and more as um, oil prices have not stabilized and uh, as we've had to rely on different levels of government to help uh, cities succeed, we see that we have a very limited budget uh, to move forward as a city. And so bringing that number up to 55%, even though it is small and would and isn't a drastic change, it does set the intention moving forward that that is where our resources are going. We're going to make our neighborhoods that already have wonderful schools and businesses and parks that are amazing, but are underutilized, and we're gonna put the infrastructure that needs to go into there so that we can rebuild the neighborhoods to, to the potential that they can be. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. That's all for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Next is Councillor Walters. So, so thanks, Mr. Samji. And, and so just following up on that, I, I just want to confirm that your line of thinking is that if the argument holds that there is, it's more cost effective for a municipality to uh, shift its urban form uh, to a more compact type uh, using existing infrastructure, why would we settle at 50? Why not stretch ourselves a little bit more uh, in terms of a goal? Just, is that just so I'm clear about your your argument. Exactly, that is uh, what our membership is, is saying. The, the financial reports that were uh, gone underway show that there is significant savings to our city and there is a, we can't continue to grow it as usual and we need to make those changes. And with limited funding and resources, we need to be able to also set those intentions for our future council and for our future communities and future residents of Edmonton saying, this is where we're going. But even if, just to play devil's advocate on that for fun, uh, for a second, if our, uh, if we're staying, you know, holding to the spirit of the plan, staying within the existing boundary, uh, on the timeline that's charted, uh, knowing that the regional plan, so this, this feared race to the bottom around regional competitiveness that's been raised a couple times is kind of dealt with by this regional growth plan, which creates a floor for new greenfield development. Uh, and we see up to 50 and close to 60 units per hectare in some of these neighborhoods. Does it necessarily matter if it's 50 or 55 at this point? Because we're seeing lots of innovation in the suburban context as well. For sure, there is a lot of innovation there, but the, the ability to go from 50 to 55 really sets the intention, not just that the uh, administration level or at the industry level where we all have that conversation, but also at different levels of government, at future uh, future councillors and for our community to help them understand why we need to grow in a more compact manner that allows us to provide options and allows us to better utilize the resources that we have within our communities instead of continuously shutting down schools and trying to stretch our transit system. Yeah, it is, it is a notable irony that in Edmonton we decry the closing of mature neighborhood schools and are on our hands and knees begging for the, the suburban schools to be built. Uh, interesting. Uh, last question, though, is uh, the, what's your interpretation of pieces inside the infill roadmap uh, 2.0 where it talked about retiring future plans to avoid contradiction and where it talked about creating an infrastructure and investment a strategy like what's I'm going to ask admin those questions but I wonder what what your interpretation do you anticipate those do you see 
uh, work being done on those? Uh, w what's your worry or concern about that? Because mine is that I think they're, they're being, like they're on, there's plans to do those things. So are you concerned that they're not going to happen? We're concerned that they're not going to happen in a timely manner. Okay. We have ARPs, uh, the TOD guidelines, the residential infill guidelines that are still not aligned with our current targets without uh, this wonderful plan that's put in front of us today. And unless we start to move away from those and start to work towards our district plans and retire these old policies, we're not going to be able to meet our goals. And um, we need to also look at how much does our infrastructure cost? There was conversations earlier today around a uh, $30 billion deficit. And unless we start to look at a holistic approach around what is our current deficit, we need to revisit that, that number and also how we share those costs to, to get there because there is strategies that we can all come together to right. push those targets. Um, but without well, we'll, funding and without policy changes, we're not gonna achieve those. We'll seek those clarifications. I think our total book value on all of our infrastructure is around 20 billion citywide. So I'm not sure that it would cost us 30 billion to replace it in the core, but we'll, we'll get clarification on that stuff. Um, so thanks for uh, taking the time. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Samji? Well, thanks for your organization's participation throughout the process uh, um, and including your time here today. Um, next then will be uh, Stephen Reitz. Stephen, are you there? Hi, sorry, I just need one moment to get set up so I'll unmute in about a minute and be ready to go. And please move as quickly as possible and, and I'll just a note then to the other speakers if you can um, uh, refer to the order and be ready to go uh, when, when the previous speaker is presenting, just in case there are no questions, we can come straight to you. So... We'll stall for another moment. Thank Mr. you for Rates. stalling. I'm ready to go. Fantastic. Okay. Proceed. So, uh, good afternoon to your worship and members of council. Uh, thank you for providing the opportunity to speak today. My name is Stephen Rates, and I'm here to voice my support for the city plan. I'm a recent graduate from the University of Alberta planning program and was privileged to help lead the Urban and Regional Planning Subcommittee for the City of Edmonton Youth Council in 2018 to 2019 and so for this committee we work to bring youth tables or youth voices to the table uh, during early phases of the city plan engagement and ensure that the projects that we were working on over that year highlighted the opportunity for and connected young people with the city plan engagement so today i'm here to discuss the perspectives that i saw that have been drawn from this youth engagement and are now within the plan and i'm also here because i'm really freaking excited about this plan I truly believe that the plan that is being presented today reflects the aspirations of many young people who participated in this engagement. But beyond that, I think it presents a plan for a city that will work for young people now and in the future. When reflecting on this plan, I think of my friends who I have lived, worked and learned alongside over the past six years I have spent in Edmonton. Many have moved elsewhere now after finishing their degrees or left to go to school elsewhere too. And although they may have moved to places with pricier housing markets, they also have functional access to much more affordable transportation, like transit, biking, or walking in those cities. They also have diverse housing options that present affordable, affordable choices. I think the city plan uh, plans for a city that would work for young people, uh, attracting and retaining them on these two fronts with regards to affordability because it plans for a city where housing can remain affordable and become more diversified through projecting an evolution with where net residential unit growth occurs over the coming years that can track changing housing preferences. And then it also plans for a city where transportation costs can become relatively more affordable than present conditions because a vehicle would not have to be a prerequisite, a prerequisite for personal mobility since more affordable options are available and practical. I think the other important piece in terms of affordability is that we all want to live in a city that we can afford to take care of in the long term. I know that young people who engage with this plan, myself included, want to build a city that can operate and maintain, maintain itself sustainably. We will be the ones paying for it in the future. 
At present, we don't necessarily have the best example of a city that is affordable to maintain and operate for in the long term. Low density, sprawling single use neighborhoods and disparate residential, commercial and employment areas are expensive to utilize, utilize, maintain and provide services to. But a better version of a city that is affordable to maintain and operate in the long term is attainable through adopting the city plan. By progressively placing more focus on infill development and changing the extent of greenfield expansion, the plan facilitates the development of a city that my peers and I will find affordable in the long term to maintain and operate. I can see where people's concerns are coming from when they say that adopting policies to direct uh, growth could have repercussions. But I believe that there is a larger threat and a threat that is glaringly apparent now during a time where municipal operational budgets are being strained due to the challenges of COVID-19. And this is a possible future where if we don't adopt these policies to direct growth. This future, one where we don't set strong aspirations for a growth set out in the city plan, is one where we will continue to see the increasing cost of maintaining and operating an ever-expanding city. It's also a city where we cannot achieve our energy transition and climate change goals. And so these reasons of focusing on ensuring we have an affordable city to maintain and operate and one that is achieving climate goals is why it's so vital to be adopting the city plan in this moment. I'd like to thank the city plan team for the engagement they completed throughout this process. And I strongly encourage the city uh, the council to approve the city plan as it will build a city that young people can afford to live in, move through, and that we can afford to maintain and operate in the long term. Thank you for your time. Councilor Knack has questions for you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Banga, and thank you, Mr. Rates. Uh, just a few questions uh, related to that engagement that occurred. So, I don't. You spoke quite highly of the plan. That's obviously quite encouraging. Is there anything in that time? And I don't know if you're officially speaking on behalf of Youth Council. I guess technically the term's over, but but uh, you were there through that process, and I'm curious if there were any concerns from people who, throughout that participation process, things that they felt were missing, or, or generally speaking, are you, or do you think that what is in this plan has primarily addressed most of what the youth were raising throughout that engagement? So thanks for the opportunity to clarify. I'm just here speaking on my, pers uh, my experience with uh, working with that committee in the past and uh, what I saw occur and to reflect on the second portion of the question about uh, what was raised or what we were contemplating, I think there was a strong uh, interest in seeing more options, especially with regards to transportation, um, especially from a youth perspective where uh, access to the city is quite limited by the fact that many youth aren't able to drive. Um, or don't, uh, or have to rely on other means of getting around. Um, there was a strong interest in seeing uh, other modes of transportation uh, facilitate similar access to the city that we see with uh, people being able to get around in personal automobiles. And then also, I think, in that longer term perspective of the city, people wanted to see, or kids, youth wanted to see um, housing options to be available uh, because they saw themselves fitting into many different places in the city. And um, although we kind of frame ourselves in this long-term trajectory of uh, many people ending up in uh, greenfield developments or areas around the edge of the city, people wanted the option to choose wherever within the city uh, from the core to the suburbs. Um, and they wanted housing options peppered throughout that. So they just, they wanted possibilities in many fronts. And I think uh, I see that reflected within the plan. Right. And maybe just on that point, and, and my understanding from from seeing some of those conversations and actions is that it was it was fairly consistent views, no matter where the youth were living, because the youth that you were engaging were not just people that live in the core, either the downtown or sort of the south side core. And in fact, I think a lot of the youth that, that were engaged with that process might already live in some of those developing communities or or just on the edges, maybe on either side of the Hende, and, and yet still what they were looking for is a mix. Not to say we should never have a choice outside uh, and that we should only have choices inside, but it should be spread throughout and, and more 
Uh, and the, to your point around transportation options, making sure that if they've chosen an option that's not in the core, that they can still move like they would if they were living in the core. Is that, it, was that maybe a fair, that's what I feel like I saw during some of those conversations. Is that reasonable? Yes, I think that's a fair evaluation. And uh, another piece that I think helps buttress that perspective is that the engagement that was undertaken for many parts of the plan, it occurred all over the city. Um, and we were we found it really easy, especially within the committee, to connect committee members with engagement that was going on in Terwilliger or out near Clareview or um, in the meadows. There was many options for engagement. So we saw people get connected all over. Great. That's, uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Rates? Seeing none, then uh, next up will be Dr. Lee from Housing for Health. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm Dr. Karen Lee. Can people hear me? Yes, yes? that's okay. much better. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, that's great. I, I decided to call in uh, as well as have this video. Um, so I wanted to thank uh, Mayor Iveson and City Council for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'm Dr. Karen Lee. I'm an associate professor with the Division of Preventive Medicine, which is in the Department of Medicine at University of Alberta, uh, also director of the Housing for Health Initiative that's funded federally and is uh, working to improve uh, housing development in the surrounding neighborhoods for health and well-being. I'm happy to report that one of our pilot projects is an infill project in the Hazel Dean neighborhood of Edmonton. Um, also, um, the author of a book called Six Cities uh, that's just come out this year and documents the uh, different uh, innovations around the world uh, in global cities uh, around making cities healthier. Um, I wanted to commend uh, Kaylin Anderson and um, Hawaii Charity, you know, the team of city staff that have done tremendous work in bringing this plan to the state it's in today. I'm um, very happy to see that healthy city is a key strategic goal out of four strategic goals. So that's uh, fantastic. Um, I wanted to speak today about, you know, the things that could be done to make the healthy city goal even more robust with the current plan. Uh, in particular, uh, connecting, I think, um, some of the, uh, for example, the stretch targets that are currently linked to the five big city moves. Uh, I think more can be done to explicitly identify the uh, how these targets will help us to achieve the four strategic goals, including the Healthy City Goal. Uh, I think some of those links can be made more explicit and uh, could be strengthened. Um, another is, uh, and related to this, is the uh, need for including health-related indicators uh, for measurement and for reporting to the public on a regular basis, along with the other indicators that have been identified. Now, I recognize that this could be a bigger process, and so one of the things that could be done is, uh, you know, an indication that the four strategic goals also need to have indicators and that processes will be put in place along with the adoption of the plan uh, that would actually allow us to create a comprehensive set of these indicators. Um, so indicators related to active transportation, active recreation, access to healthy foods and beverages, social connections, and decreasing social isolation, and even making our buildings more active and healthier. Those are things that can be done. I've been involved in that process when I was working for Mayor Bloomberg's administration in the city of New York, where indicators uh, from health to environment to various strategic goals were created in a comprehensive process. And then they were actually legislated for public reporting every four years to ensure that, you know, beyond any administration, uh, the, uh, these indicators and the um, progress towards the strategic goals will always continue. Um, another example I wanted to highlight for more explicitness um, is um, identifying health-specific factors and more general concepts. So, for example, in the idea of land use mix, it's prefacing some of these concepts with the word healthy or health-focused. Um, so here's an example. An unhealthy land use mix might be one where you have, you know, lots of alcohol outlets, places that sell tobacco, uh, places that sell unhealthy fast food, lots of uh, unnecessary and excessive uh, uh, um, surface parking, as some examples where you contrast that to a healthy land use mix 
That would include things like having schools nearby, um, parks and play areas, recreational facilities, um, uh, active transportation options and transit options, uh, healthy food access like grocery stores and farmers markets. So you can see that the difference between general uh, mixed land use and healthy mixed land use can be quite different. And so if we're serious about achieving that healthy city's goal, then I think there's additional language and explicitness that can go in around health and healthy uh, into the plan. Um, uh, another component that I wanted to raise is just you know, the option and the need to ensure that our vulnerable populations, like our aging populations and our um, populations that may need more housing affordability, uh, have opportunities, uh, that, that their opportunities and their need for health opportunities are addressed. So, you know, opportunities for active living, for healthy eating, for social connections as, as some key opportunities. And, you know, I think in this age of COVID, it's particularly salient because we know that um, chronic diseases like diabetes, obesity, if these are controlled, then our populations become at, at risk for severe COVID infection. Um, I think the wonderful thing about many of these initiatives, too, and many of these strategies that actually can promote health, like walkability, uh, are actually strategies that can concurrently and synergistically help us also to achieve our environmental goals, uh, to uh, help us aging in place, uh, to actually address costs, that healthcare costs that are increasingly at the provincial level, eating into other areas uh, of the budget uh, provincially, like infrastructure and transportation. And so um, I think with that, I wanted to thank everyone for the opportunity. Uh, and to say also, as others have, that the policies that follow our uh, adoption of the plan need to be integrated and aligned with achieving the different goals of the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Questions from Councillor McKean. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. Good to see you again. Thanks for your submission today. Very compelling. Um, uh, and I've read quickly through the written submission. Was it, did, have, did you have an opportunity to engage with the planners of this document earlier, or is this really your first submission on the plan? Uh, we have been um, invited by Kaylin and uh, the planners at the city to be involved in the process. Uh, I know two years ago I met with Kaylin and her team and uh, you know, I think uh, I'm very pleased to see the healthy city as, as a key strategic goal that's come out of that. So we've had opportunity to be involved in the different um, advisory processes along the way. Um, and uh, this represents, I think, our input to the latest uh, version of the plan that we managed to, uh, to uh, review. And if I could summarize, and please tell me if I'm wrong, you would like to see a little bit more explicit language around some of these factors you talk about? Yes, I think that there's an opportunity to add adjectives like healthy and some health-focused factors uh, directly into the current plan that will tie it more directly to the healthy city goal and will strengthen our ability to achieve that healthy city goal. Are we able now to measure um, from the, um, the health side, from our health agencies, are we able to um, get good indications that proper urban design or uh, new styles of urban design clearly impact health? Are we able to see that now? Yes, there are more and more studies. And in fact, you know, in the U.S., they've got a Department of Health and Human Services that has convened these, uh, this task force called the Task Force on Community Preventive Services. And what they do is they regularly re review the science and the scientific studies that are out there. And their conclusion is that there's now sufficient and strong evidence that how we build communities for things like walkability, bikeability, transit access, actually have tremendous impacts on people's ability to be active and whether they have access to healthy foods will impact whether they can uh, eat more healthily Right. Um, and, you know, many of these studies actually show us that when we improve uh, communities for things like walkability, we often actually also improve 
safety of that community because there are more eyes on the street from more people being in the in the community. Uh, there's a decrease in social isolation and more community connectedness. Uh, and often it actually also helps retail sales and decreases retail vacancies because when people are close by, they're often meandering. And then you get a lot of incidental buying uh, right. that uh, doesn't result if you have to drive somewhere uh, to get to get your uh, your uh, services and shopping done. If I if I have time, I want to ask you about social isolation. But right now, one of the questions I think we all have is the plan talks about building a more compact city, and that's certainly been uh, the momentum in Edmonton is to reduce uh, or slow growth on the edges and become a more compact city for financial efficiency, for one thing at least. Yeah. Um, but now we have COVID. And, and there's this perception of perhaps fear that, you know, that people will say, I don't want to live in a, an apartment building now because I'll have to interact with people who could be carriers. So what do you, th uh, please give us your thoughts as a health expert on, mm -hmm. on those impacts and the way we should plan a city. Mm -hmm. I think that there's uh, there's many considerations, as, as and you know, many folks today have spoken about choice. I think you know, uh, people were speaking about the choice of neighborhoods, but I think choices of what's available within different neighborhoods is also really important. So you know, uh, as people age, they, uh, they may need within um, their own neighborhoods uh, housing options like increased density to housing options. You know, I think the whole issue about COVID has been how do we actually allow people to physically distance but not become socially isolated? And I think some of the measures that the city has done so far, opening up some of our streets and allowing people to spill onto them uh, in addition to cars, uh, has been a really important measure that allows for both physical distancing as well as preventing of social isolation and continued uh, physical activity and active living that would help people to maintain their health. Um, so I think it is, as you said, a fine balance, but that balance of these other elements of active living, being able to access healthy food, not becoming socially isolated, are really key elements of health and wellness that if we didn't have them on a regular basis and weren't able to achieve these things on a regular basis because we only live in a completely car-oriented community, then uh, our health would actually suffer and we would become more susceptible to severe infection from COVID. Um, so I don't know if that fully answers your question, but I think, uh, you know, that there are considerations of infrastructure as well that now come into play. So when we talk about walking paths for people, you know, it may no longer be that one and a half foot, two foot, three foot path. Maybe we have to consider additional width uh, to to achieve the physical distancing while uh, uh, ensuring community connectedness. Um, you know, how we how and how far we place our benches uh, so that people can socially interact but do so safely in a physically distanced way. Um, so there are additional layers of design considerations. I think that come along that come in with COVID. You know, our traditional, like, the reliance in our buildings on elevators as opposed to having, like, prominent stairwells that are open and safe. Those should be reconsiderations, too, because, you know, the act of living as well as, um, as well as uh, considerations for physical distancing and safety. I'm going to stop you there, Dr. Lee. I'm out of time, but thank you very much for your answer. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Councillor McKee. Uh, Councillor Walters. Oh, Councillor McKean asked pretty much everything I was going to, so thanks. That's okay. Thank you. Um, I want to ask about active city guidelines, but but uh, I'll, I'll I'll spare you, Dr. Lee. Um, uh, thank you for being part of the um, uh, the presentation here today and and your commitment around the healthy city goal, particularly, and for coming back to Edmonton to work on it after your time. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so, but I see no further questions for you at this time. So I will um, uh, go next to Jeff Bizantz from the Edmonton Council for Early Learning and Care. Okay, could you hear me? Good. Proceed. Um, so I'm here for the Edmonton Council for Early Learning and Care. 
Um, uh, thank you for very much for the opportunity to comment on the city plan. And I'll talk about the city plan and the future of early learning care for young children and their families. But first, as a long-term resident, I'd like to comment generally on the proposed city plan. Um, I'm really pleased about the integration of transportation, housing, land use, environment, and especially including um, people support components like equity, poverty, reconciliation, accessibility of services, amenities, and so on. So I wanna really thank the planning team and council. Um, back to the city plan, um, the Edmonton Council for Early Learning Care is an offspring of End Poverty Edmonton, which has been well supported by city council. council uh, councilors uh, Henderson and Paquette are currently on the uh, End Poverty Edmonton steering committee, the stewardship round table. Councilor Essinger has been very important in pushing uh, for the agenda about early learning and care. End Poverty Edmonton identified early learning care as a game changer, and um, it created the Edmonton Council for Early Learning and Care to work toward a system of early learning and care that's affordable and high in quality. So that's our goal. I have to say that the state of early learning and care in Edmonton is not good. Um, it's highly fragmented, it's expensive, and many areas are underserved. And we're not talking about small potatoes here. If you look at the pre-COVID numbers, we have 372 child cares in the city, 358 out of school cares, 118 uh, preschools plus family day homes. Altogether, there are license spaces for well over 35,000, uh, for over 35,000 of our children. So it's a lot, and on top of that, there are a large number of people who work in the, in the, in child care, mostly women. Um, who devote their, who be, this is their career. Um, still, there are pervasive problems in finding and maintaining spaces and ensuring high levels of quality. The market-based approach that we've always used has not generally worked well for many young children and their families, or for vulnerable families all over the city, or for parents, and especially women who want and need to, to participate in the workforce. So when it comes to planning, people who are interested in early learning care always have one question. What needs to be done to get early learning and care on the planning agendas for new and redeveloping neighborhoods? It always seems to us that planning for the population of preschool children should be as important as planning for the population of school age children, but generally we don't do it. So how do we get childcare on the agenda early in the development process as opposed to trying to patch something together again and again and again as time goes on. Um, part of the answer to the question is, to, is for child care to be in the city plan. And we're really pleased to see support for affordable, accessible child care built in. There's one key direction about ensuring vibrant, inclusive communities. And under that is a specific direction having to do with enabling convenient childcare facilities in various locations throughout the city. That's really good news. That addresses the accessibility priority. There's another directive about equitable access to affordable services amenities, and that, that's important for the affordability aspect. Um, there's also another directive about supporting uh, the elimination of poverty and its root causes. And as I've said, and Poverty Edmonton has already addressed, already identified childcare as one of the root causes of poverty and particularly perpetuating per, uh, poverty across generations. So with these directions in the city plan, the next issue is how do we work with the city to get early learning and care into the process of planning for strong communities? I understand some zoning bylaws will be coming up in the next year or two. We really would like to be engaged in that process. And we'll need guidance from you and from city, the city administration about how to do that. So let me close by thanking Kaylin Anderson and the city plan for this broad and inclusive, the city plan team, I'm sorry, for this broad and inclusive city plan and for helping to ensure that early learning and care for Edmonton's youngest citizens and their families is part of the planning picture. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Questions for Mr. Brzezant? Councillor Walters? Sorry, Councillor Essinger. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you very much for coming and speaking out in support of the plan and uh, your ongoing commitment to uh, stay at the table 
as we move the plan into operation through uh, the different aspects moving forward. So thank you very much. So it was really, that was the essence. I guess if there was one thing you wanted us to know, um, because we know there's a great need, um, what barrier would you want to tackle first for families in early learning and care? It's hard to, it's hard to nail down one barrier. Um, affordability is a huge issue. Um, and the provincial standards, the provincial regulations around those are changing regularly. We could really use some help from the city in terms of um, uh, advocating for matters that deal with affordability. Um, but in planning, um, I'd say the immediate barrier is trying to figure out how to get childcare into the planning process right from the beginning. Uh, right now, that doesn't happen. And um, I think a city policy or a city guidelines on that topic would be very helpful. Okay, I, I would agree. Thank you very much. That's all my questions. Thank you, Thank Councilor you, Essinger. Um, <clears throat> any other questions for... And it is Dr. Bazanz, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Um, yes, it is. You're a humble guy, though, which is cool. Uh, so I don't <laughs> see any further questions for Doc Bazanz. So we'll um, go next to uh, Heather Raymond, from also from the Edmonton Council for Early Learning and Care. Um, just, just as a correction, there, Heather is unable to be here this afternoon, and her comp her presentation and mine are combined. Oh, okay. That's that's helpful to know. Uh, if she is able to join us and has other things to add uh, before the panel finishes, we can accommodate her. Uh, but if it's been covered off and you can let her know, that would be great. Uh, but that's very helpful, Jeff. All right. Take care. Thank okay. you. Uh, next, then, is Welcome. Mike Melross from the Climate Innovation Fund Alberta Ecotrust. Uh, thank you, Mayor Ison. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Councillors. Thank you for allowing me a few minutes of your time to speak in support of the City Plan. First, I'd like to uh, introduce myself. I'm Mike Melross, the Program Director for the Cli uh, Edmonton Climate Innovation Fund at Alberta Ecotrust. <laughs> Alberta Ecotrust is a member of the Low Carbon Cities Canada Network, which is a cross-country coalition of seven organizations operating in close partnership with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities with the mandate to reduce urban emissions. The fund was established through a one-time endowment from the federal government in the amount of nearly $22 million. I applaud the City of Edmonton for the development of such a comprehensive, forward-thinking municipal development plan. However, I'm gonna limit my comments to those elements that address climate change. The City Plan outlines three stretch targets to stay within a total community-wide carbon budget of 155, 135 megatons to, um, plant uh, 2 million new urban trees and to achieve net zero per person GHG emissions. These targets are significant and aligned with what the international scientific community is suggesting needs to be done to limit the average global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The city must be lauded for its inclusion of the concept of carbon budget in its municipal development plan. As far as I'm aware, it is the first municipal development plan in Canada that not only articulates the importance of a carbon budget, but also sets a target around it. Carbon budget sets a limit on how many emissions Edmonton can produce. It is a very different and more logical way of looking at greenhouse gas emissions in the decades to come. It highlights the scale of the problem and the urgency of the change. The proposed carbon budget of 135 metric tons essentially sets a cap on how many emissions Edmonton can emit, not in one year, but in perpetuity. And it is science-based. A carbon budget is derived globally from the observations made over many decades on the correlation between carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere and global temperature rise. And Edmonton has localized that budget so that it can highlight its contribution to these global emissions. I'm focusing on the carbon budget in my comments because it is a very powerful concept to coalesce around, helping to prioritize actions and align efforts in the same way the city's financial budget does. The adage holds true, you will learn more about a city strategy from its budget than you will from any strategy document. Incorporating a carbon budget into Edmonton city plan will create a policy framework to support 
economic diversification into industries and infrastructure that reduce emissions, including the renovation and renewal revolution that is ahead of us and the rest of the globe. The renovation of buildings can create significant economic activity and good jobs, jobs that are local right here in Edmonton. With upwards of three billion already annually spent on building renewals in Edmonton, an increased renovation rate combined with incremental investments to make these buildings near net zero with on-site renewable energy can significantly contribute to the overall GDP. But the carbon budget will only be valuable if it is integrated into decision-making. This will require municipal decisions to be made within the context of a carbon budget. To be effective, it can't be a measure off to the side that does not link to the foundational programs and services of the city. Therefore, carbon accounting must occur concurrently with the tracking of the carbon budget. Decisions being made need to be evaluated for the carbon impact and conveyed to decision makers, just like the financial impact packs are considered now. The current COVID crisis may be giving city council pause. You may be asking, is now the right time to take action on climate change? Here at the Climate Innovation Fund, we believe more than ever that climate change action is critical and critical now. There is an immediate need to restart the economy, focus on jobs, and create opportunities to ensure Edmonton is prosperous and strong again as quickly as possible. In conclusion, I'd like to note that, you know, the details of the action planning, I think, are really required to achieve the transformative change that's suggested. And that action plan must be time-bound with a clear understanding of each action's impact. The specific actions outlined must be accompanied by a forecasted level of investment required and an understanding of who in society pays and who accrues the benefits. I'm hopeful that Council will see that in October with the update of the Energy Transition Strategy Action Plan. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Mike. Uh, questions for Mr. Milros? Councillor Walters? Or are you still showing up there from... Okay, we'll see if we can clear clear you off there uh, somehow. Councillor Henderson? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the in the question of the carbon budget because it's it, it strikes me that there's almost two pieces of the carbon budget. One is one that we have more control over, which is the amount of carbon um, that will be affected directly by things we build, uh, things we operate as a city. But ultimately, for the carbon budget to be successful, um, it probably needs to be broader than that. It needs it's it's going to have to affect what's happening out in the larger city. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on how to separate those, or maybe they don't need to be separated, but how you measure both of those pieces. So some of it will be policy driven and some of it will actually be driven by choices that we make here in terms of expenditures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just wondering if you can speak to that a bit. Uh, yeah, the, ca the carbon budget applies to the community at large. It's not just for corporate emissions. Um, you know, the, the city has various levers, though, that it can pull to catalyze emissions reductions out in the community. Um, and the city of Edmonton already is tracking community greenhouse gas emissions and uh, aspiring to reduce emissions across the community. So it's really not that much of a change. It's just a repositioning of greenhouse gas emissions in terms of how much you can emit as opposed to how much you're emitting each year and the reduction to a baseline. So uh, absolutely it applies to both the community and the corporation and there needs to be action taken to um, influence the decisions that are made in community investments yeah. as well as corporate investments. So as a predictive tool then, understanding we also have to measure how successful we're being, but in, in both cases, uh, as a predictive tool, we, it's going to be one thing for us to understand on the choices we make, um, how it will affect our carbon budget, but, but we're also going to have to have a way to predict that in terms of policy choices, correct? That is correct. Uh, the, a carbon accounting system should start with the easy stuff, the things that you can actually measure in your corporation, and, and Edmonton has certainly taken a step into that with but the that's greenhouse not gas get management us plan. to where we need to get to. In, in Essentially, yeah, the, the corporation uh, has about 2 or 3% of the emissions, total emissions in Edmonton, so you need to apply that carbon accounting framework to the decisions that you're making in city building as well. So the, so the planning tools, the policy levers that we have in terms of those planning tools is part of what we will need to be able to, one, predict, 
um, so that we, as we make those choices, we can understand what the implications are and then to measure, correct? Correct. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. Mel Ross? Not seeing any. Uh, we miss you, Mike, but thanks for, uh, thanks for showing up today and uh, Thank you. continuing the excellent and important work uh, through the EcoTrust. So um, next, if there are no further questions for Mike, and I'm not seeing any, we'll hear next from Brian Torrance from the Edmonton Sport Council. Brian, are you there? Yeah, sorry, Mayor. Oh, there you are. Go ahead. I thought there was one more in front. Um, did I skip someone? Nope, you're up. You're up next. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Bonus points so for your backdrop. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's right, yeah. I, I'll, I'll say that was intentional. Carry on. Uh, so good afternoon. So thank you, Mayor and Councillors. Um, Mayor, thank you for your land acknowledgement uh, this morning. But I'd also like to acknowledge that I am speaking to and residing on Treaty 6 land. Um, so my name is Brian Torrance. Uh, I currently serve as the chairperson of the Edmonton Sport Council. Our board is guided by a dedicated group of people with expertise in provincial sport, population health, school wellness, and supporting persons with a disability. So we advocate for sport, physical activity, and recreation. But very clear, and I want to make this point, um, but very much we are working in the area of the social health of our city. So the Edmonton Sport Council is a nonprofit organization serving as a voice and a coordinating body for sport and capacity building service for our sector for over 20 years. So for the last three years, we've been working alongside the city with Live Active Initiative that aims to build active living and wellness across Edmonton. So we are very much in support of the city plan. Part two of the proposed city plan asks what choices do we need to make to be a healthy urban climate and resili resilient city of two million people that supports a prosperous region. For the Edmonton Sport Council and our members, the inclusion of the word healthy is symbolic of where Edmonton must seek to be as individuals and the community as a whole. So more than ever, upstream health and wellness need long-term strategies, needs to be prioritized, and needs to be planned for. This plan does include for wellness. Therefore, we're most pleased that Healthy City is one of the four strategic goals. As a healthy city is an active city, and everyone needs to be have an opportunity to be involved in a healthy city. The 2019 Edmonton Community Foundation Vital Signs Report clearly identified the importance and impact of active recreation and sport opportunities for Edmontonians. 49% of Edmontonians participate in active recreation or organized sport and approximately 23 Edmontonians no longer believe that there are adequate opportunities for sport and recreation. The most common barriers are, are costs and also transportation. It's also important to note the financial impact and economic impact of sport and recreation in our city. From 2018, the economic impact of sport and recreation in Edmonton was $663 million. So this is a strategic initiative in terms of the health of Edmontonians, but also the financial impact of our city. COVID-19 has had traumatic impact on active recreation and sport opportunities and will continue to have an impact into at least the near future and obviously likely longer. A recent survey for Sport for Life indicated that over half of the sport organizations servicing youth will be impacted and their programs potentially cancelled. On a positive note of COVID, and Dr. Karen Lee spoke to this too, uh, we've seen increased foot or bicycle traffic past our front door in our neighborhoods in our playgrounds, in our parks. So we have seen this more hyper-local aspect of physical activity. But keep in mind that we've lost destination recreation center use, we've lost recess, we lost physical education, we lost organized sport, and we lost other recreational activities during COVID. So as much as we see more physical activity happening outside, essentially our population has been less physically active, which impacts their physical, but also their mental health. Some of our businesses and recreation centers with the hard work of uh, city recreation teams have partial return, but we know that some businesses and services will not. The proposed city plan appears to offer a better future for all Edmontonians to live active. Prioritizing wellness and seeing sport and recreation as a vehicle to achieve belonging and good health of Edmontonians. The Edmonton Sport Council is again in agreement with this. If we had to choose just one big city move to support, it would be a community of communities. 
due to the active transportation goal and the concept of 15-minute districts that allow people to easily commute their daily needs. Moving people out of cars is an environmental issue, but it's also a health and well-being one as well. So to this point, we're in favor and support a recreation center in Royal Miles Park, for example. It is an example of creating community access to live active, closer to neighborhoods and without as many transportation barriers. Without the plan, also positive to see the words walkable communities, walk and roll friendly, active transportation, active living. We just heard Dr. Karen Lee speak to uh, larger and wider sidewalks and the shared use street initiatives. Words that are absent from the city plan are sport and active recreation, if we do a word search. So positive examples that we could like to see enhanced um, is such as on page 48, increased opportunities for Edmontonians to be physically active through all seasons. And also a very important one is to provide services and programs which reduce barriers for low income residents to community recreation facilities. Many of these concepts are included in the City of Edmonton Live Active Strategy and it's very positive to see them also included in the new city plan. Also, as we know, pictures speak louder than words, and this city plan is filled with pictures of people being active, enjoying our beautiful nature, uh, paddling down the, uh, the North Saskatchewan, or being in a street park. COVID-19 has made it evident that additional space, both traditional and non-traditional, for both formal and informal sport and physical activities are required and in the near and long term. And they're required very soon. Health, both mental and physical, through phys increased physical activity, recreation, and sport needs to happen yesterday, today, and planned for in the long term. So sport and recreation is not a nice to have. Rather, they are essential to, re to retrain and promote the attraction of highly skilled and talented workforce to the city in terms of innovation, investment, and also business. To achieve the proposed city plan, active recreation and sport must continue to be recognized as an investment that provides a positive return to the health and wellness of the participant and the community as a whole. The city plan will have a tremendous influence on how Edmontonians will live active today and tomorrow. To the example of attaining feedback from a group of people playing nightball, as was indicated in the city presentation, nightball needs to be supported and hopefully we have more nightball sessions happening within our city. We appreciate the opportunity to speak to the proposed city plan today and we look forward to its implementation through ongoing partnerships and advocacy, which the city has welcomed. Excited for the work ahead and thank you for your time to be with you today. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Torrance. Uh, I'll ask administration uh, to go back to the speakers list and see if there are any speakers with, or pardon me, uh, uh, questions for you. Uh, maybe just a, a clarification, Councillor Banga, if you could take the chair. How did you? Um, so th the, uh, I guess I, I interpreted from your comments that, that you see uh, sport and active recreation as uh, certainly embedded in the imagery in the plan and the broader intents around Healthy City, but uh, would, would ask for an amendment or a specific intention or direction about the importance of, of that recreation um, over, not, no, not over and above, I don't mean to equivocate on value, but, but in parallel to and complementary to passive recreation and design for health in general and all those other pieces that we've heard about so far. So, so some explicit yeah. mention, did you have a specific area uh, in, in the plan uh, where um, you thought something like that might fit? Under one uh, maybe I don't have a specific area in the plan, uh, Mayor. Um, maybe to your words around the intention. Uh, so I do think the intention of sport, active recreation, and, and living physically active lives is in, is in, the, the, the uh, in terms of the plan as, as a comprehensive plan. But I think it, it could be more intentional in certain areas, and especially in terms of that aspect of a community within the community. Uh, we could speak to the opportunities of sport, physical activity, and recreation within our local community. Well, I'm, I'm seeing the planners who've worked on this flipping through and nodding their heads, uh, and so they may have a suggestion. But if you uh, see a place where you think there's an obvious uh, opportunity to, uh, to make that clear uh, in a supplementary and clarifying way, uh, please shoot me an email, uh, just don.iveson at edmonton.ca with a suggestion, and, and I'll flag it as as uh, along with, and, and just to be clear, people have had other suggestions for where we could tighten some things up and make some adjustments. So some of those are more self-evident though. So if you have a suggestion, uh, feel free to send it, but we'll, 
I'll flag it to, to look at as well because uh, this is a great point. So um, uh, I, that's the only question I had. Uh, I'll take the chair back with gratitude for your presentation. So unless there's anybody else with questions, going once, going twice, no? And thank you, Mr. Torrance, for that. Next is Sherry Shorten from the Alberta Association of Architects core stakeholder team. Okay, thank you. Um, I have slides, so could I get slide one? Yeah, we can see them. Go ahead. Okay, okay great. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for this opportunity to speak. My name is Sherry Shorten, and I'm here as part of the city's core stakeholder team representing a committee of my peers from the Alberta Association of Architects. Excuse me. I wish to express our gratitude for the efforts made by the city in this work and others connected to it. Our meetings with city leads were handled with a great deal of excitement and mutual respect. The work of this committee is supported by our affiliate associations, the Consulting Architects of Alberta and the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, Alberta's chapter and network organizations. Having read through city plan and engaged in stakeholder activities, the committee supports the passing of city plan to bylaw 20,000 to act as a specialized municipal development plan for Edmonton. I'm sharing a collection, sorry, uh, the discussion I'm sharing today is a collection of responsible responses from our committee as we open up a conversation on our city's future form and the economic prosperity that will be imminent through its passing. The work that architects do will be impacted by city plan in many ways. The urban design narrative contained in city plan welcomes diversity, population growth, equity, and increased investment in healthy public space and communities. Winter City continues to be a distinct activity we collectively thrive on due to our geography. As architects, we work in the best interest of our clients. Our professional interest in city building is that of public good. Architects in Alberta, through their licensing, owe a duty of care to the public to design safe and sustainable environments. At the same time, use our creative skills to solve complex design and development problems. Slide two. The following slides are intended to illustrate areas where we see an intersection between our profession and the city plan. We feel the following areas have not been addressed in this plan and must be strengthened in the work moving forward. Slide two, return to balance. Responsibilities for architects and planners have been slowly diverging over time. The city zoning regulations are not up to date in relation to climate resiliency, wellness or environmental standards, which architects have been using now for nearly 30 years. Trusting relationships between these two professions have become strained by the demands of ballooning regulatory scope on architectural practice and new urbanism ideals in planning. This condition must seek to rebalance relationships and processes for alignment with professional, ethical and regulatory standards. We see this condition as a pressing issue and collectively agree it is a barrier to streamline flow in the design of our projects. Slide three. The next slide highlights areas where private sector work intersects with us on city plan. Site, and con site context in urban design, at the present time, city plan is not committed to an economic plan for urban renewal. Alternative built form regulatory changes and processes are required to address the redevelopment in existing metropolitan areas to maintain connectivity to existing older neighborhoods. Regulatory reform address wellness standards, climate resiliency, site planning standards, in particular, open space, sunlight, and access to natural views. Rezoning reform. Implement better control for rezoning. Lot by lot, rezoning is not a sustainable mechanism for growth. It was initially intended to generate new ways to approach regulations. Unfortunately, this has become the standard zoning practice and is not a good conduit for new urbanism goals that it was intended to be. EDC, Edmonton Design Committee, operations and urban design principles are proving difficult to achieve in the private sector. Work collaboratively, collaboratively with stakeholders to improve urban design standards, renewable energy use, and to extend life cycles of infrastructure development. And lastly, city identity. Increase the awareness of the city's identity as a winter city for more appropriate site design practices and to maximize use of public realm space respect aesthetics, site context, and local identity. Slide four. Lastly, during these next stages of critical refinement work, now is the time to balance opportunities and access 
and provide access to public sector work for local businesses, artists, and architects to contribute to the goals of a public arts, culture, and ar architectural infrastructure plan as outlined in the city plan. Special thanks to my colleagues on the core stakeholder team, Myron Nabozik, Jean Dubb, Keith Taggart, Henry Howard, and Stephanie Clancy, who's with me today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, questions for Ms. Shorten? Not seeing any, um, but it would be wonderful if we could get a copy of your presentation, um, which it looks like clerks have. So if that could be circulated to us, that would be helpful. So um, thank you very much for those comments. I see no clarifying questions. At the, oh, Councillor Henderson's uh, got one now, so yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I just couldn't get my click on fast enough. I'm, I'm just curious if there are some specific, in terms of the plan here today, I think everything you talk about in, in terms of moving forward with the zoning work, the work that comes after makes sense. Is there anything in the plan itself um, that, that you are feeling is, isn't there or needs to be reworded in order to achieve some things you're talking about. It, a, lot, a lot of it seems to be like kind of next stage concerns. Yeah, exactly. Um, we realize that and the zoning renewal will address a lot of this stuff. I guess we kind of expected this document to include that. There are not a lot of architectural design intentions that has come up into the, the, the discussion in terms of, you know, Dr. Lee's presentation. Um, and there, there is just a gigantic debate in Edmonton about what to do um, in terms of um, with regulations. Mm -hmm. I think the point I want to, you know, emphasize in this presentation is that we, we have been fighting um, getting our regulations up to date, thinking that that's more costly and more uh, barriers. But in fact, it's really stopped progress for some time. So, yeah, we want you to move forward. <laughs> Right, but so the document we have in front of us, I think, opens the door for that. The question is how we walk through it. I, you know, honestly, I think, like, when you talk to architects, the first thing we're going to say is show me the money. Um, you know, there's nothing here um, in terms of an economic plan. It's a intention um, of sorts, and we really need to see a plan as many layers. So this plan... Um, it does serve its purpose, but, you know, it's really not a plan. It's a plan to create a plan. So we'd be more interested in the plan um, than the plan to create the plan. Um, that, and we're here to sort of help and work with you guys moving forward. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Shorten? Not seeing any, then thank you very much. Um, following up from the same organization is Stephanie Clancy. Stephanie? Hi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and councillors for having this forum. I must commend you and the city and uh, Kaylin and um, Charity and their whole team for this extensive work on this new city plan. Definitely the Alberta Association of Architects are in full support of this plan. As Sherry indicated, it's kind of a plan to make a plan, but it's, uh, it's an exceptional start and it's a true visionary plan. So I just wanted to highlight three points to help us get from the vision to implementation for council. Um, and first up is I'm really hoping that um, you'll involve our profession, you know, access and involve our association and the profession in this engagement process. Um, architects are on the front line of uh, design and development and we are actively solving design and site and bylaw regulatory problems daily. It's what we do. Uh, we can be very valuable resource for the city planners and actively assist with the development of policies to connect the dots between achieving the urban design outcomes and the regulatory bylaws permitting process, as well as respecting what the market needs for their return on investments. I mean, we're a close knit with our clients and what they require as well. Uh, my second point is uh, the firm and thoughtful regulations. As Sherry indicated, our legislated obligations as a profession is first and foremost to the public. That's the public safety and the public good. But that said, we are beholden to our clients and it is their investment and risk that we have to respect. 
and we cannot make them build or address anything outside of their site or their development that is not required by codes or bylaws or regulations. So many of the elements of the urban form and the site context, although we are discussed with, within the team, they do not become part of the development as there's no incentive or payback to the client. And many elements that could enhance the urban space and that pelvic realm are bypassed in the interest of the client's need for the return on their investments. So individual developers and land orders, they can't be expected to altruistically contribute or even envision the needs of the whole city. And that's, um, even though it might benefit them with a more marketable city in the end, that's why we need council and city administration. They have to kind of use a, a tough love and be firm with the city's visionary plan um, in order to achieve it. Um, there's kind of a misconception that uh, regulations are inherently bad and the developers and investors need more freedom to invest, but this is not really true. They really need, um, in order to get this city plan as aspirational as it is, um, we do need regulations that are firm and thoughtful and very transparent and that have an interconnected um, piece with the policies and the objectives from this plan that they are trying to achieve and influence. So when we have the guidelines and the suggestion from, say, the, uh, the development office, um, often these end up just becoming a bit of a waste of time that we go through the motions of going through these guidelines, but at the end of the day, because they're not enforced, the client doesn't want to pay for them. So we really need um, uh, sort of a more robust streamlining and eliminate some of the current outdated bylaws regarding land use, land use and zoning, and replace these with purposeful, form-based urban planning regulations that will strive much more effectively for the city plan um, objectives that they're trying to get to. And then my last point is, and you're all aware of this as well, is that uh, we have to set the priorities. Um, that the, the city plan is really a lot of uh, things that you have to tackle. And I know um, the city councils, I know you have a, a really terrible job in front of you of trying to make all these decisions. Uh, you're in, um, like around the globe, cities are in a position where they have to make the choices for climate change and your failing infrastructure and transit and homelessness and all of these things and you just don't have enough resources and you're not getting a heck of a lot from the federal and provincial governments most times. Um, but the good news is, is that you have this marvelous city plan that will really go forth and, and inform your choices and really help you make those um, uh, more thoughtful choices on your, on your priorities. And really from uh, the prof our professional point of view, we, w we do recommend that you make carbon neutrality or your carbon budget a, a driving priority as um, the time is really tight on that one and I have to get moving on that. Uh, sort of moving into the zoning bylaws uh, renewal is kind of a two year process. And I think we're running out of time to do something about achieving our carbon neutrality budget. And um, there is a, and that will also coincide with the, many of the greener as we grow directions that you have and achieve a more marketable city for the globe um, in how we uh, appear to the rest of the world. I do recommend considering um, joining the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. Uh, there's a lot of information in there in terms of how other cities have made policies and considerations and used their limited uh, resources to uh, make a difference in that. And the only other priority I wanted to just mention, and it hasn't really come up yet, is uh, considerations for the supply chain for food production. Uh, this is a longer term uh, initiative that's going to take a long time to sort of get into place and help our city in the longer run. So I think it has to be considered sooner than later. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Questions? Not seeing any then. Uh, thank you very much for those uh, additional comments, Ms. Clancy. Um, next up is Dave Buchanan from Paths for People.
Dave Buchanan, are you there? Mr. Buchanan? We don't see him on the list anymore. He may have dropped off the call. Okay. Let's uh, just let him know that uh, his time is coming. Um, in the meantime, we'll move ahead to the next registered speaker, which is Ashley Salvador from Yegg Garden Suites. Welcome, Ashley. Go ahead. The floor is yours. All right. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I am speaking on behalf of Yegg Garden Suites in full support of the City Plan. Uh, now, it's true that Yegg Garden Suites is a bit of a niche organization. Technically, we're devoted to one form of housing, garden suites, so it, it may seem odd that we're speaking today. Uh, but for us, the true purpose of Yegg Garden Suites is to help create communities in which all Edmontonians can live happy, healthy lives. Communities where people can thrive and where they can belong. Communities where people can have all of their needs met in a manner that's in sync with larger city goals around sustainability, resilience, and inclusion. Edmonton City Plan sets our collective gaze towards building a city premised on those exact values. Now the City Plan covers a lot of ground, uh, so today we decided to focus on just one element. Ashley, we've uh, lost your sound for a second, sorry. Try again. Sorry, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Thank you, sorry. Okay. Uh, not sure where you lost me, but uh, I'm just going to focus on one element of the city plan that we think is particularly important, and that's the concept of 15-minute districts. So it's, it's interesting because cities around the world are actually coming back to this concept of being able to walk, bike, or roll to the essentials of life within 15 minutes of their home, within a certain geographic area. So it's not a new idea. You know, early settlements were literally founded on this principle because it just made practical sense. Location efficiency is just as real today as it was thousands of years ago. But the language around the 15 minute city is helpful and it provides a frame for discussions around how residents should be able to carry out their lives in urban areas. We believe that the nodes and corridors strategy combined with the multimodal transportation planning that underlies the city plan will open the door to achieving that kind of city. And it's not just about lifestyles, it's about building an economically viable and competitive city that will attract new residents. It's also about building a city that we can afford to maintain to a high standard years into the future, which is why we were really pleased to see the commitment to not expand beyond our current boundary. That being said, we did note that the vast majority of development is planned to occur at the fringes of our southern and western border, uh, which admittedly makes us uh, a little bit wary of the strength of that commitment. Uh, so we do think it is really important to send a clear signal to industry members that this is the border and we're going to remain firm on that commitment. And that's the type of commitment that it's going to take to ultimately realize the city plan. We also noticed that there was a lot of talk about markets and consumer preferences this morning. Uh, so I just wanted to address that quickly. So I wanted to offer that housing preferences are shaped by markets and markets are in part shaped by policy and regulation. So for example, when we hear that there's ongoing preference for ground-oriented single-family housing, I think it's important to ask, are there any attractive viable substitutes or have we locked out alternative forms through regulatory red tape, thereby influencing preference? So another example, if we have, as a city have prioritized one mode of transportation for decades, should we be surprised when other substitute modes see less adoption? Taking this into consideration, we believe the city plan will help level the playing field and will actually help provide more choice for Edmontonians in those regards. Finally, I wanted to address the infill target of 50%. Um, as it stands, we won't reach 50% um, until we add an additional 500,000 to 750,000 residents. So that's a long ways in the future. Uh, we, we'd like to see this either bumped up to 55% or see the promotion of infill growth uh, increased, or sorry, uh, the proportion rather, of infill growth increased more rapidly over the phased population horizons. Committing to a slightly higher target will encourage the city to start investing in necessary upgrades now and over the life cycle of the city plan. Uh, so just in closing, overall, we're really impressed with the years of work and consultation administration has put into this. The end product is a visually stunning 
spatially oriented document that breaks from previous approaches. Uh, we're, we're really looking forward to seeing alignment across other foundational documents like the zoning bylaw in the coming years to ensure the goals and vision set out by the city plan are realized. All right, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Salvador? Uh, Councilor Knack, are you sorry, yes, attempting sorry, to... Just, thank you. <laughs> okay, sorry, proceed. I realized I needed to hit the button. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mark. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Salvador, for your presentation. I guess one question I want to ask you, and you mentioned that you have a bit of a niche market, but... Um, there's a lot of talk that, again today about increasing density and, and I think actually we, we, it seems to be like the conversation is, well, there's apartment buildings and then there's a single family home and then there's nothing in between <laughs> for increasing density in our mature neighborhoods. And, and I think obviously garden suites itself would suggest that, that that isn't the case. So I guess I wanted to understand what you've been seeing in terms of the, of the people that have been taking up, taking you up on garden suites. Who's who's investing in those options or, or purchasing into those options? Um, what are the what's the potential? I know there had been a conversation about the flag lot uh, approach, which would be a zoning conversation for later. But does that open up housing in a way that that might be more affordable in mature spaces? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to speak to your first first question around, you know, who who is actually building garden suites? Who, what's the market that's taking up this form of housing? Um, so we see about a 50-50 split between people who are wanting to, you know, house a loved one, maybe it's an aging parent, university-aged child. It's, it's a way to facilitate multi-generational living. That's, that's a huge market segment. Um, and the other is rental income. So people are able to um, not only generate a passive rental income themselves, but offer rental opportunities in neighborhoods that are primarily ownership driven, if that makes sense. Um, so in that sense, it is creating uh, a form of uh, affordable housing in homogenous um, neighborhoods where your only other option is to buy into a larger home. Now, looking at sort of the the, the middle ground between sort of low density single family homes and apartments, there's a full spectrum in there. And I mean, the city has um, explored that with its middle, missing middle housing review. And I think that's an amazing first step that showed us that there's uh, a wide variety of typologies that are more oriented towards um, ground oriented dwellings, you know, courtyard housing. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll start to see duplexes with garden suites. Um, Anything that's, you know, three to four stories where you still have access to amenity space, it's still large enough to be family friendly. I think those are the types of forms that we often forget in these types of conversations. But those are the forms that are, you know, the, the viable alternatives that I spoke about that are, that are maybe missing. Uh, that's, that's where we need to go. Thank you. And, and the other question, again, just relates a little bit to that, that future conversation of what's what does affordable housing look like going forward? And and again, recognizing there's a bit of a regulatory conversation that needs to exist around being able to actually subdivide and create a flag lot. But if, if that potential existed, part of, I'm curious if you're seeing a demand from people saying, you know, I'd love to be able to purchase a parcel of land that is smaller in a mature neighborhood and build something that is much cheaper than you would see as a new home because yes a garden suite can be from what i've heard you know 100 to 250 thousand dollars depending on what you want to buy but if that's going to be your first home that's a lot more affordable even than a house outside the at the very edges so have you seen a demand or people asking about that potential absolutely um you know we get asked multiple times a month from people who are wanting that exact scenario uh, you know, we've even consulted with folks who who really want to try to achieve that, uh, and they have to go through an entire rezoning process, uh, upwards of you know six to ten thousand dollars. It's it's very onerous. There's no there's no smooth path to um, having a an ownership model for garden suites. Uh, we would love to explore alternatives such as you know condos. Um, right now, you're not allowed to sever a garden suite either by subdivision uh, or condo or strata title. 
Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Like there, there is a market there, um, and being able to open up that market for smaller lots, smaller dwellings uh, within our mature neighborhoods, that would be amazing. Right, great. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Any other questions for Ms. Salvador? Not seeing any. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, Dave Buchanan, were we able to get him back on the line? Yes, I do believe he's back on. Oh, super. Okay. Mr. Buchanan? Yeah, I'm here. Welcome. Go ahead. The floor is yours for the next five minutes. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Dave Buchanan, and I'm here representing Paths for People. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization striving to make Edmonton a more multimodal transportation city and a friendlier place to walk, roll, glide, and cycle. Paths for People fully supports the vision of mobility and active transportation in the city plan. We strongly endorse the plan's goals of embracing a multimodal view of transportation, where citizens have real choices about how to get around our city safely, efficiently, and equitably of creating a fully connected, accessible, and equitable mobility system where people come first, not cars. Of facilitating increased urban density throughout our city, which ultimately makes active transportation a more feasible choice for all Edmontonians due to reduced trip lengths. And of recognizing the crucial role of high quality active transportation networks in seeking to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We believe the plan offers a promising blueprint for achieving a low carbon mobility system. Overall, Pass for People fully supports the climate change strategies in the plan, especially the adherence to a carbon budget and commitment to being a climate resilience leader. We'd like to commend the city plan team for their engagement uh, throughout the process and recognize their excellent work. Uh, we often come to council to complain about things, um, to tell you what we think you're not doing right, uh, but not this time. <laughs> the Pass for People Board stands strongly in support of the city plan, and we urge Council's approval. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Buchanan. Questions? I don't see anyone clicking on, so thank you very much for those comments, Mr. Buchanan. That brings us to the end of panel one. And uh, what we will do now, I understand, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, city clerks, is we'll recess until 3.45 when the next panel will convene, just because that's when people are expecting to be uh, uh, on deck to present. So we'll, uh, there's really no, nothing to do other than recess now. Uh, I don't know if I need a motion to do that at this point. I'll just seek unanimous consent to recess now. Uh, and reconvene at the scheduled 345 time block for panel number two. So, all right, well, we'll recess and, uh, and carry on then. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our uh, first panel of presenters for your patience and your contributions today and throughout the process. We really appreciate it.
Hello, Chef Raz. I can see that you've joined. Can you confirm that you can hear me, please? Yes, yes, I can. Great, thank you. We can hear you as well. Awesome. And Chelsea, I can see that you've joined the meeting. Uh, once you're settled, if you wouldn't mind uh, testing your audio, so just confirming that you can hear me and unmuting so we can confirm that we can hear you. Hi, Kate, it's Chelsea, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thanks very much.
Good afternoon and welcome back. Let's uh, roll call momentarily here and uh, carry on with the next panel. So I'll call us back to order and um, uh, introduce the public hearing in a moment, but uh, um, I'll start this time with Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Live and in the flesh. Welcome back. Councillor Katarina. Yes. Welcome. Councillor Zadek. I am here. Welcome. Councillor Essinger. Present. Welcome. Councillor Hamilton. Present. Thank you. Councillor Henderson. I am here. Welcome. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon again. Thank you. Councillor McKean. Here. Welcome. Councillor Nickel. Councillor Nickel. Councillor Nickel. Councillor Paquette. I am here. I just sometimes <laughs> have trouble with that mute button. I hear you. I hear you. Uh, and Councillor Walters. Present. And uh, Councillor Banga. Here. Okay, well that's enough to get going again. So uh, I will now uh, call uh, or uh, run through the procedures for um, the second panel again. The way this will work is that uh, folks again uh, may present virtually using the Google Meet or here in person. Uh, we're continuing to hear from those who are registered in favor and we have uh, I believe eight more, uh, now seven uh, registered in favor. Um, still, uh, each, uh, uh, part of me, and then we have um, uh, six registered in opposition at this time. Um, the way this will work is that each person who is registered will have five minutes to make their comments. The clerk will run the official timer, however those attending uh, uh, virtually especially may wish to use a timer at home too. When each speaker is finished, though please stay at the microphone or on the line as counselors may wish to ask you questions. And we may need to take a, uh, oh no I'll skip over this part, um, uh, we may need to take a recess between uh, those in favor and those in opposition depending on how the time works so stand by but we'll see if we can, uh, how far we can get uh, this afternoon with the speakers. After we've heard all of the comments from the public, again, Council may ask questions of City Administration and after all of the speakers have concluded, uh, I will ask each speaker if they wish to speak to new information which arose during the public hearing. This process does require patience from everyone to assure that anyone who does wish to address Council has an opportunity. Thereafter, of course, Council may close the public hearing and debate the bylaw. For those participating virtually, please refrain from using the chat function in the Google Meet during the meeting as it can create issues of decorum or provide unfair advantage and it may interfere technically with the live stream. Additionally, remember to mute your microphone when you're not presenting or answering questions and if you're experiencing any difficulties, the Office of City Clerk has resources available to facilitate communication with those participating in the statutory public hearing process. Please reach out using the contact information provided in your registration or at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. A speaker's list for each time block will be, will be provided on edmonton.ca slash meetings for your reference. And finally, for those of us here in person, please remember that the temporary mandatory face covering bylaw 19408 is in effect. We ask that you keep your mask on at all times, including while making your remarks to City Council. You will notice that members of Council and Administration may take off their masks while they are behind the plexiglass barriers, but will put them back on when moving about the room and talking with each other during the meeting. So we appreciate your understanding and participation in keeping everyone safe in this continued time of pandemic. So um, Madam Clerk, if you can read out uh, the folks we have registered to speak on panel two. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.1 charter bylaw 20000 to adopt the city plan, Edmonton's municipal development plan? Yes, on the second panel, I have Chelsea Donnellan from the Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee. Chelsea, are you there? Yes, I am. Great, thank you, and we can hear you, which is wonderful. Next, uh, we have Shafraz Kaba, from, also from the Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee. You there, Shafraz? I yeah. see you. 
Welcome. Thank good, you. Good to have you. Thank you. Third is Tammy Pidner uh, the, from the Winter City Advisory Council. Tammy, are you there? Yes, good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, fourth, I have Christy Morin from Arts on the Ave. Oh, it's just so weird to have people in person and live. Hi, Christy. Welcome. It's good to have you at City Hall again. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, uh, and number five, I have Bob Summers. Yep, I'm here. Hey, Dr. Bob. Um, number six, Kristen Goa. Hi there, I'm here. Welcome. And last but not least, registered in favor, Elaine Soles uh, from the Friends of Skona Rec. Here. Welcome, Elaine. And then in opposition, I have uh, Jason Pizeski from the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Here. Welcome. I have uh, Tanya Larivier from also from the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Here. Welcome. Uh, I have Linda Duncan. Yes, I am here. Welcome, Linda. Uh, I you. have uh, number 11 is Dave Purewall. He's indicated that he likely won't be able to join the meet until after four. Oh, okay. Well, we'll, we'll uh, understand his intent is to join us uh, by the time we get to him. So recognizing Mr. Purewall. Uh, number 12 is uh, Don Nikonetz from Site Engineering Technology Incorporated on behalf of Paul Graywall. Oh, hi. Welcome, sir. And uh, 13 is uh, Janeline Hardstaff from the Residential Working Group. I'm here. Welcome. All right. Uh, so there may still be a few more registrations, in which case this list could juggle, but uh, um, uh, we'll uh, carry on without further ado. Uh, hearing next uh, from Chelsea Donnellan. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Iverson and councillors. So you probably have seen uh, Shafraz and I, as well as the rest of the Energy Transition and Climate Resilience and Adaptation Committee submitted a memo in support of the city plan. We would like just to speak to that memo. We'll keep it quick. We know you have a lot of people to hear from, um, but essentially we fully support the city plan as drafted. We think it is a critical piece in the energy transition. Um, we are happy to say that two of our members, Klaus Roddenberg and Sheena Wilson, were heavily involved as members of the core city plan committee. Um, and so we have been giving input throughout the process. We think that it is important in this time of uncertainty, both economically and in terms of COVID, to recognize that the city plan did deep engagement with Edmontonians and we heard meaningfully what they wanted and the values that they prioritized. We believe that many of these values still hold true and items like the nodal city that encourages densification, urban green spaces and walkable active transportation still are fundamentally important to Edmontonians. We do offer a couple of recommendations when considering the city plan. First of all, we would make clear that the stretch targets are indeed the targets. These stretch targets are powerful, uh, net zero emissions by citizens, two million new trees and staying within our carbon budget are absolutely essential. We think that that needs to be committed to clearly as the fundamental targets. This is what's been communicated to us from the city planning part of administration, um, but could be reflected more clearly in the document and that there needs to be sure accountability built in there. We also think that because of the deep work that was done for this plan, as well as the 1.5 degree strategy that you will be seeing later in October, that these two foundational documents that have inspiring visions of where Edmonton is going should be the basis of the reimagined work. And finally, we encourage council to look for opportunities to go further and faster as we begin to see patterns of behavioral change as a result of the pandemic and as we begin to see how financial investments play out, particularly on energy transition items. And so to keep it very quick and uh, short and sweet for you, we very much support the city plan, believe it should be the foundational document alongside the 1.5 degree plan for the work going forward. Well, thank you, Ms. Donnellan. Really appreciate uh, those comments and the committee's uh, work and advice through this whole process. Um, questions for Ms. Donnellan? Not seeing any for you, then thank you very much uh, for, um, 
for being with us. Uh, we'll hear next from uh, Shafraz Kaba, also from uh, Energy Transition and Climate Resilience Committee. Shafraz, go ahead. The floor is yours for the next five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will not take all of that. Uh, in fact, uh, Chelsea has covered most of it. All I wanted to do is iterate. Uh, we are in support of the city plan going forward because it will really help every decision become a climate decision. Um, I think that's the goal of our uh, of what we see as as part of our climate emergency. We need to start to put into place actions that can help um, overcome uh, this climate emergency in a proactive and meaningful way. And our committee, uh, with you know the the goal of energy transition and climate uh, sort of mitigation as well as adaptation, feel that uh, the city plan will help steer um, our community in in this direction. Uh, by making every climate decision sort of uh, part of how we move forward, we're, we're also going to um, ensure we have fewer crises going forward. As, as we all have seen in the news lately um, with the, the fires in California and, and the eastern or the western seaboard um, affecting you know, all of those climate refugees, we can see we haven't done enough, fast enough. So we feel we need to fully support any and all action that can help make this happen. As well with the COVID pandemic, we have uh, tried to iterate that climate decisions can also be COVID friendly or COVID mitigating decisions. Um, so we feel that again, many of the community-based actions and ideas in this plan, including uh, creating more green spaces, creating nodal communities, make us more climate resilient, make us more pandemic resilient, and actually will help our economy. We want to pair all of these things in a, a way that can uh, basically kill many birds with one kind of action. So we feel this plan will help in that direction. Thank you. Thanks, Shafraz. Questions? Councilor McKean, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Shafraz, your comment about COVID uh, caused me to click on because, and I asked this of an earlier speaker, but I think uh, we're a little worried, or I'm a little worried, that our density goals, building a more compact city, uh, might fly in the face of uh, common belief right now about density might be more um, concerning for people to live cheek to jowl with others in apartment buildings, share elevators, all that sort of stuff in the midst of a pandemic. So I was just interested when you said that climate goals match um, COVID or pandemic goals. Could you elaborate? Sure, I'll give you an example. One of the things we have studied very, very uh, clearly is building retrofits. So um, as you probably are aware, many older buildings have very old mechanical systems. Those mechanical systems are energy hogs as well as uh, problematic for COVID in that they don't provide enough fresh air and 100% air requirements that most modern or contemporary mechanical ventilation systems do. So we see building retrofits as, as a primary win for both climate as well as COVID by bettering the building stock we have as in existing um, uh, in existence and helping really mitigate that that's stopping of of the pandemic through basic you know airflow. Um, we are seeing also touchless systems as as you can imagine. Have you now? seen uh, new buildings have waving of the hand to open barrier-free doors. So instead of push buttons, we, we are going to sort of a touchless and contactless type of architectural strategy. And part of something called the Work Well Coalition, where a group of international designers are working on all of these types of 
scenarios on how best to retrofit buildings for energy, for climate, for uh, the pandemic, as, as well as economic stimulus. So we have probably strategies to so help. We, we, we don't necessarily have to see um, density and pandemic safety as mutually exclusive. No, not at all. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Councillor Banga, if you could take the chair for a moment. Got the chair. Um, Mr. Kaba, uh, that was very interesting. I look forward to hearing more about that as, as, as that part of your professional work expands. Um, but uh, the, the piece I wanted to really get your take on um, is, I'm not sure if you had a chance to hear the earlier presentation from Ms. Shorten from the Alberta Association of Architects um, uh, around uh, regulatory advice for us, um, particularly as it relates to, to uh, buildings and high-performing buildings and, and climate goals, but also generally um, gaps between nice to haves and must haves and bringing clients along and even some feedback about the city's own um, standards and so there's quite quite a bit there and so I guess the first question is did you have a chance to hear uh, her presentation? No I'm sorry I did not. Okay um, then I won't put you in the spot of asking for your commentary uh, not as a peer-to-peer -peer professional reflection but but in your capacity on the on uh, the energy transition as, an, as someone with green building uh, expertise and an architectural background. So perhaps I'll follow up with you offline with a copy of her presentation, which I've been given, and I'd be really curious your, your yeah. thoughts from an implementation yeah. regulatory framework um, uh, and, and professional obligations of architects and how we can support um, the, the kind of knowledge economy value add um, optimization that your profession brings to these all of these critical questions but not having seen the presentation I can't really uh, put you on the spot about that so fair enough I'd be happy to help great offline. great and that's very consistent with your approach to all of these things so no surprise there thank you very much um, uh, I'll take the chair back and I don't see any further questions for mr. Kaba so uh, please thank the whole committee uh, for, for the committee's submission on this. Um, next up would be Tammy Pidner from the Winter City Advisory Council. Hello, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and for the ability to do so remotely. Although I am a member of the Winter City Advisory Council, we have not met since the spring, so I'm not speaking on their behalf. My remarks today are just Tammy. At this time, when we are surrounded by roller coasters of uncertainty, there is one thing we all know for sure. Winter is coming. As an active champion for Edmonton as a winter city, I am encouraged that the Direction 1.3.2 of the New City Plan explicitly applies a winter lens as we think about our infrastructure, identity, economy, and activities. And so with a winter lens, there are four points that I would like to make today. Number one. We are on the right path. Over the past seven years, since the city first started to really engage the community and think differently about winter, we have seen a lot of really positive changes in the design of our buildings and infrastructure, in the number and variety of our winter activities, and perhaps most importantly, in our attitudes about winter and winter life. If you'd like to know more about how things have changed, the 2018 report called Keep the Snowball, Keep the Snowball Rolling does a really great job of reviewing and evaluating the impact of Edmonton's winter city work so far. Number two, we are in a leadership role. Edmonton's brand and reputation as a progressive winter city is recognized around the world. We are acknowledged for our groundbreaking work in engaging citizens in a culture shift to embrace winter and in designing a four season city with creativity and intentionality. Just last week, Edmonton was featured in a Bloomberg article about making the most of a COVID winter. Number three, we need to build on our winter foundation. Winter's darkness can feel depressing. Winter's temperatures can make us wary of going outdoors. And winter snowfall can make getting around more difficult. All of these things are regular contributors to social isolation and the pandemic adds yet another weight. 
for the physical, mental, social, physical, mental, and social health of our community, it's essential that we keep thinking about how to create safe outdoor winter spaces for kids to play and for people to gather and linger. And four, we need to steer dynamically. COVID takes the importance of thoughtful winter, plan winter planning to a whole new level. And so the work of the Winter City Office will be especially important this year to share knowledge about preserving our quality of life in the winter, to mobilize partners in creating safe outdoor spaces, and to help us all be well in this most unusual time. The increasing appearance of hashtag COVID winter is a harbinger that people are starting to think about what's coming and what's needed in response. We need to leverage the city's expertise and be ready to rethink. I commend the city for all of the work in developing this progressive new city plan. And I am encouraged that the plan recognizes the importance of applying a winter lens as we prepare for our community to double in size. The safest place to be with people these days, and perhaps for some time yet to come, is outdoors. I'm eager to see what the small but mighty Winter City Office has in store for us this year to help us all have a safe, comfortable, and hopefully fun COVID winter. And on a personal note, I look forward to spending even more time supporting our local economy on some of outdoor Edmonton's outdoor winter patios, and perhaps I'll see you there at a safe distance. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, very much for that, uh, Ms. Pidner. Questions for Tammy? Councillor McKean, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Tammy, I just wanted to say that knowing that a lot of folks are um, scared and down right now because of the pandemic and knowing that winter coming is adding to that sense of, of gloom, uh, I just want to say that th I thought that was a really, those are really important points you just made to us. Not just about the city plan, but maybe our planning in the next few weeks and months. So thank you. Oh, was it wasn't a question, Mr. Mayor. I apologize. I was about to I... say, is there a question there, Councillor? So, uh, but, um, okay, thank you. Are there uh, any uh, questions or statements masquerading as questions for Ms. Pidner? <laughs> we do specialize in those around here, so. Um, not seeing any. Um, thank you, Ms. Pidner, for that um, lovely um, and hopeful uh, outlook. Thank you. Um, next is Christy Morin who will come down to uh, the, the, the dock over here. Um, we'll just get her in position and then before we start the time. Once you're in the booth, is it all right? Or no, because it's a shared space. So the and the microphone, we'd have to re-sanitize everything. So, so uh, preferably not. I, I'm told. Uh, if, make sure the microphone's on. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Welcome and thank you so much. Go ahead. Thanks so much, Mr. Mayor. Good good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all on screen and live. I am very supportive of the city plan and thank you all for your strong leadership. Completing a plan like this takes courage, innovation and strength as we're walking into a, as we are in a global pandemic. Arts on the Ave just completed Kaleido 2020 on tour where we saw 207 artists on flatbed trucks traveling through 27 blocks of real estate in the Alberta Ave district from Nate to Northlands, Yellowhead to 111th Avenue. It took a lot of understanding of culture, workshops, artists, logistics, and it all came together. So I wanna thank the city of Edmonton for their great leadership in helping us make that happen. How to have thriving communities in this global pandemic is gonna be especially difficult when we're working in fragile communities in Edmonton. And in our fragile communities, we wanna continue on the revitalizations that you have supported so much in the past. And we, we know that looking at the plan, we've seen a holistic approach of arts, wellness, safety, walkability, active living and caring communities. And we thank you for that. And we are looking forward to being able to find ways to make that happen. I also am part of the Winter City Advisory Council. And I have to say as a member, I'm extremely proud of the work that we've done together in the past seven years. 
And thanks to our mayor and to our city councillors, um, Councillor Henderson, Councillor Cartmel, Councillor McKean, and many others that have been champions in this area. For us, when we look at our leadership globally in winter, it's something to put our, a plume in our hats. And I'm wondering if we're going to continue being able to do that uh, through this time. Our city office with its, when we talk about an office for winter cities, it's truly one person that is making it happen and is the glue that comes together that has communications, logistics, um, all those wonderful things of, of what we need in the winter. And I think as winter festivals, we're looking forward to it and we're coming together to create a package uh, working under the advisement of Councillor Henderson and Councillor Cartmel with the team. And we're really, really interested in knowing if we're gonna be able to pivot in this time. The chattel, the winter cities, the uh, coordination, and, and looking at how do we continue giving the knowledge to our city through this time. The, the, the expertise and the knowledge of winter has become extremely extraordinary. And how do we continue passing this knowledge as we've just moved from one office to another office and trying to figure out how we can do that together and effectively. So without any else, anything else to say, I just wanna say that we are very supportive as festivals in Edmonton, Arts on the Ave. We are continuing to look at deep freeze and figuring out how we can pivot. Um, the whole festival group is meeting together and really wanna see how we can do something beautiful. In this cold winter time, we realized when we were going door to door um, with, this, with our festival on tour and realizing there was so much need for joy, magic, and people connectivity. And um, that's something that brought tears to everybody's eyes, the people that were hearing and dancing and those that were on the trucks performing and creating. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Morin. Any questions for Christy? Not seeing any, then um, it speaks for itself. Thank you very much. Um, Next, then, is Bob Summers. All right. Uh, thank you, Mayor Iverson, and uh, thank you to all members of City Council for the opportunity to speak. I, I want to commend the members of City Administration, first of all, for the development of this plan. I know it's really a tremendous undertaking. Uh, it took two years of a lot of people's lives. I know that uh, they put their heart and soul into it, especially Kaylin. So congratulations and thanks to her for that effort. Um, I also want to really thank all the other speakers today. I'm always... Whenever I watch a city council public hearing, I'm always so impressed by the decorum and professionalism of everyone and how people want to contribute to making a better city. So uh, thanks to them. This is a really good plan. And um, one of the, the key reasons I think it's a good plan is that it concentrates our investment and attention uh, spatially in a way that's really been absent in past plans. At really any moment of a city's history of its growth, there's kind of a theoretical ideal urban form. I mean, for each city, it would be specific, but um, in terms of its urban efficiency, and, and when I talk about efficiency, I don't just mean the efficiency in delivering services and maintaining infrastructure, which is really important, but also the efficiency that um, uh, of the preference that people have for where they want to live, uh, where business o businesses would like to open and types of locations and properties they'd like to be in. So there's a sort of theoretical efficiency that exists. But there's a real problem is that um, we don't build cities from scratch uh, and we can't easily get that. If we were, um, basically with a little bit of planning, the market would take care of things and we'd have a really efficient city. Um, instead, we build them as we have to on top of existing cities, uh, our, our existing cities, and we build them around them. And so there's these physical and, and institutional legacies that exist and including our past laws and our bylaws and our past plans that really tie us to the past and don't allow us to get to that efficient point. And that's where you see that difference um, of that 8% uh, in terms of savings that could be um, could occur if we manage to implement this plan. So a lot of the effort of 21st century planning is really figuring out how we overcome these past legacies. And, and there's kind of three options. And I want to focus on this because I think it's important in answering why and how this plan uh, can and should go ahead. So the first option is you put in place hard growth boundaries, like we've seen in some other cities. Uh, I don't like these. I think they're largely inefficient. They drive uh, prices up for new home buyers and they push growth out to communities further away. And we see that this really doesn't play a, a very big role in this plan at all. 
Two, uh, you can remove existing institutional legacies, things like the, you know, very old land use bylaw we have through opening up our land use bylaws and streamlining the approvals. By doing that, you make it easier to change the city in a way that aligns with our current interests and, and goals. Um, three, you can directly invest public funding in infrastructure, transportation, and development to facilitate growth as you want to see it in mature areas. Now, Councillor Keene asked a really good question earlier as to why we should put taxpayer dollars into this when we're saying that, you know, new growth on the outskirts should pay for itself. And, and the answer here is pretty straightforward. Um, it's, it's because when we rebuild our city in a form that improves urban efficiency, it makes the city more efficient for everybody. And it makes it, the city more efficient for all taxpayers and for everybody uh, who lives here. And so uh, not just in terms of its efficiency, but it actually we all use these nodes and corridors. And so they benefit everyone. So there's, there is a reason for investing into these areas um, beyond the fact that new people are going to live in them. So um, city plan concentrates all of this. It, it concentrates the public investment and the rezoning. So it gets the rezoning in line with the public investment. And then that opens it up for the public sector or the private sector to come in and fill in the development. And a lot of this overcomes a past problem in Edmonton's development that I've I've sometimes labeled everywhereism, where we try to do everything everywhere with the same level of effort and without any concentration. So I like the concentration of this plan. Um, there's lots of other things I could speak to, but I'm aware of the time limits. Um, but uh, the 15 minute neighborhood idea is great. It'll be tough to implement, but something we should move to. Uh, the recognition that the plan needs to be flexible is critically important. Past plans, our 1967 plan failed because 20 years later it was no longer relevant, so it kind of collapsed. Um, so the flexibility is really key, and I think every five years we need to be kind of looking at this, and every 10 years, uh, as planned, redeveloping it. But I'll leave it there. Uh, it's a good plan. I hope you all support it, and um, I look forward to seeing it implemented. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Summers. Questions? Councillor Walters, go ahead. So... Uh, so, Dr. Summers, just to clarify, because I'm going to uh, miss, when you're talking about the second and third options that you described, were you, you, you were, what I heard you say, as a preference for the second one, uh, but to some degree, uh, support of the third one. M maybe not no. including uh, or, or investing in development, per se, but investing in amenities that would attract private sector. Yeah. So, so just to clarify, I, I, I should have made it clear, but actually, I think this city plan does both number two and number three quite effectively, and I think they're both necessary for an effective uh, redevelopment, uh, and that they're justified because of the value to the entire city um, that, that we get from it. So investing in infrastructure, as we heard from some of our earlier speakers, either partially or, or in whole, depending upon um, what's determined, uh, but also investing in amenities. As we get density, there should be amenity with density, right? So if you're living somewhere and the density increases, you should see the amenity of the area increase. And, and of course, in most cases, it's up to the, the, uh, the, the public sector to provide many of those amenities. So I think that's, that's really key, uh, that those two um, are a way that I think we can go forward. So number two and three. So number two being opening up where necessary uh, our land use to be more flexible. And number three being investing in those areas with public funding to support the growth as it comes forward. So then just to get a little more precise on the sort of last half of the third point, which was not, not just investing in the transportation or public realm amenities, but being involved in development itself. Maybe opine a little bit on to what degree you think the municipality should be engaged as a developer in things. You know, the obvious example these days is Blatchford, where we have, you know, significant we're trying to meet a lot of objectives with that piece of land versus just ensuring that the density, in fact, the, the redevelopment occurs uh, via the private sector and we achieve the density, which has a significant environmental benefit as well. So maybe comment on the degrees to which you think it's wise for a city to be involved in development versus just incentivizing development through those public realm investments. That's almost that's a, a tough question. I'll do my best to uh, to respond to it. Um, 
So I'm a, I'm a fan of markets. I often lean towards market-based solutions. So that means incentivizing things, particularly we, we see, for example, on 104th uh, downtown, you know, many years ago uh, when that area was, was in pretty rough shape, there was a development incentive put in place per door and that incentivized things like the Icon Tower to come along. You know, in terms of Blatchford or those types of developments, I think that they're um, they're unusual or, or not unusual. I shouldn't say that um, they're new to our city, uh, large developments led by the public sector, but in cities around the world, uh, some of these have been very successful. And I think that, um, you know, without making a, a really firm statement on that, I think that, uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm very optimistic that it'll be an outstanding development. Um, it's always challenging, especially with market conditions to move something forward. What I will say though, is I do think there's room in areas of the city, you know, when we're trying to, when there's an area that, that currently is, you know, really lacks amenity, lacks any development, perhaps the extreme case is, is the Fort Road area development. Those areas I don't think are going to go ahead um, very quickly without some initial amenity. And we, we saw the investment in public infrastructure. There may be a case to be made that some initial structures uh, supported or probably supported by the city could help launch a place like that forward. It, the question is, is whether we want to invest there. And that's a question that I can't answer. It's something that council has to consider in the administration. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for Dr. Summers? Oh, Councilor Banga, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Summers, uh, you talked about uh, incentives and uh, investment. When uh, a developer develops something in a newly, I guess, new area, their uh, greenfield development, they take care of uh, building the roads and they also pitch in some money. There is a possibility into uh, creating a recreation center or whatever the case may be. Uh, so most of the, that development or incentive in development is uh, taken up by, by the new developer. But when we are uh, going to do, uh, I guess, development in the, in the already existing areas, who is responsible? Why would anybody would want to invest anything in there, in the new areas? I mean, older areas. Okay, so just to, I, I think I get the, the, the basic of the, of the question is in, in a new area, many of the costs are paid for by developers. And, and so why should that be different in an existing uh, mature neighborhood? Is that, is, yep. is that the basic? Okay, so the, the reason is, is that when someone develops a, a, new, um, a new development on the edge of a city, that's generally good for the city but most of the benefits are captured by the people who live in that area. Of course, we all benefit generally from new growth in our city um, and from, from new people, new employment and things like that. But the vast majority of the benefit of that is captured by the people who live in that neighborhood or experienced by the people who live in that neighborhood or even the businesses who open there. Um, when you take areas of, of, of mature neighborhoods or, or the core, um, particularly if you think of areas like downtown, White Avenue, 124th. In these areas, as they redevelop and densify and we have improved public transit efficiency, we're making better use of existing resources in the city, um, what we see is that this is good for the city as a whole. Um, I, I think downtown is one of the best examples. Um, most really, really great cities and thriving cities have fantastic downtowns. And it doesn't matter if you live in a suburban area or if you live in the downtown, you, there's some benefits to that for the entire city. Uh, the other thing that I'll note is that existing areas of the city have, have ex more challenges than building in new suburban locations. That's why they're more expensive. And if we don't want to have a city where the outskirts is highly developed and the core of the city um, you know, is, is less developed, lower density, uh, experiencing issues of decay, you have to invest. Now, Edmonton has been investing in the core of the city. Uh, we've seen things uh, like the Arena District and other things that have involved city actors. This helps keep the city 
a, a vibrant place for, for all residents. So that's the justification for investing public funds uh, for developments in the mature neighborhoods in the core of the city. Okay, so uh, uh, 40 years ago, uh, when I first moved to Edmonton, there, uh, there was uh, downtown was the only place to go. And then about five years later, uh, I mean, from today, White Avenue is the is the area where people love to gather. Is it not just uh, the city didn't uh, do anything it themselves? It just market. Didn't the market manage? No, absolutely not. So you know, if if you look at the stories of any successful area of any city, and if you look at Edmonton, for example, so if you look at Old Strathcona. And you go back right to 1980 when that place was when, when Old Strathcona, when White Avenue was in really rough shape. First of all, there was an entire citizens group that formed uh, to organize there. So that's that's not market and it's not public. It's uh, and it's the NGO sector essentially uh, working. Uh, groups came together to help revitalize and to lobby the city. The city put in a good bit of the funding. Uh, to revitalize the street at that time. Indeed, some of the um, NGOs bought buildings and redeveloped them because they were in such bad shape, including saving the Princess Theatre. So that's one example of how multiple actors come together, not just market forces. If we look at downtown over the last few decades, um, if, uh, if you go downtown now, actually, uh, even during COVID, actually, um, but before COVID, in the summer, if you went downtown, it's getting to be a vibrant place. I lived there 15 years ago and there was nobody there. Um, but it's quite vibrant now and that's because of changes to city bylaws. It's because of the things like the investment in 104th uh, where there were both the redevelopment of the street and I see my time's almost up, but redevelopment of the street as well as um, things like the, the funding for new developers to go in. Uh, I think it was uh, $4,000 per door that was given when things like the Icon Tower went up. So. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Thank you. Uh, so, Bob, I'd asked that question earlier about because I think we have to figure out how we pay for infrastructure that is required, most of it underground, when we see a density development go into mature neighborhoods. And your argument is there's still collective citywide benefit to that, and therefore should be burdened citywide should be care the cost should be carried citywide so yeah what i what i can say is that there is a so from my expertise i can say that there's collective benefit uh to these types of developments in nodes and corridors um because great nodes and corridors help to make great cities uh, including right. great downtown um and that we all benefit from that now in terms of the mechanisms and mechanics that I don't have the exact expertise in terms of, you know, what portion should be paid for by developer right. or how can the different mechanisms of paying for it um, over time so that the first developer in doesn't bear the burden that prevents them from developing. What we do, I think we can be guilty. I don't think this council has been bad at this at all, but you can start to say, well, why should my part of the city pay for that over there? And, and yet it's, yeah, I, I think that's a <clears throat> I think it's a really interesting point. You make I just want to ask you because you're a planning academic, you probably have some insight in where cities other cities are going. And can you uh, I'm assuming that and so you like this plan and how does it stand out from perhaps what you're seeing in other parts of Canada in particular? I think that this uh, plan, as well as some of the other recent bylaw changes, uh, and hopefully what we're going to see with the land use bylaw, um, helps push Edmonton to be um, one of the leaders in, in, in uh, advancing our city to be a more competitive place to attract individuals to the city and to make it more efficient uh, for new businesses and investors. Um, but I will say that historically, because we haven't had some of the... Um, advantages of some of the, the great districts that some cities have, um, we're coming from behind. So we're being very aggressive, but you know, we, as a prairie city with very low density, uh, we've got a lot of work to do. So, but it, it, it's um, provided we back it up with our land use bylaw changes and continue to, to make the moves that we've been doing, 
uh, I think this will be very good for the city. And, and I'll mention that sometimes um, planners get, you know, trapped in this notion of being just people who think about urban areas. I grew up in the town of Stony Plain. I think people can have fantastic lives in, in the suburbs. I focus a lot on urban efficiency and competitiveness. That's my interest. And I think this makes us a more competitive city and a more efficient city. When you talk about other cities having great districts, we have quite a few emerging, I would argue, yep. from in the north, in the south, all over the place. So 20 years from now, it could look, if we do it right, we could have a lot of great outstanding districts for people wanting to visit. Yes? I, you know what, I agree. And uh, last summer I biked through downtown um, and I was just astonished to see the vibrancy there relative to what was there 10 years ago. And if we can keep that momentum up for another 10, 20 years, um, White Ave, 124th, 118th, uh, and beyond, all all have tremendous potential. Yeah, there's some really cool areas emerging up in the north, uh, Roslyn, and to the north of that. And, of course, Mill Woods has a really cool flavor to it. So, I, yeah, I really look forward to that, too. Um, Bob, and have you – are you um, – Skyping in from Calgary, or are you actually in Edmonton today? I'm in Edmonton. I'm at home. Good to hear. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, you can look that one up. That's a good one. Well, uh, thanks very much, Bob. I, uh, I was um, very grateful to see you registered and looking forward to hearing what you had to say. I have no questions for you, and neither does anybody else here after, after those. So uh, thank you so much for your... Uh, professional expertise um, uh, shared freely with us here today. That's the value of having a planning school. So thanks. Thank uh, you. Next up is uh, Kirsten Goa. All right. Um, hello. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, 12 years ago, or almost 12 years ago, during the last Municipal Development Plan public hearings, um, my eight-year-old daughter specifically asked if she could speak to council. And um, she asked them what she would be able to tell her children about council's decisions at the time on land use, local food, health, and environmental responsibility, in eight-year-old words. There were some important changes made at that time, but this plan now goes much further to answer her questions in a meaningful way. And so first of all, I wanna thank um, council for your leadership in driving this plan and for the incredible dedication of city administration in making sure to take an integrated and evidence-based approach to planning for our future city. So when it comes, first of all, to the market and consumer preference for housing, which has come up a few times, I wanted to reiterate that we do need choices and that we need a lot more of them. Um, we need diverse housing options for diverse households. Every community needs to become more resilient to demographic shifts if our infrastructure, amenities, small businesses, and public services are to be used most efficiently. Um, I have many families living in the high rises behind me, and I've spoken to a few of them who would really like an extra bedroom um, and aren't really sure where they're gonna go. Um, their kids walk a couple blocks, not even, to school every day behind the other direction. Um, I also have friends in the suburbs who'd really like their kids to be able to actually bike to school. So market isn't just a reflection of demand. Um, it is a reflection of supply. And there are certain areas we have very limited supply in terms of housing stock, uh, in terms of the kinds of housing stock. But even more so, it's a reflection of what is literally marketed. How much marketing have you seen for higher density family oriented housing with supporting amenities? Who tells the story of our mature and core neighborhoods? So to extend that, who's going to tell the story of this plan and the decisions that follow? Um, because that will be instrumental in our ability to actually achieve our goals. Secondly, I've said this before, but we need to invest where we want to grow. And this plan shows us how to do that. Um, every decision we make has economic ramifications. Um, as mentioned already today, we have a rather astronomical infrastructure deficit. And the fiscal sustainability of our city is already in jeopardy due to global, national, provincial realities, um, priorities and policies that are outside of our control, but is exacerbated because we continue to externalize the ongoing costs of our growth for many generations. And of course, externalities aren't really external. Um, fundamentally, we're the majority stakeholder in the infrastructure built in our city in new and developing areas, as well as infill. 
amenities like recreation facilities and natural areas, access to work, transportation options, walkability, affordable housing, education, all of these things contribute to our economic, social, and environmental viability. The devil really is in the details. As this plan moves forward, every decision needs to be considered in light of our priorities and the full life cycle costs and return on investment, not only economically, but also environmentally and socially. We need to recognize that the spin-off impacts, not just the immediate line items, um, are going to have an impact. For example, neighborhoods with no amenities have much higher crisis call rates. We pay for that. Um, we pay for the calls, but we also pay for the long-term ramifications for those households that are in crisis. Um, they're not as economically productive. Their kids are at higher risk and the ripple effects are generational. For too long, we've pushed out the long-term costs down the road and fundamentally our kids and us, we can't afford it anymore. Um, so the tensions between business as usual and our economic, social and environmental realities are held in this plan. And the direction provided is supported by rigorous research and modeling. But making these changes won't be easy. It's only as good as the daily decisions we all make. Um, the level of disruption we're facing will only be exacerbated if we don't work with communities, with NGOs, with industry to make these changes. We need your leadership and we need leadership that's empathetic, that's proactive and pragmatic. We need to avoid stoking fear and dog whistles. We have a plan and we have the data to back it up. We know at least some of what's coming, but if we can't meet community where they're at, we're not going to be successful. So, Council needs to actively engage in this change process um, and both initiate and support meaningful conversations in community about what is happening where we live. City administration and community leaders need to be supported in developing the tools, skills and aptitude for navigating challenging conversations with patience, empathy and helping people understand how they can participate in this change, not just feel like it's happening to them. Currently, engagement is project specific and communication tends to be outward only. In order to realize the goals of this plan in a way that supports and develops the capacity in our communities, we need to meet people where they're at. So change is scary. And when it's happening near our homes, in our communities, it feels like an existential threat. The reality is, is that economically, socially, and environmentally, we are facing multiple existential threats. But if we don't meet people where they're at in order to work with them towards this plan, we're not going to be successful in meeting our objectives. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I've, got no, you. I've got you at the five minutes. So <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Ms. Goa. Questions? Councillor is uh, who clicked in first? I just can't see the thing. Councillor Henderson, then Councillor Banga. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested because it's one of the questions I've been sort of waiting to answer, uh, ask because I think and I think you're, you're alluding to it, I wouldn't mind hearing a bit more, that um, part of this question about reinvestment um, in our existing neighborhoods, if we're going to, if we're going to get uh, change in them, um, I think is also because there is a kind of compact we have with the people that are there already. Um, and we haven't spoken a lot about them. Um, and that, uh, that if, you know, that if, if you're going to, uh, uh, Create, create the, the conditions for the kind of change in neighborhoods that pre-exist, that, that you need to put something on the table, I think, as well for the people that are already there. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you can speak to that a little bit, because I think it's the other piece of this question about why, why we would reinvest um, in some of our existing neighborhoods. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things that, I, I, there's so many examples even just um, in my own community, you know, when we already when we already live somewhere, we don't really want it to change. And then when change is coming, you know, that change does bring some risks. Um, and we, and as as Dr. Summers pointed out, like we also need amenities that actually support the change and support the density. Or we're not going to actually get the goals. Get to the even if we have more people, we're not going to achieve the density goals. Um, the the benefits of the density. So you know. Um, Issues like, you know, retrofitting 99th Street, like we have the development community talking about this in some proposals for like widening sidewalks and making sure that they're more walkable and that there's places for people to sit and that we can actually create those sort of public realm improvements. Um, things like the Rolling Miles Rec Center. We have, you know, 
um, all of these communities getting um, more and more development proposals, but we're going to, we're at risk of losing a number of our core recreation facilities. And those do cost a lot of money. And, you know, on, as a budget line item, there's an expense, but at the same time, we need to be looking at the social, environmental health implications and recognizing that there's a return on investment there in the long haul. And it would, and again, those conversations are really important as part of the scaffolding for communities when we're trying to wrestle with how our neighborhoods are going to change and what kinds of things we want to protect and enhance um, and that can actually be brought into the conversation. And then also with the kinds of risks that we want to mitigate in order to protect the things we love the most about our communities while also embracing the change that we need to see happen. So what do you, in, you know, because I, I, I think it's important, and I, you know, this has been a long time struggle for us about how to do this. But any thoughts on, uh, any thoughts on, I guess, any questions about what may be missing in our language here about how we make sure that happens? Because I, I think I agree with you. The objective has to be to make sure at the end of the day we have better neighborhoods. Um, that they may be mm -hmm. different, but that they're better. So what what are the key ingredients to making sure we get there? In terms of the. Um, in of the I guess neighborhood in itself or the conversation? Well, I guess in terms of the discussion, the conversation, I mean, we're looking at this from a very high level right now and, and to make sure that we have those pieces in the plan, I guess is the question that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it, it, yeah. it's one thing to just say we're going to do it and here we're going to plunk these down in a certain place. What do we need to make sure that um, that, that also recognizes the um, the, the uh, Making making the neighborhood better and not, not yeah. just yeah. And, so, and who, and who um, gets to adjudicate that? I suppose is the other question. Wow, well, and that's and that's I think where um, making sure that we're having proactive conversations and the administration's really supported in this, and that industry gets to the table on it as well. Um, I really think we need to be having those conversations in community about like all of the trade-offs, you know, what does it actually cost for us to live where we live? How much are we paying? Um, what is it? People talk a lot about the things they fear and it's usually the same seven or eight things, regardless of the level of development and regardless of where it is. Um, and, and those things are valid and those fears are valid. Um, and we need to spend some time dealing with and, and, and actually responding effectively to that anxiety but then we also need to talk about what we love about our communities and want to protect. And you know, so much of the time people talk about, they love that they know their neighbors. I'm like, okay, so we want to enhance neighborliness. Well, we can do that by making sure that the setbacks are at an appropriate distance to increase social interaction. We can do that by widening sidewalks and making things, places more accessible. We can do that by making sure we have granular retail and amenity spaces. Um, and then, you know, green space, people love their green space and, and parks, especially if it's designed in a way that actually connects people. And so once we can have those conversations, um, there's ways of beginning to integrate those values and those priorities into um, the change conversation in a way that helps people shape it rather than just reacting in opposition to something. Great. Thanks. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Goa, you made a couple of very interesting comments. Uh, first was uh, diverse housing options, and then you made a comment about uh, uh, market is not just a reflection of demand, it's also a reflection of supply. Would you be able to comment on this, if the supply is not there, mm -hmm. what would uh, the consumer do? So, well, yeah, so I, I spent a lot of time talking with families who were wanting to, like they're about to have a baby or they're having their third or something like that and live in, um, they want to stay close to the core or, or even want to just be closer to a school or that sort of thing. Um, but especially in the core neighborhoods and mature neighborhoods, they can't afford a house in my neighborhood. They live, again, the family's living in this apartment building. You know, we have two bedroom units, but as their kids are sharing right now, and as they get older and they're teenagers, they know that sharing is going to be really not a very easy thing for them to do. And they keep looking for what 
where they could go, but they can't afford a house in my neighborhood. But, you know, maybe they could afford a three bedroom, but so often I hear, well, three bedrooms don't sell. I'm like, well, that's because they're mostly penthouses, you know? <laughs> um, so things like, um, and then in terms of any kind of development, and this is more costly and there's some ramifications to this. And so it, it's not, you know, simple, but um, having multiple different types of housing within one building means that you can create a community that, again, we don't drive tenancy in terms of our built form, but we can't, or our zoning or any of those things, but we can design for diversity. So a three bedroom can hold three students, but it can also have a family with two kids. It can also be a multi-generational household with grandparents and a kid and a parent. Um, there's, there are flex, so there's, when there's more flexibility, you can have more different types of households living in an environment. And of course, when we don't have supply, like again, three bedroom apartments um, or even townhouses or um, stacked row houses, that sort of thing. There's a real lack of that type of housing in our core mature neighborhoods um, amongst many other kinds of housing. But um, without an adequate supply, we can't assess the market. And when all we do is market single family ground oriented development in the suburbs, um, of course, that's what everyone wants to buy because it's what they think they should buy because we keep marketing it to them. And it's, and for many folks, it's what they, what they want to. And, and it's a very reasonable thing for them to do. But for those who want to live some, live somewhere more central or want a different lifestyle, um, there's a real lack of uh, housing supply in that, in that missing middle, slightly larger unit, kind of mix. No, you wouldn't have no argument from me if uh, somebody wants to live close to downtown or core and uh, they can mm -hmm. do so. My only uh, question is that if, I don't know where you live, but uh, my only question to you is if they cannot afford in your neighborhood, where would they be able to afford a house? I mean, all, everybody wants a house. Yeah. Well, and so, I mean, I know, I know a number of families who've moved from the core or mature neighborhoods to, uh, to new developing areas, um, or even just to an older neighborhood that's further out. Um, they've moved to, they've driven until they could qualify for their mortgage, right? Um, but I also know that a number of them, and again, some of this is anecdotal, but we also have some research on it, um, have actively looked, um, for either rental or condo type apartments um, or row housing options that would be bring the price point down for them so that they could stay in the communities where they live. Same thing with seniors who want to downsize. Um, lots of seniors who live in existing single family homes are wanting to have less house or less yard, but they want to stay in their communities and they're really often struggling to find something that meets their needs because my neighborhood has more apartments and condos and that sort of thing. I'm in Strathcona, but especially in, but even here, um, you know, it, there isn't as much as people necessarily are looking for the kinds of things they're looking for. And, um, you know, in a number of other areas, like I just remember a lot of conversations up saying gold bar Capilano where, where there were seniors saying like, yeah, well, we're just staying because we don't want to move out of the neighborhood, but there's nowhere for us to go. So this, this impacts multiple different demographics in terms of the evolution of our housing choices. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Banga and Ms. Goa for um, those comments and questions and answers. Um, any other questions for Ms. Goa? Uh, I remember your daughter's testimony, so say hi to her for me. Um, I will. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, thank last, you. last but not least, unless anyone else has registered in favor, have we had other registrations? We do have one, and okay. I believe they're on the meet. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's go to Miss Solez, the uh, Friends of Scona Rec, and then we'll see if uh, it looks like we've got one more in favor. Um, so we should be able to finish with those in favor, at least, uh, those in opposition, please stand by as we might get started with you here tonight too, depends how it goes. So, um, uh, but next up, uh, is Ms. Solez from the Friends of Scona Rec.
Okay, I, I think I figured out the unmute. It was uh, trying to get away on me there. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Iverson and uh, councillors. And I'm very grateful that uh, council time allowed me to uh, speak today. I thought that I wasn't going to be able to be able to. And I believe you received something in writing from me uh, this morning. Uh, the city plan has some uh, very excellent concepts for preparing Edmonton for growth and maintaining and improving livability. It organizes the city into districts that provide all the services and amenities residents readily, regularly need and want within a 15 minute bus or bike ride, employment, groceries, banking, parks, recreation, entertainment, restaurants, um, all the things that make up a complete community. It also identifies major and minor nodes and corridors in Edmonton along major transportation corridors, collector roads, transit centers, and LRT stations. These nodes and corridors are the focus for higher density residential development and higher intensity commercial and employment areas. Um, and these will uh, be beneficial uh, to the city for its, its growth. And these are very useful ways to approach the growth and functioning of the city from the perspective of Edmonton residents as well, because if you can get around and get most of what you need without going a great distance, it, it improves the efficiency, not only of the city, but uh, efficiency of residents. Um, a project that the community in my part of town has been working on for a number of years, a recreation center at Rolly Miles District Park near Strathcona High School, aligns very well with these directions. For the Scona District, a rec facility at Rolling Mills Park will help make nearby neighborhoods and the district all overall into a complete community. The other rec centers in the district, Kinsman at the north and Confed on the west, west side near the southern boundary are outside the 15 minute range for many residents. A rec center in Rolling Mills Park near the east boundary and about halfway between the north and southern boundaries would help achieve that 15 minute standard for all residents in this rapidly densifying area. 104th Street, which turns into Calgary Trail, um, is a major arterial in the Scona district and is identified as a major corridor in the city plan. It runs along the eastern, bo eastern boundary of Rolling Miles Park. A rec center at that park, easily accept accessible from this busy road, would help intensify development in the corridor as well as serve the 33,000 commuters that use the corridor on a daily basis. Currently, the existing Scona Pool, the city's oldest pool that is reaching the end of its useful life, is a four-lane pool with a dive tank and a small multi-purpose room. The rec center at the park, on the other hand, would be a more intense development with an eight-lane pool, a larger multi-purpose room, a gym, space for adult and kids exercise equipment and an outdoor basketball court that would be flooded for skating in winter. So that uh, rec center would benefit the residents and also achieve, um, fit in and achieve what uh, the city plan is aiming for. Currently, our organization is working with city admin and developers in the area to explore alternate funding approaches and sources of funding for rec centers in addition to city funding using Rolling Miles as a pilot. This work fits into the city's reimagined discussions about delivery of city services going forward in COVID times and post pandemic. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Solis. Questions? Not seeing any. Um, thank you very much for your submission. Um, and I'm glad we were able to fit you in today. Who was the other registrant? Uh, Mr. Rickett is on the line. Okay. Do we have a first name for Mr. Rickett? Jim, my apologies. Jim, Jim from Gold Bar Park Alliance. Right. Uh, okay, so there's Mr. Rickett. Welcome. Great. Thank you, Councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Go ahead. Much appreciated. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. You're coming through great. Okay, you got great. five yeah. minutes. Go ahead. Fantastic. First, let me um, join many of the other speakers in thanking our city administration for their hard work and dedication in completing the draft city plan. Uh, I've been asked to attend today's meeting and speak on behalf of Gold Bar Park Alliance 
and the citizens, uh, 10 stakeholder organizations and provincial representatives who are partnering with our city council and city administration to ensure that impactful sanitary sewage trunk line routing decisions are made with appropriate city council oversight, transparency and public input. Today, I'm here to speak in support of item 2.1.3 of the draft city plan. Item 2.1.3 indicates that development occurs in an orderly and safe manner to protect the public health and the quality of life of the environment. We support this item because it supports the widespread support for continuation of the 20 year plan to construct the South Edmonton Sanitary Sewage Trunk Line and the associated sewage volumes to the planned Alberta Capital Region Wastewater Treatment Commission facility. Constructed in 1985 with provincial support, the Alberta Capital Region Wastewater Treatment Facility is sited an exceptional one kilometer from the nearest residential zoning, more than three times greater than the current provincial minimum standards and requirements for setback distances. Alternatively, the Gold Bar Wastewater Treatment Plant is sited a mere 90 meters from the closest residential home, resulting in significant public health and quality of life concerns con for citizens. We know that one of the most important and basic functions of government is to protect citizens from the environmental impacts of industrial activity. <clears throat> In addition, item 2.1.3, just gonna pull this up here one moment, um, uh, indicates, so 2.1.3.3 uh, says that, of the city plan says that we will manage risk associated with heavy industry, oil and gas facilities, pipelines, railway corridors, utilities and utility corridors through the provision of adequate buffers, separation, our setback distances and effective transit zones. Uh, so managing risk with setback distance is critically important when making a decision on uh, sanitary uh, sewage uh, trunk line uh, routing and associated sewage expansion. So we know that um, the approval to operate sewage treatment facilities is provided by the province and a provincial government has to approve uh, future sewage expansion at a facility. And one of the items ways in which we can manage risk is supported by 2.1.3.3 by citing future sewage expansion to a facility that meets and greatly exceeds all of the current provincial standards and requirements. Thank you for the opportunity today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Rickett? Not seeing any, then a comprehensive presentation. Um, thank you very much. So, um, <clears throat> before we move on to the speakers in opposition, or is it the end of the hearing you want me to? Okay, so we'll, we'll start to hear then from uh, speakers registered in opposition, and then I'll have uh, a couple of uh, comments. Um, actually, maybe I'll offer it just now in case folks begin to drop off uh, for any reason. So um, this so this will apply equally to those who are uh, have spoken in favor and those who have registered in opposition. Um, the public hearing on the city plan will continue tomorrow afternoon at 1.30 with any speakers still to be heard and then with questions of administration. Following this though, and this is what I want to flag, there will be an opportunity to speak to any new information which may have arisen during the public hearing. So if at any point between now and the conclusion of questions of administration you determine that you would like to speak to new information, please contact the Office of the City Clerk at city.clerk at edmonton.ca or 780-496-8178 and they will make arrangements for you so we can accommodate the new information. So just uh, letting you know when the new information opportunity and how, how to take advantage of it will be, um, will unfold. So uh, now we will uh, hear from uh, Jason Pazeski from the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Welcome, Jason. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, uh, Jason Pazeski from the Accessibility Advisory Committee, uh, along with all the others who came before me. I'd like to thank City Council for continuing ahead with this uh, this work in these unprecedented times and for making accommodations for all of us to uh, present to you. Uh, the AAC had a chance to review the draft city plan. 
for you today. Uh, and I would like to commend my own members for uh, working hard through the pandemic uh, with many unique stresses in their lives to uh, provide feedback and critique uh, of the plan that is before you today. We have submitted a 16-page comprehensive memo uh, to City Clerk's Office. I'm not sure, 100% sure if that's made it for you yet, but hopefully it does uh, by the end of the day or tomorrow uh, to flesh out perhaps a little more of our comments here today. Uh, but basically, I've taken a few highlights myself. Uh, Tanya, who is going to speak right after me, has taken a few highlights uh, of our comments as well. And we just want to flag some of what we think are the bigger issues. Um, but to summarize, after reading the draft city plan, the AAC is not convinced that accessibility was an integral concern of the city's vision as it grows to a city of 2 million. Uh, these concerns are magnified because of the passage of policy C602 uh, last year, which was meant to enshrine the principle that Edmonton was to be a uh, global leader in accessibility. So for my part, I'm going to focus on transit, uh, mobility, and employment. So the biggest one from my perspective that I'll talk about is transit. Um, and so in uh, there's a subheading, uh, it's called transit networks, it's at page 114. And it discusses three orders of transit in our city as it grows. Uh, mass transit, citywide routes, and district routes. Uh, the AAC recommends that the, uh, an adoption of a fourth order of transit, being paratransit or accessible transit, whatever you would like to phrase it, because uh, in our reading of that 17 pages, there's no reference anywhere to DAS, to paratransit, to accessible taxes, to anything uh, other than what reads to us as, you know, ETS buses, LRT, uh, and what those mean to people. But of course, uh, there's a whole other uh, integrated segment of transit uh, for people who cannot use standard transit. Um, and so we would, uh, we drafted up a proposed uh section for what that, that might be. Uh, happy to, uh, to, to workshop that or to hear uh, admin's feedback, but we felt it was a critical flaw of that section that there's no reference and uh, did a quick, you know, keyword find in, in the document. There's no reference to paratransit, to DATS, to uh, disabled uh, adult transit systems, kind of nothing of that order in the entire 182 page document, which seems an oversight to the AAC. Um, so that's the one of the big ones we would I'd like to bring your attention. And then another big one I want to bring to your attention is uh, kind of issues of employment. And this is brought up in a few areas. There's kind of a standalone section uh, in the 130, 130 page 130 area, uh, and as well as the, the guiding principles, uh, I believe under the thriving heading. Uh, basically, the theme of these sections is that Edmonton wants to be, you know, a city that attracts talent from around the world, uh, you know, talk to your talent. And I think the AAC's comments are, not I think, they are, that the city of Edmonton should be ensuring that the talent within this city is properly employed. There are very good statistics about the underemployment of disabled citizens, and not just in Edmonton, the world over. Uh, and I think it would be of great benefit to this city uh, to, you know, uh, execute its own initiatives or to partner with other organizations to make sure that all Edmontonians um, are able to seek gainful employment uh, in convenient locations um, uh, and able to access that employment uh, from across the city. Uh, and my time is... Uh, quickly slipping through the hourglass, so I will leave it there for you. I don't know if you want to hear Tanya first and then talk to both of us, but I'll leave that up to uh, the council. Thank that, you. That would, of course, be easier, but uh, but the Municipal Government Act requires us to uh, to hear from people in, at one at a time in series. Um, Understood. Uh, um, so so uh, uh, thank you for that presentation, though, and I'm sure there will be some questions. Councillor Knack, go ahead. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you very much, Mr. Pseski, for for coming. I know you had to uh, postpone the Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting so that you speak right now. The the meeting's supposed to be happening as <laughs> at this time. Yes. Uh, I guess the the big question, and, and I and I got the letter, but we got it four hours ago, so I haven't read through everything uh, in full. Although obviously, there's been some work uh, in attending some of the meetings. The most general question is, I know the city plan team had been engaging with the Accessibility Advisory Committee during this process um, at, at different times. I, I think there were a couple of different presentations, if I recall, or maybe just one. I, I, do, do you remember? So we, we, when we got the document, we were a little surprised by it, and we went back through our records as best we could, yeah. um, and we couldn't we couldn't find any indication that they came to present to us. Um, all we could really find was what was called a, a coffee chat with one of our members, um, which, and it wasn't me, uh, and that member is no longer on the board, uh, on the committee, sorry, but I take it, it was more kind of an informal, you know, what we'd yeah. like to see in this as opposed to uh, getting down to uh, nuts and bolts and, and what's okay. in here. And I do, and I think I must be thinking of the coffee chat because I think I remember that was supposed to happen and there was an invite to any member that could attend, but for a variety of reasons, there was only one person able to attend. So all of which to, to ask is that, you know, you, you read through it, you, you've received the document, you reached out. Um, what's been the, the sort of feedback on the suggestions you've presented? I'm, I'm curious if the, if the feedback's been generally positive and we can easily make these changes or if this requires a bit more of a, uh, a well, just more additional work to make sure they're all added in uh, thoroughly. Um, probably that final option. To be blunt, the pandemic uh, threw a bit of a, a wrench in us. We have been doing our best to, to work through it without admin support. Um, the long and the short of it is, is that they did not receive our very detailed comments. We did offer to provide them something uh, maybe two, three weeks ago, but by that point it was just, it was too late. Um, sure. And so we have not heard uh, their full feedback on, on our comments, uh, unfortunately. Okay. So. No, that's, that's fine. And, and I, I understand that the time constraints and the fact that there hasn't been any uh, resourcing for the committee. So it's all, everyone's been doing it just off the side of their desks uh, as, as best they can. So what I'll do, and I, and I know we'll have uh, Tanya speaking as well, is I'll make sure to ask about your very detailed feedback during the questions uh, once we get into that probably tomorrow. So I'll go through the sort of point by point with, with them. That's my commitment I'll make to you and, and see if we there's a way to to address what you, what you flagged, or at least get some feedback as to why why uh, it is the way it's designed right now. So thank you very much. Very much obliged. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Przeski? Not hearing any. Then next up is uh, Tonya La Riviere. Welcome. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I'm the current chair of the Policy Subcommittee with the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Um, and I'm going to start with um, talking, well, I'm going to be talking about accessible housing, but I'm going to start with the heading I want to belong and contribute. Um, in this plan, heading 1.0, I want to belong and contribute. This section deals with community wellness, supporting diversity, and promoting equality and quality of life for marginalized communities included our newcomers, women, girls, gender minorities, and seniors. The AAC feels strongly that a new item should be included, addressing specific concerns faced by the disabled community. Our opening proposal is as follows. 1.1.5, ensure individuals with disabilities have equitable access to information, services, programs, activities and infrastructures. And I'm going to read some of the suggested sub items as these should be represented um, in this plan. Um, broaden the scope of communication technology methods and services to facilitate those with disabilities. Apply a universally accessible lens to the design and application of programs and services. Ensure employment opportunities and accommodations can be made for people with disabilities. Partner with external agencies to determine accessibility, needs, and best practices. Ensure the needs of people with disabilities are reflected in policy, 
and ensure new developments and infrastructure are universally accessible. Um, we are concerned that this city plan did not address accessible housing in a manner in which it should. Item 1.2.2 discusses creating vibrant and inclusive communities. We feel strongly that a new sub-item is required re addressing the need for accessible and visitable housing. To this point, we propose a new sub-item, encourage the development of accessible and visitable homes in new and existing neighborhoods. The city can't attain its goal of having inclusive communities without accessible and visible home options. Item 1.33 directly discusses addressing the root cause of poverty, but the sub-items which follow do not mention disability and the impacts that can have on creating and maintaining homelessness and poverty. The AAC is proposing a sub-item recognize the links between poverty, homelessness, and disability and ensure that housing and services are accessible for all. Under the heading 2.0, I want to live in a place that feels like home. This section of the city addresses the design of communities, ensuring Edmontonians feel safe and secure, housing options, and the trajectory of Edmonton's growth. We would like to take this opportunity to specifically highlight the absence of any mention of accessible housing in this section. The city plan discusses affordable housing, and we understand that City Council has instructed administration to focus on affordable housing but we would like to encourage City Council to reconsider their stance on pursuing affordable housing as a standalone goal and to in instead expand their vision to accessible and affordable housing. And lastly, under performance measurement reporting, the item inclusive and compassionate. To be so, it's vital to have new standards of development to include equitable availability to accessible housing. We would like to see an inclusion under stretch targets to ensure housing is access accessible for all, and an inclusion under strategic measures to improve building requirements, codes, and standards for accessible housing. We'd be pleased to discuss our suggestions and concerns with admin. We hope to incorporate the voice and well-being of people with disabilities into this plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions for Mr. <laughs> Riviere? Okay, looks like probably addressed in the in the previous um, exchange with Mr. Pizeski then, but I I, I will just say that um, the this committee provides really important feedback on all policy development, and this is perhaps our most important uh, encapsulating document of of our policy, and so uh, I'll commit to follow up as well, and. Um, uh, so, so thank you both um, on behalf of uh, the advisory committee uh, for providing us this feedback and a very thorough document uh, that, that we'll have a chance to, to take a look through and um, uh, share with the administration as well for some commentary when we get into questions. So, so thank you both very much for your presentation. Uh, it looks like we've got time for one or two more. Um, Linda Duncan is next. Okay, am I on? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, Mayor Iveson and Council. Um, <laughs> I just noticed that somebody's been tweeting how nasty I am because I'm, a, I'm against the, the policy and against densifying our city. So perhaps those people who are watching might want to wait and hear what I have to say. Um, when uh, I was asked, am I for or against, I said, well, I like some of it, some of I don't. And she said, well, if you go on the, on the year against, you can hear everybody else first. So that's what I opted for. <laughs> so anyway, as many have said, I commend everybody who has worked on this. And to tell you the truth, I have found listening in all day absolutely fantastic. We've got amazing people in our city who have a lot to contribute. And uh, there's two aspects of this uh, policy bylaw. And I see uh, Councillor Neck. <laughs> it's smiling at me because you're wondering what I'm going to talk about. Um, there are two aspects that I'm concerned about. The first part is I see no mention in this entire policy about our community leaks. The second part that I want to talk about is a part, and I really am happy that there is a big part of this policy on protecting our river valley ravines and natural areas, but I have some concerns about putting that into reality. So in the first part, 
on our community leagues um, is kind of surprising given the fact, um, I even mentioned this in the House of Commons when I was an elected member of Parliament, how proud I am of our community leagues, and it's something unique in this country. And yet there's no mention whatsoever in this policy. Um, it talks all about, uh, you know, as the administration said at the beginning, the policy is about putting people first. Uh, people want to live in a place that feels like home. They want to preserve what's important. Um, I looked at the consultation feedback, and it said that Canadian uh, Edmontonians want to the city to work with communities to protect their distinct communities. Uh, for redevelopment, we should ensure it fits with the character of the neighborhoods, maintain our city's strong sense of community, and consider the role and wishes of current, current residents who live in and contribute to the communities. And a number of people have said that, uh, including Kirsten. Let's not forget about the voice of the people who are already in the areas that we might want to redevelop or, or make slightly more dense. Um, I would appreciate if council would revisit this policy and see if there's some way that we can at least mention the community leagues because they've always been the mechanism for providing feedback and engagement and consultation. And it's a really efficient, and they say that, that we want the new way of working is efficient. It is one model that we can work with people. One aspect of the plan that kind of disturbed me when I went through it quickly is that it kind of reduces my community um, of Old Strathcona and Mill Creek to a transport node. And I know that people are really worried about that because uh, 99th Street transects our very active community. And on one side is the creek and a lot of ho homes. And on the other side are 99th are the schools and, and the shops. And it's always a struggle. And I know this is gonna be the same in a lot of communities where you've got main corridors or even small corridors how do you maintain the sense of community and safety, and particularly for kids going back and forth? I also noticed in the designation of districts, um, Scona District, some it makes sense, except that they forget that there's a huge interaction on both sides of Mill Creek Ravine. And so Bonnie Doon and, uh, and Richie and, uh, and Strathcona and so forth all work together. So I'm a little bit worried about us just drawing lines on a map um, and looking at the city as transportation nodes. Um, I share the views of a good number of people, having worked at the Social Planning Council, um, of battling against engineering and transportation. So I would appreciate if council can just stand back from this policy and think about that and the sensitivity. Um, some people have talked about, um, we need to make sure that people feel comfortable with change. There's a lot of people in my community right now who are extremely stressed because of proposals for 20 story, um, eight story and so forth buildings going in and what the implications are going to be for our area. So that's what I wanted to essentially say about that part of the plan. Um, I think that uh, overall uh, it looks great. I'm glad there's lots of emphasis on, on climate change and being more efficient and so forth. But the bylaw itself says that we're a community of communities and yet I'm not really seeing that coming forward front and center. So I think that's really what's special about Edmonton is that we are a community of communities and uh, we need to make sure that even when we're expanding and so forth, we recognize that. I want to move on quickly though to the River Valley and Ravines. Thank you very much for that big part of the policy. Um, as some of you are aware, I at one time was the chair of the Natural Area Advisory Council. I was deeply saddened when that was canceled. And in fact, the whole separate segment of administration uh, the uh, the uh, natural areas um, group was disbanded. We actually produced a conservation policy, which council adopted, and it was supposed to guide uh, the development and the protection of our of our ravine areas and our natural areas, and making sure there's connectivity. So I'm a little bit worried in reading this, is as if we have to start over or at the beginning. So I'm hoping that that hard work ha hasn't been forgotten. I would like to encourage that there actually be reference to that conservation policy, presuming it still e exists in this document. Um, I would like you to seriously think about restoring that important citizen-led advisory council because I think it, it made our decisions on ravines grounded. As you're well aware, there are a number of citizens groups in each of our ravines that are very active in trying to protect. And you know we've got keepers of the creek. 
One thing that I'm worried about is one thing to talk about and draw green lines on the map, but where's the investment? So I want to see commitment in this policy that we are generally going to make sure that we start investing and protecting. I was down Sorry, in Mill Miss, Creek. Uh, Miss Duncan, I'll get you to wrap up if you can, because we're okay. just at the five um, minutes here. I, I, I really, really, uh, I'm happy that that part of the of the policy is there, and I would love to take questions on my concerns of what I see in the policy on on our ravine areas. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Yeah, I wasn't going to ask about that. Sorry, Linda. I wanted to ask you about community leagues. Okay. I'm a fan uh, of what they've done for Edmonton. So, what it, do you have suggestions as to? Um, how we would include community leagues in the plan, placement, or or what your suggestion is? Do we just acknowledge the integral relationship between city hall and community leagues, and uh, or what do you think? Well, even if that is mentioned in the beginning part, I mean, there's this whole history of the development of the city in in direct. Uh, consultation with the community leagues and as a mechanism moving forward so that as we make changes uh, we are sensitive um, to those areas in consultation with the communities. I think it I think it sends a really strong message of how different our city is and it's a really uh, democratization of the path forward. I will uh, undertake to ask those questions when we get to administration. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Um, I was, and I just so I can ask this question of you, and I'll ask it later of administration. I'm I'm interested in the point you make about um, about the district boundaries. Um, I had, I guess, in my mind, assumed that they were fuzzy boundaries, not hard boundaries, because I think no matter where you put them, you're going to run into that problem um, of drawing a line. You know, there's some places where you have impenetrable barriers. There's other places you don't. Um, so if 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 the idea is a kind of fuzzy description of a place that exists, um, does that would that give you a little bit more confidence about the concept of them? Um, once you put try, once you put lines in a map, I think that becomes pretty definitive. All that I'm worried about is if that's the way that's going to be. When the say, for example, uh, the city decide, administration decides that they're going to do some major changes in uh, the Scona district. Uh, or in across the ravine in that other district. It could have implications for our area and are we going to be notified? So I just want to get, might want to get some thought to what do you really mean Fair by enough. those districts? Yeah. I'm I, not opposed to it, but. Yeah, in, in my mind, they were a way of trying to sort of put some idea around the 15, but I, the 15 minute kind of rule about being able to get to cores and centers and that each district needed to have that kind of, I mean, I, my concern is some of them are bigger than the 15 minute rule. Um, but uh, but I, I will ask that question because I think it's, you know, I think if they become hard boundaries, they, it could be self-defeating. But I, I'm guessing that isn't the intent, but I'll certainly ask that question. Okay, great. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I see no further questions for you. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us here, Linda. Uh, the uh, default here is we would recess uh, until uh, tomorrow at um, one thirty to carry on with. We've still got three more speakers, which, with questions, with or without questions, could be uh, could be a while. So um, that would be the default, unless there's a will to do something different. Well, I. I'd be happy to contemplate finishing with these speakers. I'm, I appreciate that others may not be able to, but I'm open to st stay until six. Okay. Um, okay. I, I see some will to uh, extend, uh, perhaps until six, and see if if we can. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to take it open-ended, but uh, counts the new Henderson maneuver of extend till six and see how far we get. And we do have we do have a note that speaker number twelve is here in person as well, and to avoid asking him to come back tomorrow, it might be courteous uh, if we're able. So I, you know, and I'm wondering if I'm wondering if we, you know, if we extend, but also give them the option, of understanding not all they may be speaking to not all of us if we do them today. I mean, because we will be here tomorrow anyway. 
Um, so I'm wondering if, if, they, if they'd like, I'm well, prepared to move that, forward to go to six. Well, it's extremely generous of you, Ben. Yeah. However, it really yeah. does fall to us. So, no, no, so. I'm prepared to move, <laughs> I'm, I'm, prepared to, I'm prepared to move that we, that, that we go till six, but if Kay. the speaker decides they prefer to sp speak tomorrow morning, I'm not sure that. Mr. Johnson. Under the procedures that we operate, it would likely be more, if they're not available when their time comes, that they'd be available to speak to new information, is what you would do in the normal course. Okay. 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 All right. So then we let's do have just a do it to six, then. and if there's okay. no way to do it, then that's fine. I okay. Would, okay. Let's say extend to six, to six uh, or to complete. Uh, whichever is uh, first. Yeah, whichever is first. Okay. So that's moved by Councillor Henderson, seconded by uh, Councillor Walters. I'll just seek unanimous consent on that. Is there any objection? Or. Um, it might, since some people can't, let's do a vote just to uh, um, give people an opportunity to register that if they wish. That assumes Mr. Nikonitz can stay a little bit longer and so that he doesn't have to come back tomorrow. Okay, he's happy with that. So we still have uh, Mr. Purwall up next, then Mr. Nikonitz, and then Ms. Hardstaff. So uh, do we have the votes? We're missing three votes. I believe Councillors Banga, Cartmel, and Katerina. Oh, yeah. Councillor Banga is verbally a yes. Thank you. The others are coming in. Uh, just Councillor Katerina. Councillor Katerina? Are you there? Okay, we may have lost him. So um, just in the interest of keeping things moving, though, we'll uh, yep. declare the vote. And that is carried 10 to 1. Uh, and so let's carry on uh, for up to another 30 minutes. So uh, um, uh, Mr. Purewall, are you there? They did not check in with us. Oh, okay. Uh, Mr. Nikonitz, then you're up. Come on down to the allotted space. So do I say next page on the presentation or? Okay. Okay, thank you. Hello. Uh, could you start start the presentation? No. Apologies, sir. Uh, the floor is yours for the next five minutes. Welcome and go ahead. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, could you start the presentation? Hello, uh, Council, Mayor. I'm Don Nikonitz with Site Engineering Technology. I'm a professional engineering technologist. We plan, design, and facilitate infrastructure projects for private and public sector. I'm presenting on behalf of Paul Graywell and Brules Associates and who work through groups of 1,050 acres. 421 of those acres is east of Highway 2. Uh, please go to page two. Excuse me, this mask is a little unusual. I'm not used to speaking with a mask. Um, <laughs> The um, city, Mary's, city Administration Report states uh, healthy city, regional and prosperity into action. And I understand this was done in 2019 and 2020 reduced development. Uh, next page, please. So in 2020, we had COVID, which is washing hands, social distancing, face masks, which has impeded our lifestyles, which we've all rethought our business, our home, which we think we rethink our process, our plan, and our future. Next page, please. In a low demand market, we need to provide private investment tools to receive good returns, return on investment. This will create jobs. This will allow some existing lands to have new land taxes of new businesses and new homes being built. 
when minimum population targets are applied, this, the return on investment loses the interest from investors, which loses jobs, which loses uh, new tax base. Next page, please. Next page, please. So, uh, council, or COVID has forced us all to rethink and re-implement. Teamwork is the way to start a solution in motion. Next page, please. Allowing private sector a good return on investment allows private investor to finance infrastructure needed, which the city already has in place policies that will allow the infrastructure to be passed back to the city. And next page, please. And in future years, the city will be ready for when uh, development starts to happen and the markets start to pick up. Thank you. And any questions? Thank you very much. Questions for Mr. Nikonitz? Councillor Banga? Thank you. Too many buttons. I couldn't click the right one. Uh, Mr. Nikonitz, what would you like to see happen? I would like to see this uh, policy uh, turned down and uh, basically uh, allow allow the um, <clears throat> sorry too many pages remove the minimum population targets and that this is the key factor you know, that will help uh, investors invest in developments that they think and they see opportunity in and which will create employment for industry and create employment for people who need work, who need jobs right now. And as well, this will give a, the city uh, a, a higher tax base than the tax base they're, pay, they're taxing right now, which will give a return for the debt that everybody's being brought on by COVID. Okay, the COVID is uh, hopefully not a long-term thing. It, it's gonna go away. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you say that uh, the tax base is going to be bigger? If what I mean is you have a, a land that you're taxing right now. You go and you, you put development on it, and all of a sudden you're, the same area, your in tax return is increasing by uh, quite a bit because you have lots of businesses, lots of houses and such to create tax that bring up more money for the for the city, for the city hall. Okay, and uh, I know I was um, questioning about the other portion. Now, the your portion is uh, you were saying that we should uh, allow again. Isn't the market gonna adjust itself rather than With rather than us making uh, decisions here? With the minimum pop uh, population targets, that really ref reflects the, the investment. Because it, with, like when we do wastewater treatment plants, it's based on how many people per uh, area, or per hectare, per acre. And if you start lowering those, then the, the longer they have to go to put these together, the higher the cost is. So if you don't adjust your minimum population targets, then you facilitate more potential in developers looking at it and investing in the infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. McConitz? Councillor Henderson? Oh, no? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, then, uh, if Jan is still with us here, is Jan Hardstaff from the, I believe it's the Residential Infill Working Group. Uh, That's correct. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. Go ahead. Okay. And, I, and, I, and uh, I hope that the photos and um, the document that I had provided to the city clerk is available. Yeah. And we've got what was, what was circulated earlier as well. So 
Okay, well then let me begin. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I present today on behalf of the Residential Infill Working Group and Edmontonians who currently or will in the future live next door to where infill redevelopment is being constructed. The draft city plan is introduced as a version of our city that respects and preserves the things we value today, while also create, creating a city to attract and inspire its next million residents. The big move to be a rebuildable city includes an ambitious target to add 600,000 new residents to the city's core, mature and established neighborhoods by providing 50% of all new dwelling units through infill by 2050. One of the six major values is that Edmontonians want to live in a place that feels like home and a desired outcome is that Edmontonians feel so safe and secure. For this to be realized, we encourage council to consider the neighbors to infill construction. One of the city's priorities must be to protect them from safety hazards and property damage during construction. We recommend council ask administration to add the following under to live in a place that feels like home at the end of page 53. The intent would be to ensure that redevelopment occurs in a manner to protect the public and adjacent property owners and residents from safety hazards and damage to public and private property. The direction to consistently apply provincial legislation, municipal bylaws and city policies to protect the public and adjacent property owners and residents from safety hazards and damage to public and private property. The city plan is meant for every Edmontonian. As such, this document must respect and preserve the values and property of homeowners who are or who may become neighbors to infill redevelopment, including owners of older existing homes, but also newly built infill homes. To be a rebuildable city requires sensitive infill design and construction that mitigates risk of impact to the adjacent neighbor's interests and protects their investment and private property. Ensuring positive outcomes and experience for neighbors of infill next to infill construction requires the city to ensure comprehensive application and enforcement of the building code by its municipal safety codes officers. A 2016 complaint to the safety codes council indicated application and enforcement of the code was limited to the safety of the building and fencing of infill sites to protect the public. A subsequent 2017 safety codes council report by the provincial accreditation administrator advised the city the code must not be selectively applied but rather applied to, in its entirety to infill construction sites to protect adjacent neighbors and their property. Yet today the application of the code continues to be limited to, to the, uh, the building and fencing and other infill, infill related articles intended to protect adjacent property are not being applied. This is illustrated in the copy of the infill related articles found in the National Building Code Alberta edition that's been provided to you. Highlighted text on pages one and three shows the extent of the article safety codes officers are applying to fencing. The rest of the document is not being applied. This includes article 8.2.2.2, protection of adjoining property, and on page 11, articles 2.2.14, safety during construction. These photos show why it is important. In 2019, an excavation failure resulted in significant impacts to adjacent private property and an un unacceptable risk of structural damage to the neighbor's home. Following a catastrophic excavation failure, the adjacent building's foundation remained exposed for over five months before it was finally backfilled, resulting in damage to the neighbor's property. This neighbor did not live in a place that feels like home nor did he feel safe and secure. Rather, he endured constant anxiety and uncertainty. His property was damaged. He worried about how the damage would be repaired and who would pay for it. This ended in a lawsuit between the neighbor, the builder and the infill owner and ruined the relationship between former neighbors. This past spring, the neighbor sold the home he had grown up in and inherited only a few years prior to this infill incident. A new owner has inherited drainage problems and surface flooding because the retaining medium that was used to backfill the home has again settled. So it's very important that the city plan uh, include consideration to these Edmontonians who are residents and live in property they own next to infill. Thank you for your consideration uh, to include our recommended additions to the city plan under the value to live. Um, we, we uh, appreciate the protection and the consideration that you give to all Ed Edmontonians. Thanks, Jan. Questions? Yeah. Councillor Walters, go ahead. 
Uh, thank you, and I just wanted to say thanks, uh, uh, Jen, for uh, providing this input today and for, the, uh, for continuing to provide it uh, over the last few years. Uh, and just to let you know that I'll raise these questions with administration and law branch when we get to that time. Uh, Thank you. And, and consider it for, for certain. So I just wanted to say thanks. That's all. Thank you. Questions beyond that? No? Okay. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Walters and uh, Ms. Hardstaff, and, and to you and through you to the Residential Infill Working Group for your continued attention to how we do it better. Um, I understand that Mr. Perwall uh, is back on the call and has been able to join us, so uh, we can hear from him now. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, sir. The floor is yours Thank for the next five minutes. Thank you. The respected mayor and councillors, uh, I thank all the speakers that spoke before me and all the staff that worked on this uh, plan. Um, I'm here to provide an opinion from my shareholders and myself about, the, about this plan. I moved to Alberta from BC in 1984, and after attending UFA Law Department, I began my practice in 1988, and I've now practiced almost 32 years. I'm now 65 years old old and many of my shareholders in approximately 500 acres of land that we own in the recently annexed areas are close to my age which are affected by this plan. My shareholders and I have participated in the city of Edmonton for its vibrant growth in many ways. We have initiated area structure plans and completed uh, them in the city of Edmonton, in the city of Leduc, Parkland County, and city of Stony Plain, etc., We have always brought lar bought large parcels of land and improved and furthered these parcels closer for development. Now at age 65, we were getting ready to sell these parcels of land which we had bought about 13 to 15 years ago that we all can retire. Now this Edmonton Municipal Plan is gonna affect our livelihood. As with this plan, these parcels of land will not be developed till the population reaches 1.7 million to 2 million. That will take more than 50 years. This is a restriction on development. This must be removed. And where in the plan it is mentioned, no growth area, that must also be changed to allow growth as, as and when it is approved by the city. The city of Edmonton has a very detailed and comprehensive D description for area and neighborhood structure plans already in place. Frog leaping is already restricted and discouraged. But development in the city should not be discouraged and forced in certain areas. Now, let me give you some examples. In the south side of the city, development between 50th Street and 91th Street touched the now Anthony Hende corridor in the late 70s and early 80s. But anything east of 50th Street only started much later in the mid 90s and east of 34th Street went to Anthony Hende only recently. And east of 17th Street were still only at 23rd Avenue. The development between 66th Street and 91 Street in the south is about to touch 41st Avenue. One parcel of land that we own, which is 153 acres, in the recently annexed portion between 41st 
Avenue in the north and Township 510 in the south and between 66th Street in the east and 91st Street in the west from our parcel houses are about one kilometer away to the north. It is a desirable location as it falls between Edmonton and Beaumont. There are sufficient amenities and infrastructure available for houses in these parcels of land in Beaumont and in South Edmonton. There is enough roadway infrastructure in this area. As Beaumont amenities are only about a kilometer away and South Edmonton the same. The plan reserves this area for development after 50 years when the population of Edmonton reaches 1.7 million to 2 million. This is not acceptable. It would have been better for us to stay in the Leduc County or to be annexed by Beaumont uh, if this plan is passed with restrictions of population the value of the land will drastically drop. And this means my shareholders and my livelihood will be affected. This plan will restrict development in the city of Edmonton, affect many persons livelihood. People will move to other towns and cities like Beaumont, Leduc, Stony Plain, St. Albert and Sherwood Park. I'm sorry, Mr. Perwal, the, the five minutes is up if you have a closing comment. Uh, market should dictate development. Why restrict development? Infill should carry on, but at a slower pace because it will cost the city a lot of money. Suburban development does not Thank you. cost the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Purwal. Questions? Any questions for Mr. Perwal? Not seeing any, so thank you very much for sharing your uh, perspective uh, on, on behalf of your shareholders as well. So thank you very much, that's important feedback. Um, all of it uh, has been really helpful and thoughtful actually. So thank you to all of our speakers today uh, for their uh, input, which is really valuable uh, even at this stage of the process. Uh, that concludes for now uh, the public um, uh, commentary portion, though the hearing stays open and there will be uh, an opportunity for new information uh, further on in the hearing, as mentioned earlier. Uh, so what we will do now is um, when we recess uh, in a moment, we'll, we'll be reconvening at 1.30 tomorrow with questions of administration. Um, so we'll uh, we'll recess now and see you um, after lunch tomorrow to carry on thank you we're we're out